It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. To tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show to get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Thank you, Professor Mike Steinel. He'll be joining us with uh, union music union leader Ray Hare near the end of the show. We're going to be talking about unions today and Dutch Merrick president of IATSE Local 40, I believe it's 40, very important in Hollywood. Uh, Dutch Merrick, prop master, armorer, uh, will be joining us, Dutch Merrick. Welcome to the mop up for October 25th, 2021. Fasten your airbags, we have a great one. This is for the working people today. I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 68 degrees. And partly cloudy coming up, as I said, in an hour. Dutch Merrick, he's a prop master, an armorer, and he is the former president of IATSE Local 40. I think I'm getting that number correctly. And he's going to talk about what happened on the set of Alec Baldwin's movie, Rust. Very sad. Very, very sad. I want to state up front that this is a tragedy for the family of the cinematographer and uh, and for Alec Baldwin. As they say, thoughts and prayers, and that don't mean much. Alec Baldwin's accidental killing of a cinematographer last Thursday on the set of his new movie, Rust, was not intentional. He didn't do it on purpose. It's not like she was trying to steal his parking spot. So he didn't do it on purpose. Although he has threatened to kill photographers in the past, he did not do this on purpose. I have a problem with the coverage. Mainstream media, practically everybody, is turning this into a murder, she wrote. Another episode of Dateline or 48 Hours. Did Alec really know the gun was hot? Was it a setup? The media, of course, is focusing on what Alec is going through, what the family of the cinematographer is going through. And of course, the 911 calls. We have to hear the 911 calls, the tragedy. And it is a tragedy, but that's not the story. This is not about any of that. It's not about gun safety. This is about unions and hypocrisy. This is about limited liability companies in Hollywood, in corporate America, screwing workers and the taxpayers. Now, Alec Baldwin might have been on a movie set last Thursday, but he was also on a tax dodge. That movie was produced because it was a tax dodge, pure and simple. 
And people who dodge taxes not only screw the government and taxpayers, they screw everyone who works for them. Rust, the movie, the independent movie Rust, was a tax haven, a tax dodge. It's something you would find in the Panama Papers or the Pandora Papers. IATSE, the Hollywood Stagehand and Theatrical Workers Union, they just voted not to strike. About 60,000 Hollywood IATSE union members were about to walk out. And we've been reading all month about, about terrible working conditions on Hollywood sets, the exploitation, wage theft, and 14-hour days. And that's exactly what was going on on the set of Rust in New Mexico. Taxes were being dodged, money was being laundered, and workers were getting screwed. That's what this story is about. It's a tragedy for the cinematographer and her widower and her son. It's a tragedy for Alec Baldwin. But if you don't see that this is primarily about unions and hypocrisy, then you're part of the problem. That's what this story is about. So whose side are you on, boy? Whose side are you on, labor or management? Whose side are you on? Now, people say, don't politicize a tragedy. And I say the tragedy occurred because it was already politicized. And management, not labor, won that political struggle. And the killing of that cinematographer was an accidental byproduct of the politicization of that movie set. People say, don't politicize this tragedy. It was already politicized. When you use a money, a movie, not a money, a movie to launder money, like Rust was being used for, that's political. When you make a movie to hide money from the Internal Revenue Service, that's political. When you screw the workers and the union and they quit to protest, which is what happened that day on the set of Rust, it's already political. Now, of course, Alec Baldwin, and my heart does go out to Alec Baldwin. I think he's a deeply troubled man, very talented, very gifted, a, hypo a hypocrite, but my heart does go out to him. It does. Alec Baldwin and the producers don't want us to make this political because they say it's in bad taste. As I said, this tragedy is already in bad taste and it's already political. Worker safety, wage theft, and unions being escorted off the set by the police as they were that day before the shooting, that's political and it's in bad taste. The ruling class and Alec Baldwin is part of the ruling class. They always demand civility whenever it's in their best interests. Whenever they're exposed as being anything but civil, they demand civility. There was no civility that day. The police that day, that day before the killing, the police were called in to remove the IATSE workers from the set. This is according to the Associated Press. This is according to the Los Angeles Times. And this is according to Dateline and The Hollywood Reporter. The police were called in Thursday before the shooting to remove the IATSE workers from the set. They were already packing up and leaving. I don't know why the police had to be called in. That's political. Alec Baldwin like it or not, was a producer. And the producers called the police 
to escort the IATSE workers off the set. That's not civil. That's in bad taste. And it's political. And that's why the tragedy occurred. They screwed the union. And that's why that cinematographer is dead. That cinematographer would be alive today had the producers not called the police in and ordered the IATSE workers off the set. The protocols were in the, in the chain of custody of that gun. They were in the hands of a non-union assistant director who was not supposed to tell a star whether a gun is hot or cold. That is the job of a prop master. We'll be speaking to one in about 45 minutes. It is the job of an IATSE prop master. Those guns were going off in the lead up to last Thursday, and the producers had been warned. This is a safety protocol. They were not paying attention to the union's demands on safety, on COVID safety and gun safety. IATSE complained. They weren't getting paid. They walked off the set and the producers called the police on them. That's why that woman is dead. Guns on a set, the chain of custody belongs to the armorer, the prop master, not an assistant director. Union sets have protocols. And the day that set became a non-union set is the very same day that set became a murder scene. And you will not have that conversation on CNN or MSNBC because they're not union sets. They're half union sets. We can't even find out if Rachel Maddow has union writers yet. Alec Bald Baldwin wouldn't be inconsolable right now had he walked off the set that day and showed solidarity with IATSE, but he didn't. He couldn't because while he's a union member, sag after, he was also a producer. He was management, and that's the problem with Hollywood unions. Producers, management are also writers, actors, and directors. You have Hollywood negotiating against itself. The Writers Guild was once run by John Wells, the producer of ER and the West w Wing. And he took a writing credit. He's a multimillionaire, a writer and a producer. So when the writers are getting screwed, like I was, when I, ha I needed help because John Stewart on The Daily Show is a union buster, also a member of the union when he finally signed, uh, John Wells didn't return my calls because it's complicated. See, they convinced the unions it's in our best interest to have an insider, an industry insider negotiating on our behalf because I'm John Wells. I'm a writer and a producer. I know how to negotiate with the studios because I'm one of them. The studios trust me. That's how they sell themselves as union leaders. The studios trust me. I don't want the studios trusting the guy who's negotiating my minimum basic agreement. Alec Baldwin was wearing many hats that day, and one of them was a producer of Rust. Why? That's not an honorific. He wrote the movie. He starred in it. Why would he possibly want to degrade himself with a producer credit? Everybody in Hollywood knows what a producer is. They're scum. They're the money people. It's degrading to take a producer credit. You want to be recognized by your writing and your acting or your directing, not your ability to raise money. Producers, that's all they do. They produce money. Alec Baldwin took a producer credit because in case he got screwed, he needed that producer credit to show that he was entitled to what he was owed by the financiers. He helped with the financing, trust me. He met with the backers, trust me. Trust me, Alec Baldwin was making a lot of money on that little independent film that's gonna show no profits. Successful or not successful, Rust will show zero profits, but Alec Baldwin is walking away with a lot of money while claiming he's just collecting after minimum, SAG after minimum. According to Variety, there are seven production companies investing in this little film, this little independent film, Rust. Now, when you go to a movie, you see like 20 
icons before the movie starts. You think it's the movie actually starting, but it's some management company, some investor group with a golden horse walking into the sunset. And who's global asset management? Those are the producers. They get top billing on a movie. According to Variety, there are seven of those parasites investing in Rust. According to Variety, these seven production companies raise capital. Now, pay attention to this. Raise capital from wealthy investors who need various types of, quote unquote, tax breaks. Panama Papers, Pandora Papers, tax breaks. Tax breaks is a euphemism for hiding money in a shell corporation. You don't understand tax breaks. I don't. But those seven production companies financing Rust do. And trust me when I say this, Alec Baldwin was the producer because he met with all those investors. He was what they call the rainmaker. He was the face. He was guaranteeing their investment would look legitimate He was the front for this money laundering operation. He would make it look legitimate because he has an ego and he wanted to write and star in a film, but he also wanted to get his cut. And you get a cut raising money, period, full stop. It doesn't matter if the movie makes money or not. Alec Baldwin was going to get his cut, his share of the investment for being a rainmaker, the same way a political consultant gets a cut from all the money he spends on TV advertising. That's why presidential campaigns and congressional campaigns are so expensive. It's the political consultants who skim off the top. They get 15 percent of everything they buy, all the ad buys. That's how it works. So. I guarantee you, the first day Alec Baldwin showed up on the set of Rust, he already got paid big time. He got the skim, just like all the other people who packaged the movie. They get a percentage of the money he helps to raise. Now, Streamline Global is one of the producers of Rust, one of the investors. It's not the producer, but that's what a producer is. One of the founders of Streamline Global is Emily Hunter Salveson. Four years ago, she explained what movie financing for these small independent films is all about. These are not small independent films. They're money laundering operations that the studios are involved in, that the big agencies are involved in, that the big Hollywood lawyers are involved in. Now, Emily Hunter Salveson, one of the founders of Streamline Global, she's one of the investors in this little independent film that's made on a shoestring with seven global financiers producing it. It's made on a shoestring. She said, quote, this is what she told Variety about three or four years ago. Now, pay attention to this. She said, we have developed new financial models to attract capital that would otherwise be unavailable to the film industry. Films, this is what she said, are the byproduct of the comprehensive tax planning strategies we employ for our clients. I'm gonna, let, me, let me make sure you understand this. Stephanie Global, Stephanie Global, Emily Hunter Salveston is one of the founders of Streamline Global. They're one of the executive producers, the people who finance, one of seven companies that financed Alec Baldwin's small, little, low-budget film, his little passion project that he just had to make in New Mexico. It was burning inside of him. I have a, I'm a storyteller, and I have a story that has to be told. Yeah, the story that you have to tell, Alec Baldwin, is the lie that you're not making any money off Rust. So the, the founder of Streamline Global said three or four years ago, she said to Variety, Google it, she said, films are the byproduct 
of the comprehensive tax planning strategies we employ for our clients, her clients. This is a tax dodge. This is a money laundering operation. Films are a byproduct of comprehensive tax planning, strategies for the richest 1%. This isn't about making a movie. It's about hiding money from the government. It's the Pandora Papers. It's the Panama Papers. And Alec Baldwin is too smart not to know that. He's in his early 60s. He's smart. He knows exactly how this works. And he's getting richer doing this. He's going to try. Of course, he's going to try. That's part of the agreement to make the best movie he possibly can because it has to look legitimate. Of course. And he wants the acclaim. He has an ego. Of course, he wants this movie to succeed. But the people who are financing his little low budget, his little low budget passion project, they don't care if it succeeds or fails. It doesn't matter. He's assisting his investors while cutting, getting a cut off the top because this is all about creating a limited liability company, an LLC, to shield money from the government, to shield money from investors, to shield money from ex-wives, or to charge that limited liability company massive amounts of money for services not provided so you can launder it, so you can deposit into a bank Like your drug money, you can deposit your drug money and say it's from the LLC that produced Rust. By the way, it's called Rust Movie Productions LLC. If I'm a drug dealer, I can charge Rust Movie Productions LLC $1 million for services rendered. They don't have to pay me the million dollars. I just deposit it in a bank and now it's legitimate. These LLCs are for one reason, to hide money from the government and to clean dirty money from the government so the government doesn't know, doesn't know where you got your money. An LLC, a limited liability corporation, can do all sorts of wonderful things for you. It can help you show a massive loss if you're hiding money from the government, or it can show a massive windfall if you're trying to clean drug money. Your LLC collects and charges free fees and services that are never provided, but you get to declare it. You can show it to the government. You can deposit it in a bank and it's clean, legitimate money, or at least it looks clean and legitimate. And then you can take that clean, legitimate money and avoid paying taxes on it by handing it over to another LLC. So you clean dirty money with one LLC, But it's not like you want to pay taxes now on your clean money. So you take that money that's just been cleaned and give it to another LLC. And it shows that your investment took a total bath. You lost all your money. So you don't have to declare it on your taxes. The Rust Movie LLC is anything you need it to be. Now, Alec Baldwin didn't know the gun was hot. He should have. He would have, but it was a non-union crew that day. Unions, you see, are not just about wages. They're also about safety. There was a union crew, but the police escorted them off the set that day. As the union crew, as IATSE crew members were already packing up their stuff and leaving and quitting, the police, for some reason, showed up to escort the union workers off the set. Why are the police... With all the rising crime everywhere in this country, why are police being wasted? Why are our tax dollars being wasted escorting a union crew off the set of rust? It's not like they were making any trouble. They were making demands. There's no report that the union had violated the law. The producers were violating the law. So why did the producers of rust, Alec Baldwin, feel the need to call the police. That seems awfully heavy handed. 
And if the police, if the New Mexico police were on a soon to be murder scene, why didn't they ask why the union crew was quitting? The police have a union, don't they? Yeah. They don't share our brother and sisterhood, the police union. You would think the police would be concerned about wage theft. Union crews just don't walk off a set. A legitimate, a legitimate union like IATSE just doesn't walk off a set. Shouldn't the police, if they're already there, ask questions about the extraordinarily long work days? in violation of labor codes and ask the producers why they're making the New Mexico roads unsafe late at night by forcing these exhausted crew members to drive 50 miles back and forth at three in the morning after working a 14 hour day, even though their union contract stipulated they would have a hotel right near the set. It was it was a total switch and bait for the for the IATSE workers. They were promised hotels near the set. They show up and they go, oh, no, 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 you're going to stay in Albuquerque. And of course, because it's such a privilege to work in movies, you know, you don't want to make trouble. You don't want to call the union. You don't want to get a bad reputation. I've noticed the people, the union members who talk to the Associated Press and the Los Angeles Times, they're doing it anonymously because they don't want to get a reputation as a troublemaker. But it seems to me if the police are called in on that movie set on the public dime, it's the taxpayers, by the way, who pay the police to show up. The the movie, the producers, they're in New Mexico because they get tax credits from New Mexico. They're providing jobs, see, so they don't have to pay taxes in New Mexico. They're probably collecting money. They're probably the producer are probably getting money from the New Mexico Film Institute to attract them to shoot in New Mexico. So we're paying for the police, not the producers. It's the taxpayers who pay for the police. The producers do not pay taxes. That's why they're producing that movie. So they don't have to pay taxes. And those union members, they pay dues and they pay taxes. And they were the ones made to feel like criminals that day. The police escorted the IATSE workers off that set and the IATSE workers were made to feel like the criminals because they were demanding to get paid. That movie had already been in production for three weeks. Those union members still had not been paid. They were demanding that labor laws be obeyed like COVID protocols. They were working in tight quarters and they kept complaining this is not COVID safe. They were not enforcing labor laws, especially when it came to guns. Those guns were going off days before the killing and they were complaining. But the police were called in by the producers who don't pay their salaries because the producers don't pay taxes. That's why they're in New Mexico not to pay taxes. The entire movie is a tax dodge. The police on our dime show up and make the IATSE workers criminals for demanding, for enforcing the law. And the New York Times is reporting on this. Uh, When they report report on this killing, they report that there was labor, quote unquote, unrest. I love that term, labor unrest, as though the union was making trouble, making trouble. The shoot started at the beginning of the month. The workers had not gotten paid yet. So Alec Baldwin didn't know the gun was hot. But he was one of the producers and he knew he was working with a non-union crew that day. Alec Baldwin took to Twitter that night. He is a control freak. He knew the police. He's not an idiot. He knew the police were escorting IATSE off the lot. That producer title Alec Baldwin gets wasn't an honorific. He wrote the screenplay. He's the star. He got that producer credit because he's part of management. He's getting a skim off the investment, not the profits, the investment. 
He knew the budget above the line and below the line. He's no idiot. He knows how this works. He may not have called the police on IATSE that day, but he knew they were called. He knew it was a new crew. He knew he was working with a non-union crew of scabs. And he knew he wasn't a friend of the working man. He knew he didn't know the gun was hot, but he knew which side he was on. And it wasn't the unions. There are no safety protocols unless there is a union. Unions are not just making sure you get paid, which the crew was clearly not. It's about safety on the set and off the set health insurance. A non-union crew does not get money paid into their health insurance or their pension. And Alec Baldwin knew that. When you bring in a non-union crew, you're not paying into their health care, their pensions. So if you don't care about their health and safety, why should they care about your health and safety? If I'm part of a non-union crew and you don't care about my health and safety and you're not going to pay into my health care, I'm going to tell you the gun's cold. But again... This movie set wasn't about the crew or the movie. It was an accidental byproduct of a tax dodge. The police didn't ask about the working conditions. They showed up. You would think the police would know this is a working set in New Mexico, that these crews are are notorious for abusing labor. That's why they're in New Mexico. They can't get away with that shit in Hollywood. What, do you think they need the exteriors? They can't get that in California? Those those exteriors, the only place we can get that magic light is in New Mexico. Give me a break. They're in New Mexico because Hollywood demands more from producers. And the police know that. And when they showed up on the set to escort IATSE off that set, they should have asked the right questions. But they don't. The same way the sheriff drags you out of your home without asking any questions when the landlord or the bank insists without any evidence that you're behind on your mortgage or you're behind on your rent. The sheriff shows up in the service of capital and does as he's told by the people who don't pay taxes. They don't pay taxes owning property. Having a more, that's so you don't pay taxes. The sheriff is literally evicting the people who pay their salaries. We're the schmucks who pay our taxes. Steve Mnuchin, the former treasurer secretary, he should have been prosecuted by Kamala Harris when she was California's attorney general, because after the financial collapse in 2008, his bank, One West Bank, was guilty of foreclosure violations. Steve Mnuchin was foreclosing on people who shouldn't have been foreclosed on. He was calling the sheriff in to throw people out of homes that they still owned. But the sheriff didn't ask any questions because he was Steve Mnuchin, who went from Goldman Sachs, because his father worked at Goldman Sachs, to starting his own bank. And of course, Steve Mnuchin is a power player in Hollywood. He's a producer. Steve Mnuchin is a producer because when he was at Goldman Sachs, he was told that one of the greatest places to launder dirty money from the government is producing a movie. This piece of shit, Steve Mnuchin, in 2014, alone in 2014, Steve Mnuchin, Steve Mnuchin, executive produced these movies. He had a great year. He was the executive producer of the Lego movie, Winter's Tale, Edge of Tomorrow, The Jersey Boys, Clint Eastwood, This Is Where I Leave You, The Judge, Annabelle, Inherent Vice, Blended, and American Sniper, which I think won an Academy Award, I think. That's a lot of movies that Steve Mnuchin executive produced 
in 2014 alone. Now, you think he got that executive producer credit because of his brilliant sense of showmanship? I mean, if you've ever seen him testify before Congress, you know this guy exudes empresario. I mean, you would turn, Steve, like, I would give anything to have Steve Mnuchin give me show business advice. Give me a break. Steve Mnuchin, executive producing movies. Because that's the only way Louise Litton, whatever her name is, will get into bed with him. He's laundering money and trying to get laid. And the only way he's going to get somebody like Louise Litton, if that's her name, to even approach his bed so she can stand while he masturbates to her. She's not getting into his bed. She just stands there while he jerks off to her because he's an executive producer. Alec Baldwin, he knew what was going on. He's been around Hollywood and New York and Wall Street for decades. He knows exactly how this works. The union crew, IATSE, according to the Associated Press, the Los Angeles Times, they quit. They weren't getting their paychecks. They were promised hotels that never materialized. COVID protections were not being implemented. Guns, the guns were going off. Alex's stunt double on Sunday, two times that gun was hot and it went off. People were complaining, but nobody cared because it wasn't about the crew and it wasn't about the movie. It was only about one thing, hiding money from the government. That's it. This is a page right out of the Pandora Papers. This is not a story about prop guns. This is a story about limited liability corporations and how the movie industry uses LLCs to destroy unions, hide money, and protect profits. Rust Movie Productions LLC. That's the name of the producer of Rust the Movie. Rust Movie Productions LLC. Rust Movie Productions Limited Liability Corporation. It's a phony corporation. Rust Movie LLC. They're making one movie and that's it. It's an LLC. It's a one-off so that any civil law civil law suits regarding regarding manslaughter on the set can only be filed against Rust Movie Productions LLC, a limited liability corporation. The liability is limited. That means the assets of every ass hole is protected because there are no assets. That's what an LLC is. Money passes through an LLC. It's a shell corporation because it's an empty shell. You, that's the company you have to sue for wage theft. That's the company you sue if somebody gets murdered on your set. The assets of the producers, Alec Baldwin's assets, the assets of the investors, they're protected. So Rust Movies LLC, Rust Movie Productions LLC, I guarantee you, will declare a loss. This movie could lose $50 million. It can make $1 billion. When it comes time to pay your taxes, Rust Movie Productions LLC will show a loss. Rust Movies Productions LLC. They form another LLC and make another movie and they name it after their dog, their cat, or to get even with the woman who wouldn't sleep with them in high school. So when you watch an independent film, there's a story they're telling you. And that story is it's independent. It's low budget. It's a first time director, a first time producer. Let's take it to all these festivals. We're just a, we want to be discovered. We're just a boutique Boutique film that we hope will be discovered at Sundance. Bullshit. An independent film means, all that means is we have no idea who the investors are. It's probably one of the big studios who put an investment into Rust. I guarantee you through an LLC, Paramount, somebody 
through one of their LLCs had a piece of Rust. So if it's profitable, they make money. And if it loses money, they can claim that it lost a lot more money than it actually did. This tax code stuff is complicated for a reason. It's three card Monty, Monty or Monty. An LLC has many purposes to save you from a lawsuit, to save you from the tax man, your investors. You can hide money from investors by creating an LLC. Everyone was using Rust Movie Productions LLC for all sorts of nefarious but perfectly legal and perfectly immoral reasons. It's legal, but it's immoral. It's legal because the tax code is written by the tax firms that protect these money launderers. The New York Times reported that all these high finance tax firms that make their lawyers and accountants go in country to go into the IRS for a couple of years and sneak in little little codes to protect their investors. And then they come back to the firm that they were working for and they be, they, they're made partner and they get seven figure salaries. So Alec Baldwin, you know, he's a troubled, brilliant artist. He's very brilliant. He knows how this works, but he's also able to compartmentalize. He kind of, you know, it's like I look the other way. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. It's like childbirth. He's been through five with Hilaria. He'll be in the room every time uh, Hilaria farts out another kid. But he's not really looking. He's just there to show, you know, he's because he's supposed to. And that's how he views being on the set. He's there, but he, he's pretending he doesn't know what's going on. He can claim right now without lying that he just I just wrote the movie. This is a passion project. I'm taking the after minimum. And if he took a lie detector test, he'd pass because he thinks he's telling the truth. But the truth is he had a piece of the movie a piece of the movie, regardless of whether or not it turned a profit, which it never would. It would never turn a profit. Hollywood accounting, like all corporate accounting, is notorious for never showing a profit. Baldwin was getting his. He helped put this movie's financing together just by being Alec Baldwin and showing up for a dinner. He's entitled to his cut. He got his cut. Wealthy people love hanging out with Alec Baldwin in the Hamptons. Hey, here's $1 million. Come to my daughter's wedding for an hour. All you have to do is come to my daughter's wedding so I look more important than I actually am. There are many ways Alex gets a cut. And he has a huge nut. 500 kids, boats, home in New York, home in the Hamptons. He's got impulse issues. He's got nannies, limousines, lawsuits. He's not spending a month in New Mexico unless it's worth his time. Now, I suspect Alec Baldwin, like all of us, is horrible with money, but he has a guy. He's got a guy that set up an LLC for Baldwin and Baldwin will claim, and like all of us, that he doesn't know what the LLC is or how it works, but he has a guy. And he named the LLC after the street that Alec Baldwin grew up in on Long Island. And it's his little inside joke. And that little LLC that Alec doesn't understand, it's legally siphoning money off the budget of Rust and going directly into Alec Baldwin's LLC for some sort of service. His LLC claims to have performed for that LLC behind Russ Movies Productions. And Alec has plausible deniability. I don't understand how this works. I just have a guy. But he knows that the money somehow shows up in his LLC for work, for something he doesn't really understand. Uh, you know, nobody understands it. It's the people who set up the LLCs 
don't understand it. Because if they really understood it, they could be sent to jail. They know just enough to make sure the money shows up. But if they know too much, they leave a, 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 a trail of evidence. I have a guy for that. Ask him. Alec Baldwin is not an idiot. He knows that despite getting after scale on the movie, an incredible amount of money from that movie's budget somehow made it into his bank account. Because this movie is a byproduct of a tax dodge. Streamline Global's founder, one of the seven executive producers, Emily Hunter from Streamline Global. You think she's giving notes on the script? You think she's giving input on line readings or the, the cut? She's there for one reason. She knows where the money is. Streamline Global's founder, Emily Hunter Salveson, told Variety about three years ago that these movies are a quote unquote byproduct, unquote, of a tax dodge. She calls it a tax haven, which is a euphemism for rich people don't have to pay taxes. It's not about the mo not about the movie. It's about moving the movie's money around. The same way a congressional campaign isn't about winning, it's about paying the consultants. Anytime money is passing hands, someone is getting a cut. That's how corporate America works. That's how the CEOs rob the investors. They keep the money moving. Money must stay in motion. That way the CEOs and the banks and the executives can collect their fees while the shareholders get screwed. It's about the velocity of money. The more it moves around, the more money there is to be made. Money that just sits there doesn't make money. Money that moves makes money for the people who skim off the top. It doesn't have to make a profit. It just has to move. And the government understands that. You put $1 into circulation with fiscal stimulus, it starts circulating. And each time it changes hands, that $1, each time somebody touches that dollar, the government gets a cut, right? Sales tax, income tax. It's just $1, but you gotta, it's got to keep moving. You skim off the top. The money is in skimming off the top. And that's what Alec Baldwin was doing on the set of Rust. He was collecting a fee. I guarantee you he was collecting a finder's fee for the money that got invested. That's why LLCs, that's why Russ Movie Productions LLC exists, to hide money from the government, not just to hide money from the government, but from the investors, from the ex-wives, the creditors, and most importantly for me, the unions. The purpose of an LLC is so rich people can claim poverty. It's not in the budget. How many times have you heard that from a rich person? It's not in the budget. The budget. The budget is this artificial barrier between you and the ruling class. It's the budget. My hands are tied. Yes, the, the company had record profits. I'd like to give you a raise, but my hands are tied. It's not in the budget. How many times have you been told, I know you think this company's making a lot of money and you deserve a raise. It's not in the budget. And I love CNN's reporting on this. CNN reported over the weekend, Rust Movies LLC said in a statement, quote, the safety of our cast and crew is the top priority of Rust Productions. <laughs> like it's a real thing. Like it's like they made an issue, like they made an official statement. The top priority of Rust Productions, the movie's name is Rust. They set up an LLC called Rust Productions LLC. The statement goes on to say everyone associated with Rust Productions LLC believes that the safety of our cast and crew is the top priority. Well, then CNN says it made multiple attempts to reach Rust Movie Productions LLC for comment, but they haven't gotten any response because there is no Rust 
Movie Productions, LLC. It doesn't exist. And they, they do not care about the safety of the cast and the crew. They care about hiding money. That's how it works. Now, I don't know how it works. I'm a bottom feeder, but I read. And I think Alec Baldwin, you know, his good probably outweighs his bad. I think, I think he's a deep thinker and he has wisdom. He's a force of nature. He's able to synthesize all this information. He's, he's brilliant. And I, I hope uh, he comes out of this okay. I hope the, the family uh, who's, <laughs> I mean, it's just, but life comes down to a few moments. I, I keep saying this. Everything in life is leading up to three or four moments upon which you must judge yourself. And last Thursday was that moment for Alec Baldwin. Should he have been on the set that day? Why didn't he walk off with the IATSE crew members? What does he owe his fellow union members? Why was the, sh why was the film being shot on location in New Mexico? You can get all that on a Hollywood back lot, maybe a few exteriors. No, it's in New Mexico because it's cheaper. Uh, you're going to it's shot on location because New Mexico offers tax breaks to independent filmmakers, hedge funds, and unions don't have the same stranglehold on a movie set in New Mexico as they do in Hollywood. It wouldn't have happened in Hollywood. So who benefits from all this? As, as always, it's, it's just the people who, who are hiding money. They'll tell you that shooting in New Mexico is good for business. That's why we give tax breaks to the companies because it produces jobs. They don't produce good jobs. The people who, who get paid the real money are the investors. The, the jobs on the set, they go to, if they're lucky, IATSE members and, and a caterer. And, and they're screwed. They're screwed because you're away from your union bosses. So you're not going to make any trouble over the contract, over safety issues. So just remember that independent films are not independent. They are shell corporations set up by powerful investors who make it look like the film isn't part of the system, but it is part of the system. They've just figured out a way to make movies on the cheap. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, yeah, this is very infuriating. And it, it, it pains me to watch the way this is being covered in the media. It pains me to see the way this is being covered. It's all about everything but wage theft. This is about wage theft, and it's about hiding money. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. It is Monday, October. Can it be October 25th? When we come back, we will talk to Dutch Merrick from IATSE about all this. We'll be right back. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy, too. Now tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show to get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. 
He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. The David Feldman Show So get your ears on right And buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say And he's coming your way He's got a lot to say Somebody just said, welcome back. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Follow me on Twitter. We post highlights of the show on Twitter. Follow me on Facebook. We also post highlights of the show on Twitter. Office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. And if you would like to sit in our virtual studio audience, we have one right now. We have a, a virtual studio audience attending the show on Zoom, if you would like to join us, please go to my website and hit attend a live taping and I will send you a uh, an invitation, please. And while you're on my website, please sign up for my newsletter. Somebody, somebody I know just texted me and she was saying about the coverage of the shooting in New Mexico on the set of Rust. Not a single, single mention in the Washington Post of the union crew getting escorted off the set by the police and that they brought in a non-union replacement the day Alec Baldwin, his gun went off. Well, here to discuss all this is somebody I haven't seen since my KPFK days in Los Angeles and Kelly Carlin. Last time I saw you, you and I were at Kelly Carlin's house in Los Angeles. Hello, my old friend Dutch Merrick. Is is it pronounced armorer? Yeah, armorer. Uh, or the piece of furniture in your house would be an armoire. An armorer. You're a yes. prop master. You're a union. You're a pain in the ass with IATSE. You're you're good. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> and you were president of. Is it local forty? 44. Ah, I screwed up. I owe, I missed it by four. You were, were president of IOTSE Local 44. Is John Hayes here? Maybe he, he has a question for you. I Good saw man. you on CNN. I said, I know that guy. Ah, small world, isn't it? When yeah. your face gets all over TV. Yeah. So <laughs> reconnect with all your old friends. So I, I saw that you just arrived and you didn't have to sit through my tirade for an hour. IATSE. Let's very quickly, just very quickly, let's spend two minutes explaining what IATSE is. Very quickly. What is IATSE? Very quickly. Absolutely. The International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees is basically the entertainment industry. It's the union side of the entertainment industry. So we encompass everything from Hollywood blockbuster films, TV shows, music videos, theatrical and stage productions, music and rock concerts, uh, daytime dramas, uh, theater. Uh, and we started in theater, 1893, we started in theater. We, had, we got into motion pictures in 1910 when we organized the, the uh, uh, projectionists. Okay, so in the, lead up to, in the lead up to this shooting that happened in New Mexico last Thursday, where does it stand with IATSE? In the lead up to the shooting, we were being told that IATSE was going to shut down Hollywood. What did you guys vote to do? Well, this contract negotiation has been heated, to say the least. Uh, we go up against the AMPTP, which is the producers, and the offer that they started out with was just a flat out insult. I mean, it was a I, I can say a genuine but slap very in quickly, the just because I want to talk about Alec Baldwin and what happened, what we know, what happened vis-a-vis -vis IATSE on the day of the killing. So 
uh, what the day of the killing of the cinematographer, where did it stand with IATSE? Were, were they about to go on strike or did they have a contract? Well, there's two parallel things there because you're talking about one show that's an acute case and you're talking about the entire IA contract for motion picture. Now, the IA has several different contracts. They have some that are motion picture, TV, et cetera. This was just dealing with, I'm going to turn my ringer off because uh, I didn't prepare. There we go. Uh, this uh, overarching contract affected 60,000 people and that's- uh, In Hollywood. The big studio, in Hollywood, the big studios, film and TV. So if you were to shoot in New Mexico, would you have to obey a IATSE contract that say 44, the local 44 has to obey? So we are part of the Hollywood Basic Agreement, the HBA, and that is motion picture in L.A. and New York, essentially. Uh, other locals like Atlanta, other hubs, Atlanta and New Mexico, are under the Area Standards Agreement, the ASA, which is a separate contract, a separate health care plan. It's just a separate deal altogether. And producers, it's, it's cheaper rates for the workers. And I think the producers ex, uh, excuse that because, hey, you're living out in, uh, in the sticks and it's cheaper to live so we didn't need to pay you as much as la and new york so, so, so just so we're clear here home. just so we're clear here local 44 covers hollywood proper the actual where the studios and the exact you you it's called local 44 but you're the shit that your union is where the movies and television shows are being made and that the producers go to new mexico I know you have to be polite here. So how wrong am I when I say the producers are shooting in New Mexico because your union, Local 44, would never put up with that shit? In a way, in a way, yeah. And let me offer you an important bit of context. The IATSC is 150 plus thousand members in the U.S. and Canada. And out of those 153,000, 47,000 of those are right here in Los Angeles. That's almost a third of the entire IA. So they don't so, need the exteriors in New Mexico. That's well, not why they're in New Mexico. New Mexico is beautiful, but they can get those exteriors through CGI. They don't need to be in New Mexico. It's a heck of a lot. I, I got to say it. It's, it's got to be a heck of a lot cheaper to shoot exteriors out there than CGI because you can CGI in a, a coffee cup but doing an entire uh, exterior would be a lot harder. There is, there is benefit to those locations, absolutely, to shooting in other places, but they do certainly save money, and New Mexico has a tax incentive. So it is definitely chasing the dollars. If you're going to shoot in Old West, you can shoot it up here in Vasquez Rocks in, in sunny California, or you can go to New Mexico or Arizona, and New Mexico is going to give you the biggest tax break and panoramic New Mexico vistas. Okay. And they do have a talented crew base. And, and who benefits in New Mexico? The jobs that the, the, that Hollywood, by transplanting temporarily to New Mexico, who makes money off that? Well, who in New Mexico there, makes money off that? Understand that there are crew members there that are being hired. So that's the first line. And the producers are saving money on their overhead. No, no, but who in New Mexico, the new the people of New Mexico are sold on the New Mexico Film Commission, a government sanctioned organization that tries to lure filmmakers to come to New Mexico. Who benefits from that? Well, the California. No, no. In New Mexico, who benefits from it? I'm going to get to that. The California Film Commission did an extensive study to show the impact of filmmaking. And maybe New Mexico has done the same type of survey. But it shows that not only do you hire the below the line rank and file workers that are the cameramen and the armorers and the stunt guys, but you're also uh, putting work for the sandwich shops and the caterers and transportation. You're selling gasoline. So understand that filmmaking consumes a tremendous amount. And so they're going to, if they're shooting on film, they're selling film stock or data cards for the cameras. All the materials that we go through, costumes, props, we're going to shop in local businesses to try to find antiques for that Western, for example. So there is an impact to having a film shoot in your town. It brings dollars into your town, jobs and tax dollars. But not a lot. 
not the kind of money that they're, they're this it's the same thing with a stadium like a, it's like a it's like the tax breaks for a sports team N- nobody's making six figures in new mexico nobody's making a livable wage off a film shoot i have family in albuquerque and i know that the costs are less there overall uh, but i can't speak to who's making over six figures it's hard for me to really quantify that an-, an answer to that question. Yeah, you're being diplomatic. It's a race to the bottom. It's it, it's a race to the bottom. They're shooting in New Mexico because it's a race to the bottom. The same well, way me, Detroit. Let me, I agree with you. And let me offer you uh, some fuel for your fire here, because I was hoping I you were going to put I, it out, quite frankly. I, no, not not at all. Uh, not at all. I I embrace tax credit uh, tax tax breaks in california to bring filmmaking here as a competitive tool because we have to to compete with states like georgia and new mexico however on the whole i think we should not have tax incentives we should let the better facilities and crew get the work without tax incentives and i think then it would be a level playing field across the country now that's quite a controversial stance within our union a lot of our union people want that tax incentive to to get the work even here or new york whatever tax incentives they can have but honestly that tax incentive isn't necessarily going in my pocket but it's but it's coming out of my pocket and my taxes so I, i think if we got rid of all the tax incentives in the u.s for filming and just called it filming for profit, then it can't be seen as corporate welfare when a billion dollar company uh, is able to save, you know, $5 million off a $100 million project. And it basically comes out of our taxes. Medea has a studio in Atlanta. Is that a union shop? Uh, I don't know for sure. I, I have to assume that it is. Um, but it's a one-stop shop where they tried to be all inclusive. And during the pandemic, they brought in crews and they kind of buttoned them up and kept them in their own pod. Well, they have it, but Tyler Perry is no fan of the Writers Guild. So, oh, yeah, I don't so know about that. let's talk about what happened in New Mexico on the the set of Rust, this movie that Alec Baldwin wrote, starred in, and helped produce it started off as a union crew correct that's my understanding Mm -hmm. and what happened that day of the killing what happened with IATSE that day what do you know and, and I'll, I'll step back one moment because what I under, I don't believe that the armorer and possibly the prop crew were union. And I don't know if they started the film or if they came on after, after a change. Uh, but I can't testify that they were a union for sure. But the camera department was union. Uh, the camera department had complained on a couple, two or three instances about safety issues. They'd also complained about the turnaround and the lack of sleep and the long days and the lack of a quality hotel within reach of the set. Uh, there were a lot of grievances that they're dealing with. COVID? And- uh, and COVID, COVID safety protocols that complained that they weren't in place and fully implemented. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a good chance that the first assistant director leads to charge to all that malarkey, too. Uh, so they walked I'm sorry, off. The, the first assistant director who handed Alec the gun. One in the same. Yes. Uh, the first assistant director is sort of the driving force, the conductor that moves the moves the whole operation along. Um, but four or five camera people. He was uh, non-union? Uh, was he union or non-union? I read in an article he was non-union, but I can't verify that. If and he, he had a history children. and there was a history of sexual harassment complaints against him. That I hadn't heard. I have heard a uh, first person, a history of Uh, challenges to the prop department where he had to go apologize because he was so rude and and abrasive. Um, I've seen it in print where he was not giving special effects department uh, proper time and clearance to do special effects things on previous productions. So he was the reason people, IATSE, walked off the set that day. 
I, I can't pin that on him that he was the reason. But think about this, David. We're gig workers. We're in what they used to call a casual labor. Now they call it a gig economy. And what that means is that if I work for you on a Monday, I got to get called back on Tuesday. And, I, and if I cross the line or upset you, I may not get called back for your next gig or to finish out the film because we're at will hires. So being in that precarious position, a lot of us don't want to don't want to stir up any shit. Even if you're a member of a union. Even if you're a member of a union, because there's no reprisal. If you come in and you work on this feature and they keep you for the duration of it, but you've been a complainer because you were tired of cold food and pizza for second meal, uh, they don't hire you on the next job. You have no, 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 no repercussion. No, no, um, pushback. You can tell the union, Hey, they didn't hire me on the next job, but that's their right. They just went with another guy or another gal. So it's, we're in a position where it's very difficult. So think about this. If conditions got bad enough for the camera crew to actually walk off and come pack up their gear, that means that show was absolutely a horror show. Say that again, please. Well, I'll tell you straight. If no, no, just say that again, because this is not being reported in the press it, it's it's been buried in the Los Angeles. Well, the Los Angeles Times led on this because they're it's a company town that they're reporting on, and and a couple of local trades have reported on this. But the Times refers to labor unrest. The Washington Post, which is owned by Jeff Bezos, you 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 have to look with a under an electronic microscope to find out the way the workers were treated on the day of the murder. So t tell me again, as, as, as the former president of IATSE Local 44, the union in Hollywood, if union oh. members in New Mexico <clears throat> find the courage to walk off a set, what does that tell you? And, and I need to just correct you. We're not the union. We're one of many craft unions. We happen to be the largest craft union in Hollywood. Uh, for the conditions to be that bad for our workers who are gig workers to walk off, that means that cumulatively there must have been many, many problems and it must have been a, a bit of a horror show. Right. What we know so far, the COVID protocols were not being followed. They were they, they were victims of a bait and switch where they were promised a hotel, a Marriott, I believe, near the location when they showed up to shoot. They were told, no, no, no you're being put up in a in Albuquerque, which is 50 miles away. And they were working 14 hour days. And not getting paid the checks we're not. I'm sorry. Check, this checks stopped coming for three weeks. Three weeks they were expected to go without pay, and there were problems. Now you're a an uh, armorer. Yeah, I work as both a prop master and an armorer. There were problems. Hayatsi was complaining a week before the murder, the killing, the shooting. They were complaining about the guns, that it wasn't safe, correct? What I have read from the Associated Press, I haven't heard this first person, but what I read from the Associated Press was that there were a total of three misfires, uh, moments where a round went off unexpectedly. Now that can, there's a couple of things that can lead to that, but uh, one of those instances I'm told was a stunt man who should be an authority on guns as well. I'm told that that stunt man had dropped the hammer on a revolver on an empty chamber, but it turns out the gun was hot. So the gun was, he was under the impression it was a cold or unloaded gun. And that when he uh, pulled the trigger, it was hot and it went off. So that, the way I've heard it reported in the Associated Press is that that happened twice and that was one of the complaints. And then there was another, what they call an, an accidental discharge. So an accidental discharge can be a number of things. It can be a gun loaded with blanks and the actor's ready to go and everything's safe. And then the actor accidentally hits the trigger. That can be an accidental discharge. So I don't know what the second instant was, but there was things involving guns that had happened uh, at least two or three times. Okay. My work in television in a studio in Los Angeles or New York, there's a red phone that nobody's allowed to touch. What is the red phone? Uh, in, well, 
we don't have a red phone on sound stages anymore. There used to be a phone that went to security. Um, well, now, uh, the one I always remember is I always see it. It's a red phone that says nobody's allowed to touch it. It's a direct line to IATSE to report safety violence. I've, I've never heard of anything like of IATSE having a safety direct line. I maybe the sets I were maybe the sets I work on were so bad it was red from the blood and it, nothing, no safety precautions were being taken, just blood was spraying everywhere. I, I know for a fact that if you're a member of IATSE in Los Angeles and you don't feel safe, what happens when you don't feel safe? We have a safety hotline. Well, there's two avenues that you can, well, there's several avenues, actually. Let me be clear. There is an 800 safety hotline from IATSE for anonymous reporting. Each studio has its own anonymous safety hotline. So if I'm working over at Paramount this week, they have a safety hotline. Same thing at Sony or Warner Brothers. Also, you can call your local. So if it's just a general recurring thing, like I think that that bookcase up there might fall because it's not secure, you may call the safety hotline. Ideally, you would tell your supervisor and you get it dealt with right away, or you tell the first assistant director because he's in charge of safety overall, or you call your business agent at your local. Uh, in, in Hollywood, we have 13 backlot locals. So if you grip, you call the grip local. And I'm a prop master, so I would call my local 44 and say, hey, here is this acute problem that I'm dealing with. Would you uh, take measures to fix it? Will you come down here? We make a phone call so that we have various layers of safety mechanism, I'm proud to say. And I'm not saying I'm proud to say because I'm I'm not a representative of the IA. I want to be clear. I'm right. a working prop master. That's where it ends. But I'm proud of my membership and I'm proud of the safety procedures that we've put in place. There was a time in Hollywood, or at least I only know television. There was a time in Hollywood where you were not allowed to touch anything that was on the set. You couldn't move a chair without the wrath of the union coming down on you? It's not so much the wrath of the union, but it would be uh, the wrath of the person whose stuff you were, were touching. And it, that, that's the prop master back in days of old was one of the three um, sort of leaders of the set. There was the director, the director of photography, and the prop master, sort of the, the triad of power. And the director was in charge of the acting and the dialogue and the emotions. The director of photography was in charge of where the camera goes and the shaping of the lighting. And then the prop master was in charge of the set. And that's the environment in which they are filming. Now, the production designer designs it in advance. The set decorator decides how to you know, pick the drapes and put the wallpaper and put the furnishings. But the minute that camera rolls on a scene, set decorator walks away. There's never a production designer there. And that's that's practice. That's OK. But at that point, the prop master is the senior person for the art department. So if something needs to change drastically. I've heard stories of a director that came into a set and they said, this just isn't working for us. Where's the decorator? Well, she's on to the next set doing what she's supposed to. All right, where's the prop master? Great, we're gonna change this. Do you have any more chairs? Okay, right away. It was not uncommon for the prop master to handle that. And and God forbid you touch their stuff, our stuff. Um, anything could be, I, I could have something set setting where glue is drying on it. And someone walks by and picks it up as a curiosity. That's an interesting pen. Oh God, what did you just do? That was the rigged pen. What do you mean the rigged pen? Continuity, it screws up oh. continuity. Continuity with things moving on camera will totally blow the audience and get them un disinvested from the story. So continuity is number one. But just the idea that the grips have their gear over here. I don't touch it. I'm going to ask a grip. Would you please set up a C-stand for me? And I'm here's here, uh, here's what, because I am not a member of IATSE. Mm -hmm. and Doesn't make you a bad person, David. I know. I know. Uh, this is what I was told. I was told when you walked into the control room and if you even put your hand over the Grass Valley switcher that in a, in a TV studio, you can't do. There was a time when you couldn't do that. If you so much as on a variety show where the, you know, the sets are not that complicated and it's pretty obvious that a chair is on the set for the use of somebody. It's not going to be shown in the show off camera, off camera yeah. Crew or something. yeah yes people would say management would say yeah they don't want uh, they want to be the ones moving they want to protect their jobs this is an example of 
let me just let me this is bullshit. But this is what the producers would say. Can you believe the unions? We can't move a chair without the unions. When I've heard producers tell me that story and I, and I, I know where it's coming from and it's not true. They, they try to deflect the blame. If a chair is touched on the set and somebody sits in it and it's broken and then there's a lawsuit, there's a chain of custody to that chair. And the prop master, if somebody gets injured sitting in a chair or slips, the chain of custody goes right to the prop master. Don't touch anything on the set. Plus, their job is to keep you safe. That's why. And so this assistant director is the one who said, cold gun, and handed it to Alex, right? Yes, he did. That, well, that's the testimony I've seen. That's the affidavit say that. So I'm under the impression he did something way out of character with that role is not only touching the gun, but grabbing the gun and further handing it to an actor without inspecting it, whether he did or not is irrelevant. And then going so far as to declaring it cold and safe so they can go ahead and rehearse with it. I, I'm dying to know where the armor was during this exchange. Was she off at the bathroom? Was she told to walk out of the set during a blocking? It's a private rehearsal. Don't worry. We won't touch any of your guns. So get to get out of here, sweetheart. I don't know what what occurred but any of those scenarios are possible but that first ad has zero business touching a gun zero business handing it to an actor and that caused it I, I, that is just the worst thing you can okay do. so i've held off we have we're, we're talking with dutch merrick he is the former president of local 44 iotsi right. 44 he is an armorer and a prop master and it's good to see you again dutch Good to see you, David. I, I did not want to talk about gun safety with mm -hmm. you. I wanted to talk about unions and exploitation. But let's turn to gun safety on a set. Had this been in Los Angeles, would the producers, would Rust Movie Productions LLC... That's the producer. Mm -hmm. Could they throw the the crew off and replace them with scabs? In 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 the forty four in your old juris, your it is your jury when you were president of local forty four. You the studio couldn't just say we're well, bringing in scabs. My, my understanding is if it's a union show that started here and they have a union crew. And for some reason, they decided to replace the crew with a non-union crew. That would be a, a reason that we could strike. Uh, we could strike that show. It doesn't mean it's an industry strike. It means we could pick at that show and try to shut it down. But a union show, you know, it always, always works the opposite way. There will be a non-union show in town that they skirt the unions and they try to do everything low budget. And if someone can demonstrate that they do have the money to afford one of our lower tier contracts, the union will go and negotiate with them and organize. And honestly, most producers have a fund set aside for when the union inevitably comes around and organizes this little feature of ours. Usually that money is ready to go. And they sit at a table for about half a day. They shut down for that time. And then they say, okay, we're gonna sign. Now everyone on that show that was non-union now gets union days towards uh, the joining the union because it's what we call an organized show. Never have I seen it go backwards where here is a union show and we're going to hire non-union people. I'm not aware of that. So what happened. would have happened? I mean, you're getting me. I, I'm sorry. It's not you're making me angry because you're so calm and you understand this. And it and uh, what would have happened? Here's the question. Alec Baldwin yeah. should have walked off the set the minute the police arrived to escort Iotsi off the set. He's not Kelsey Grammer. He's not Gary Sinise. He is supposedly one of us, you know, left of center, pro-union. Didn't he support Iotsi in the lead up? Isn't he? 
Well, let me let me offer you this. I mean, as you know, I wasn't there. As you know, I don't have a crystal ball to know what everybody was thinking. But I will offer you what I think is an important consideration, important context. Um, when a when an actor is on a show, we keep them in a bit of a bubble. They're isolated from the the hassles of traffic and is catering cold. We cater to them so that they can be focusing on one thing, and that's being the best character. Not Alec Baldwin. I worked with Alec Baldwin. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving you. But a he concept. he knows he's up in everybody's business. He he's you know he's a politician. When I met him, I thought this guy should run for mayor of New York City. He's up in everybody's business. He wants to know who you are. He's gregarious. He know he knows everything that's going on. He's a control freak. So again, I can't speak to what happened on that set, um, but I've seen it several times where a show was in the middle of being organized or organizing non-union, and people have walked off. <coughs> Excuse me, and people have walked off. Um, but I've never seen cast walk off in solidarity, honestly. So that I, I sad to think about it. I actually have not seen cast walk off when the crew walked off because usually the cast has a SAG contract, Screen Actors Guild. And as long as they're under their contract and they're working, being taken care of, they don't have that level of solidarity generally and say, oh, our IATSC brothers and sisters have just walked off. We're going to walk off, too. But he was I, also a producer. And you also honestly believe that's an honorific? He's a producer. Who would want a producer credit? I don't know. Well, here's the thing. When uh, Many times in the past, I can only give you my personal experience. Many times in the past, when I've seen an actor who is an executive producer on a show, it is for the reasons of helping getting it funded and using their name to get the show. And then they also get some profit participation. But in very few instances has that star, in my experience, been hands on and been dealing with the day to day operations of the show. I have seen it a couple of times. I've seen very hands on executive producers that were cast. But in most instances, they put their name out in the beginning. The show is happening. Now I'm an actor. Don't bother me. Let the unit production manager and production manager deal with those things. It's none of my concern. You guys get paid the big bucks to figure it out. Now go figure it out. I'm in character. Leave me be. That's my experience. So Alec Baldwin wasn't just getting after minimum, correct? He's he's making money off rust, whether it makes money or not. Right. He's in on the financing, correct? I can't speak to his deal. I've never seen the contracts. I haven't seen anything reported about it. And you never so. will because it's a, because it's a limited liability company. So you you're, you'd have to go. You'd have to hire lawyers who would make it prohibitive for you to see his contract. You don't know. It's impossible to find out what Alec Baldwin ma is making from Rust. Yeah, it's, it's honestly a little bit beyond my pay grade. Um, if you ask me about color timing or overseas distribution, I would just stare at you blankly. And that's one of those things that my firsthand experience is the production process. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question about these limited liability corporate, these LLCs. Uh, like Comedy Central is a Writers Guild signatory. Okay. But The Daily Show, when Jon Stewart was there, was not a Writers Guild signatory. And so Jon Stewart fought the Writers Guild. He didn't want his writers to have health insurance. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. Of course you wouldn't know that the same way you don't. Look at the reporting on Rust. Look at the way the New York Times reports on rust. They call it union unrest, labor unrest, as opposed to the producers screwing a union crew. Of course, you don't know about Jon Stewart. I'm not I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not mad at you. I'm just this is the way this stuff gets reported. And th this story about Alec Baldwin is about IATSE fighting for what's in the contract. And of course, well, the mainstream media isn't going to report that because the mainstream media, including Rachel Maddow, at, ver at the very best, pays lip service to, to labor. We don't even know if, if Rachel Maddow finally signed a contract with her writers for the, it to be union. We don't know. They won't. They, 
I, I can offer you the, the context of it. God I can damn it. This, this country is so, it, you know, and everybody's talking about poor Alec Baldwin. He should have walked off that set. The only context that I can offer you is from what I've read, obviously, secondhand. And to think of, if I picture that day unfolding in my head from the morning when the camera crew got there, they're usually one of the earliest calls. And within an hour, they were packing up their gear. And then the producer is making phone calls to replace them. So we know these are facts that happened. And then uh, what I was, what I read was that security escorted them off, not the police, but they were escorted off. Nonetheless, you guys need to leave. And I get it. I've seen that happen. Whether I agree with it or not, I've seen it happen. And then uh, this accident happens at one o'clock in the afternoon. It's feasible to me that enough time lapse between their call time and the accident, plus it was Thursday, it was late in the week. So it's very likely that their call got pushed back each day. They might've started at 10 or 11 in the morning. So this might've been right after that happened. Um, to me, that's not a lot of time for that to sort of saturate and germinate. Oh God, and here's Alec that shows up and here's new faces in the camera, but I still got the DP and I still got the camera operator that I know. And here's the armor. Okay, let's go. He may not have been aware, I don't know. Uh, he may have been aware. How about a statement it, right now? How about a statement? How about a statement in support of IATSE right now? He, he's very quick to go on Twitter the day after and explain, defend himself. We knew he didn't do it on purpose. I never, nobody for a second thought Alec Baldwin murdered anybody. Why isn't he get, getting ahead of this labor story and saying this is an example of what happens when you do things on the cheap? Why isn't he getting he, he's such an outspoken cr critic of Republicans and Donald Trump. Why isn't he getting ahead of this story and saying that this woman, the cinematographer, is dead because we didn't follow safety protocols because we were doing things on the cheap? That's his obligation and he's I not doing it. I can't speak to that. I do know that I would not want to be in his shoes. I don't envy him. And uh, oh, he, I, he, don't he, know, well, I don't know he, how I would handle it. He's not going to, he, he, listen, he's going to make amends with the family. But to make sure this never happens again, he needs to speak out against making these movies on the cheap. The reason that cinematographer is dead is because they were doing the movie on the cheap. An AD, a bully, the AD, who is allegedly a notorious bully, an arrogant, handed the gun to Baldwin, said, cold gun, no ar armorer on the set. So let's talk about gun safety. What should have been the protocol? You, you deal with guns, right? I do. I work with guns uh, explicitly. Um, when a gun is brought into a production, it is kept in the prop department on a, in a safe, you know, under lock and key. And a prop master with a weapons permit can handle weapons and can bring them to the set and do the functions of an armorer. Once you have uh, more complicated guns or more quantity of guns, you definitely want to have an armor there that that is their only focus uh, so that it's not a prop master dealing with other continuity issues and guns. It's just an armor and just the guns. We will transport the guns from the safe to the set, usually using a cart, as has been talked about in this instance at Rust, the guns on a cart, it's entirely common. And we will, uh, we constantly check the guns, David. We check them coming out of the safe. We check them on the cart regularly to make sure that they're empty and what we call a cold gun, as you've heard. And then the, uh, we'll talk about blocking out the scene. They'll do a, a mini rehearsal where they'll, they'll talk about the dialogue and find their positions. And then we'll, we'll really rough it in better where we see where everybody's standing. We'll see where the camera's at. We'll see where every gun is pointed. We'll see wh when they've put their finger on the trigger during the scene. Cause I don't want an actor walking into a set on a scene and putting his finger on the trigger immediately. Uh, the scene might take 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and then the action happens. That's the point where we train the actor to put their finger on the trigger. Um, and we always point in a safe direction. The three cardinal rules of gun safety, your finger stays off the trigger until you're ready to fire. The gun always stays pointed in a safe direction, never at a person. And you always treat the gun as if it is loaded. And that is the armor's responsibility to remind the actor regularly 
And it's, we're the safety mechanism. So the actor can be fully in the scene and fully fleshing out that character. And we're there to say, that's where you're going to point the gun. Okay. When we do the scene, you're going to stand here and you're going to point there. Are we, are we capiche? So then we'll do the rehearsal without uh, any rounds in the gun or with a dummy gun or a rehearsal gun. Uh, once everybody's comfortable and they've gone in and lit it and they put the sound, they know where the mic's going to be, the lights and the, and the grip stands, last thing is going to be to make those guns go hot. So, uh, all right, the armor has the set, make the guns go hot and I'll go out and then I'll put dummy, I'll put blank rounds in each of the uh, guns that are going to fire and confirm with the actor. You remember where you're going to shoot? Yes. You remember when you're going to shoot? Yes. Great. Two thumbs up. All guns are hot. Go. I walk out, or if there's a special effect, you know, we walk out together because you're going to rig those explosions at the very last minute with the guns. And then they act out the scene. They call action, cameras rolling. They act out the scene when it finishes, everything stops and freezes. The actors stand in place. The armor comes back out and collects the guns. We clear each gun right then and there, empty, 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 two thumbs up. Okay, all the guns are cold. The, ca- the crew has the set is what they call out. Then the crew has the set. Then the grips can come in. People can make adjustments. Cost- costumes can come in and adjust the costume. But we maintain control of set of those crucial moments just before we roll and just after they cut. And we are the final determiner of safety at that point. Nothing's going to happen unless we give it the A-OK. And I've told plenty of directors, no, sir, I'm sorry. You cannot do that shot that you're trying to do. But let's try to work it out from another angle. How about we try this? And so the angle was wrong. The wrong people were touching the gun. We don't know where the armorer was. What is in a hot gun on a movie set? Not a bullet. What? Where? It's a blank cartridge. Um, what does so that mean? I, I don't know anything about guns. So what does that mean? Uh, I don't have a diagram to show you, but you can imagine a, a, a round, a bullet as a brass casing. That's the casing. And in one end is a primer. When the hammer on a gun is dropped on that primer, it causes a tiny explosion. Inside that brass casing is gunpowder that then burns very fast. So the explosion triggers the burn. And at the other end of the cartridge is a lead bullet, generally. And that creates enough pressure to cause that cartridge and bullet to expand, and it forces the bullet out. The only way to go is the exit door, which is the barrel. That's how a bullet works. Now, a blank is different in the sense that there's no bullet on the cartridge. It is a cartridge that's been sealed on the end. If you imagine the end of a hot dog, how it's pinched together, that's what the end of a, of a blank looks. And I have one I can put up wow. to my camera yeah. here. Now, a a hot dog is more dangerous than a bullet. That's not fair. Uh, but uh, can be, yeah, in the, in the long term. Yeah. <laughs> so that is, a, that is a blank round. It's been crimped. There's another type of blank round that has what they call a wadding, where it's an open shell, and they have a circular wadding of paper that holds the powder in place until it fires. When it fires, that wadding burns off as it goes out the barrel. So, uh, and there's two, uh, there's there's a couple of different ways to deal with blanks. Uh, there's some guns that need no modification, and there's other guns that do need modification. In the old west, they had lever action rifles that that cycle the round manually, and they have a revolver that again cycles the round manually. So when you pull the hammer back, it causes the cylinder to put the next round, the next chamber in line with the barrel, and it'll fire that one. So it's a mechanical action. Semi-automatics, which came around later, uh, as you see in all the action movies, is a you know 45 or a Glock or a machine gun. When that round fires, it forces the action to eject the shell on its own and put the next one in. It was called automatic. You know, you, you got a, a, a 45 automatic. doesn't mean fully automatic like we think of machine guns, but it means it automatically cycled the thing. You don't need to cock a hammer. You don't need to pump a shotgun. You don't need to pull a lever. You pull the trigger once and it's ready to pull the trigger again. So you can take a semi-auto Glock pistol as you see in these police dramas and go bing, 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 bing. As fast as you can pull the trigger, it will fire. So these old west uh, firearms, the rifles, the shotguns, and the pistols, because they're mechanical, you can put a blank in them or you can put a real round. There's no modifications. Semi-automatic weapons, you have to put a plug in the barrel to some degree that'll let some flaming gas out the front and cause the fire effect and give enough resistance to force the action to open and eject a cartridge and feed the next one in. So this Old West- uh, Can, I, can I just comment on that, please? Please do. 
uh, in the lead up to your segment, I was talking about LLCs, Rust Movie Productions LLCs, right? How LLCs work. Sure. If the people who set up the LLC try to explain how an LLC works, you your eyes would glaze over the same way their eyes would glaze over if you try to explain gun safety. They don't care about guns. What you just said, if lawyers and the people, the accountants, they, they don't care about gun safety. They they know that you know gun safety. That's all they need to know. And and so this is to me what happened on Thursday, last Thursday, is not about gun safety because it's like seatbelts. I don't need to know how my seatbelts work. I just have to wear my seatbelts. And I don't need to know how gun safety on a set works. I have to make sure that Dutch Merrick is on the set hand, handling the weapons, not an assistant director. That's all I need to know. Just as you wouldn't uh, ask the guy in the parking lot of Pep Boys to tune up your car, you're going to get a certified mechanic who's got a brick and mortar store, a producer or a production company or a major studio wants an armorer or a certified prop master to handle those guns. When they know that they have a certified union prop master or armorer, they now know that the job is handled. This young lady on that set, my understanding at this point is that she was not a member of the union. She was just on her second feature film. Although she had grown up with guns, apparently, this was an early project in her career. But her so, parents were somebody in the family was she grew up. I think somebody in the family was an armorer. Yeah. Her father, her father is a fellow named Thel Reed. Thel Reed was a legendary trick shooter and he worked uh, in props. Uh, he would teach actors how to what uh, we call leather slapping. So the old West where they'd reach and they draw really quickly and fire. That was Phil Reed's uh, specialty and expertise. Now that's her father. So she grew up under a great lineage. So uh, I would guess that she- I think she expressed concern about this shoot. She, she didn't feel she was ready. Well, that's my understanding is that that was from an interview that she did after her last show or during her last show, she had admitted onto a podcast that she was very nervous that she took that other show and uh, it was it was the biggest thing she had done to that point and that she did the show and it, and it I guess it went along uh, smoothly and then she ended up with this as her second ever. So what film. did the assistant Art. director, what did the assistant director, Souza is the director, I believe? Yeah, Joel Souza. Yeah, this wasn't his first movie. What did he owe that armorer? If you ha if you know you're the director and you know you have an armorer with a pedigree, but she's starting out. You owe her at the very least to make sure the AD is not handling her guns, correct? I, I wouldn't put it at the feet of the director to owe the armor what the first AD does. The first assistant director is an autonomous person on sets. They are in the directing department. There is a director and a first AD. Uh, but that first assistant director is the orchestrator that brings all the elements of the band together. Uh, and it says, okay, everyone on one, we're going to play this song. So they go to the call sheet, scene number two. We're going to play this song, John Philip Sousa. Strike up the band, start the brass. And right. he gets the timing going and then gets everything going. And then the director can call action and the director deals with that. The, the director is, is also subject to the first AD's control to a degree because the first AD sets the schedule and says, this is what we're going to do next. And OK, go get all the elements together. Now, Mr. Director, it's yours. And they hand mm -hmm. it off to them when it's ready to roll the camera. I wouldn't put it at the feet of the director to be responsible for what the first AD did at all. Uh, yeah. Let's continue this conversation. Sorry for the uh, the anger. It, it's just that. I feel your anger. I'm I'm beyond. I'm beside myself. And I'll tell you what. Uh, Friday, when we heard the news, and the call started coming in from reporters and friends to ask if we're okay. 
Was it you on the set? Do you know who it was? Uh, it shattered uh, the entertainment industry. So many people were worried about who was affected and what happened. And we found out one of ours didn't go home that day. It was crushing. And in the armor community, especially because that's our craft and we take pride in doing it safely. When I walked on set Friday morning, the first AD of our show came up to me ugly, and she said, I am so sorry for you. Are you okay? And I said, I'm okay. She said, thank you so much for being our armor and being so safe. And the director came up to me and he did the same thing. He gave me a big hug and he said, we are lucky to have you. And, and then the crew circled up and we all went into little circles at different times over the day and we discussed how this event affected us. And people were really hurt by this. So we're hurt and we're angry and we all want to find someone to blame. We want to find some way to justify what happened. And, and, I, and, I, and I'll tell you, it's very simple who to blame and where the anger should be directed. It should have been a union crew and when you when 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 you when Iatsi is walking off a location, the shoot, if you'll pardon the pun, should be over. When the union quits, everybody quits because it's not just about wages; it's about safety. And Alec Baldwin and the director should have walked off that set the minute Iatsi walked off that set. Which side are you on? Are you on the side of management or are you on the side of the unions? Pick a side. There's no gray areas. That's where the anger is. Hollywood has been built around that gray area and that may be part of what has diluted union power in Hollywood, in the entertainment industry. Uh, we do not have the most uh, labor oriented unions. And that because be of these of effing LLCs. So what happens is Paramount can be a union signatory, but then they they set up an LLC that isn't. It's a shell game. These limited liability companies are get people killed. I've got about eight more. Minutes. Yeah, well, I'm going to come back. I'm, I'm backed into an interview right after this right. that I need to be ready for. Uh, it, it, I'll let you go. I'm keeping you. I just want John Hayes is here. He's a, a, a fellow union member. John, you have a question. You want to say hello to Dutch? Hi, Dutch. Hi, John. Hi, Dutch. Good to hear your voice, brother. Yeah, it was a surprise to see you here tonight. Um, it's been a lot of years. Yeah. Um, I don't have a specific question, but uh, I've certainly been on plenty of sets as a boom operator standing near the camera and getting uh, seeing the whole operation that you guys do. And this doesn't sound anything close to what I see on our union shoots here in L.A. This sounds no. like utterly what the, you know, well, you know were the, they the, thinking? The, the puns are writing themselves because it really was the Wild West on this show. Right. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. yeah. I will uh, touch well, Merrick. Uh, well, I will say this reminds yeah. me of The Crow, which was also a non-union shoot in a right to jerk state, North Carolina, 28 years ago when Brandon Lee was killed under not exactly the same circumstances, but there are some parallels to be made in there with the crew. Yeah. In, in the I mean, if there are a few more questions you guys want to squeeze in the last few minutes, that's fine. Just I. Well, I'm, we're, we're bleeding into Roger Nygaard, so we'll, 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 please come back. I apologize f uh, for my anger, but people need to be held accountable for their inactions. When something, when you're, when you call yourself a liberal, a left of center liberal Democrat, and all you do is pay lip service to unions, but find your way around unions through LLCs, you're not just part of the problem, you are the problem. My heart goes out to everybody on that film set, particularly Helena's husband and son. Um, it's the most wrenching thing to happen in Hollywood in, in ages. And the, and the first, first gunfire death on a set in 28 years and one of the only ones ever in filming history so uh, i just hope that we find some closure and 
and that we redouble our safety efforts that this doesn't happen again. I appreciate your having me on, David. I, Thank you, Dutch. Good to connect with you, and I'm glad to do it yeah. again. It's good to see you, buddy. We'll have you back uh, when I'm a little, uh, my head is a little cooler. Thank you, Dutch. How do people contact you, Dutch? Uh, uh, I would try me on Facebook, Dutch Merrick, D-U-T-C-H-M-E-R-R-I-C-K is actually the best way to get a hold of me these days. Thank you. Thank you, Dutch. And thank you, John Hayes. Let's go back to Los Angeles where, jo where Roger Nygaard is standing by. We're, uh, we have limited time. Uh, we're, we're running late, Roger. And I think there was a scheduling conflict with you. So it's good to see you. You were on, I don't know, earlier this year with your documentary. Yes. Marriage. Documentary. Yeah. About relationships and, and marriage. You're a director. You're an editor and you have a new book out. I believe it's called Is It Funny? It's called Cut to the Monkey. But that's one of the questions I ask right. in the book is just what is funny and what isn't funny. Right. I, I apologize. It's called Cut to the Monkey. I was reading it. So here's full disclosure. The book got sent to me last night. I start reading it and I contacted her. This is I was rude to you. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> you said you had things to do. Damn it. Now I'm stuck reading this book because it's great. <laughs> I, I was trying to get this show ready and I, I start reading it. And go, this is really interesting. This is so much more interesting than anything I'm going to be talking about on the show. You bastard. And you said to me, why don't we? And I said, no, I want you on the show uh, tomorrow. What we should well, you're do. the first. You're, you're first in line. You jumped on it immediately. I just started telling people, hey, I've got this book coming out November 15th. And you're like, ding, 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 first in line. Yeah, well, let's let's do this. Uh, your old friend John Ross is coming up in about eight right, minutes. Right, I'm opening for John. It's an honor. I know. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk casually, and then hopefully you'll find time for me on Thursday. But in my defense, you were a little late. Uh, yes, I was. Yes, uh, I, I, just, was, I was seven minutes late. My fault entirely. And I, I thought it was Skype and it's not Skype. It's Zoom. So I'm here. Do, do you like my little Hollywood jujitsu there where I'm to blame, but I throw it back at you? I'm willing to absorb blame. I'm like the sin eater of the Night Gallery episode. I'll take <laughs> all of your blame. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the name of the book, which I love. Cut to the Monkey. And this is and because it's called that because in editing, you can always cut to a monkey at any time to save yourself for continuity, because no matter when you cut to a monkey, it's always funny because whatever <laughs> they do is funny. Right. Right. What's interesting about the book is you are revisiting your career as both a director and an editor and you, you you're you edit and or direct like Curb Your Enthusiasm. You, I've been working on Curb, yeah, for five seasons. I just finished editing season 11, which premiered yesterday, actually. Congratulations. And what you've done is you've gone back and spoken to all the people who you've worked with, Larry David, yeah, Sasha Baron. is a better word. I finally got Larry into the seat and then badgered him and interrogated him about comedy. And you Sasha know, Baron Cohen. Yes. And the, the three <laughs> Harvard assholes from Curb Your Enthusiasm. We <laughs> call them Alfred, Harvard assholes. Dave Mandel and Jeff Schaefer. I was very disappointed to find out that all three of them went to Harvard because I'm big fans of their work. But I didn't know they were part of the, the problem. I did not, so that may be helpful to you. I went to the University of Minnesota. So I know that's that, why, that might be good. That's why you're talented. Yeah, that, that's why. <laughs> and so you ask, uh, you talk to Brad Hall. You talk to Julia Louis Dreyfus, who is probably the greatest comedy actor since Lucy. Is that fair to say? Her instincts are incredible. Yeah, Why I mean, is as an that? editor, I see all of her takes. And she's all just some actors, you really have to piece it together. And others, they give you something every take. And she's one of those amazing talents that gives you something every single time. It's funny. Oh, I never thought someone could do a line that way. And that works in, every time you say that. Right. Editing is everything. Why? You know, I make the, this is the argument I make in the book is that the three most important people on a production 
uh, after the crew, after the cast, the, the studio will say the cast and they're right for marketing. But after the cast is number one, the writer, because without the script, you got nothing, right? That's where everything comes from a good script, bad script that determines the trajectory of the entire production. Second is the, either the director or the showrunner showrunner for television, because they control everything directors and films, because right. that person makes all the creative decisions in every category. The third most important person I argue is the editor because an editor is a rewriter. You're writer, you're writing and rewriting what they've given you. And you know, a lot of times they just say, get the most, get who's available to edit the, the, the show. But you wouldn't say that about a writer. You wouldn't say get who's available. You get the one who's the best writer. And so it's really hard to determine who's a good editor because there's no way to know unless you've looked at all the options they had before they chose what they chose. You know, when there was union trouble with the Writers Guild years ago, there was talk of bleeding, bleeding, uh, folding editors into the Writers Guild, which I was for. I, I, I believe editors are, write it, are writers. There's no question. Uh, Ralph, who was Woody Allen's editor on Take the Money and Run? Oh, uh, um, Ralph. I think you're thinking of Ralph Winter, right? Is no, 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 no. Oh, my God, I'm making a big point. Well, I'm not Google, you know, Google, that's what Google's for. I, to look that Ralph up. something, I should know. He wrote Take the Money and Run. Because Woody well, Allen. The Coen brothers came up through editing. They, the Coen brothers started as editors. They, Woody Allen didn't know what his movie was until, I think it's Ralph Rosenblum. Somebody please look it up. But Woody Allen. Right, will, get your staff on this. Yeah, get my staff. Uh, on this. I think it's Ralph Rosenblum or Ralph Rosen something. He said, no, no, this is what your movie is. The baptism scene in The Godfather. Nobody wrote that, right? Yeah, you do. You manufacture a lot in the editing room the, that they never Francis thought of. Francis Ford Coppola went off and came back three weeks later and the editor said, let me show you something. That whole scene the baptism that is the movie, that montage, was the editor, not not Mario Puzo, not Francis Ford Coppola, it was the editor. So isn't that what, so when you say cut to the monkey, uh, you cannot make a movie, especially a comedy, with a world-class editor. So you said the Cone brothers started as editors? What does that mean? Yeah, they worked for Sam Raimi on Evil Dead, I think Evil Dead 1. And then they together made a film called The XYZ Murders, which didn't, wasn't real, didn't get uh, very much um, response. But then the Cone brothers made uh, Raising Arizona and then their, their careers were launched. But they started out in the editing room for Sam Raimi. And a lot of a lot of people do a lot of editors, a lot of directors do not all. I mean, a few do. And the thing is, when I tr am trying to teach other editors who like my assistants or people that I have been teaching editing to is you need to be a writer as well as an editor. You need to understand story structure. You need to understand joke structure. And on Curb Your Enthusiasm, we spend more time fixing setups than we do on trying to improve punchlines. The setup is is more important in many ways. If not, it's as important as the punchline, if not more important, because and this is Jeff Schaefer's his mathematical thinking about comedy. It's like math. You don't want the audience thinking when they should be laughing. So therefore, they have to know what the game is. That means your setup has to have been fully laid down so they know exactly what's at stake. Larry needs to steal the coffee beans. Once they've got that, now you can lay down the jokes it's one the after same, another. I love hearing that. I, I, the same thing applies to just a standard joke. If you don't have a good setup in a... And you can't blow it. You can't bobble it. You can't swallow it. It's got to be enunciated. It's got to be clear. It's got to be understandable. And the shortest number of words possible. So you can get to the punchline as quickly as possible. So the distance between setup and punchline is a straight line that's as short as possible. Yes, Oh, this is music to my ears. I love you for, seriously, I love you for saying what you just said. It's the, You're welcome. The, 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 the setup, it has to be concise and clear. And it really is one and one. That's it. One and one. And then whatever comes next is two. 
That's it. And curb, oftentimes when they're shooting curb and preparing and writing it, they will lay in three setups for the same payoff. And then we will decide which one to use and throw out two of the others because we, we they don't know when they're shooting necessarily what's going to work best. And so I get to choose, and then I, I get to choose which jokes I think are funniest. You're watching an episode of Curb, which is all the stuff I thought was funniest. Mm-hmm. I'm filtering. It's what I get. I get to choose because it's my sense of humor that you are all. You're doing the what is called the, and, you know, you're doing the line cut. Things. It's called the line cut, right? Yes. The line cut is what the editors, they sift through all the shots and you throw out stuff that you don't want the director to see because you don't you're saving him time so you give him four takes instead of the 40 and he picks from that so if there's something um i believe things are more funny when they're grounded in reality also so i tend to cut out the more broad jokes and try to bring it down to reality jeff schaefer goes a little more broad larry doesn't like to go quite as broad and so i kind of find a place in the middle right John Ross joins us. I'm going to call an audible here. He's a well-known comedy expert. uh, You might remember uh, John Ross from a movie. I believe I'm going to get the name. Was it Trekkies? What is the document? There was a documentary you directed about (laughs) people who are obsessed with Star Trek. Is that correct? Our paths cross again, John. Yes, Yes. uh, Trekkies. And and I believe John Ross is in your, your documentary. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. If you get at the end of the show, at the end of the movie, at the, when the credits are rolling, there's four or five comics that were all doing jokes about Star Trek, <laughs> which seems to me a, a fun way to end the documentary, because to me, the documentary was a comedy. Mm-hmm. So it was just like tipping my hand to everyone. Hey, I, I think this is funny. Right. Now, you know that Robert Smigel wrote the Get a Life. Yeah, I, I've got a quote from him in my book also from his time working with Larry on Curb. But just to finish by, uh, flattering John, I had to pick the five. But we're done flattering. Done, we're existence. done flattering John. <laughs> <laughs> blah, 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 he I can't list. hear you. Go ahead. Flatter John. Break my heart. He made the list. The five funniest Star Trek comedians in existence. <laughs> that you could get. At, <laughs> at the <laughs> Ice House. For Wednesday. free. <laughs> For free. Yeah. I'm on that list. I, I sent Robert. You're still on that list. I, yeah. I know. I'm trying to get off it. <laughs> I sent Smigel a, a clip. I think this, I think like two months ago, Shatner gave an interview saying his, one of his regrets was doing that sketch where he told Trekkies to get a life. And I, so that was. Um, Shatner will do anything for money, basically. And they yes. paid him to do it. So he said, okay, I'll do it. He and will. Afterwards. Yeah, sure. Second thoughts. Uh, Roger Nigar, will you come back Thursday? Yeah, of course. And, and we'll discuss Anytime. Cut to the Monkey and all your movies. And I'm going to take some of the blame for cutting this short. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah. No, no problem. You know, that's that's. Uh, and by then I will have completely finished the book. Here's the thing I've noticed. That's the plus. Every Od- Oderkirk uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, Larry David, the three Harvard, the three fucking Harvard geniuses. It kills me <laughs> that Judd Apatow, <laughs> yeah. Jake Johansson. Yeah. They all were heavily influenced by Monty Python. And it, oh, yes. And it amazes me that so many people don't know. Who Monty Python? Well, that just came up when I began asking them all, what was your most important comedy influence when you were a kid, when you were young, growing up? What do you remember the most? And Monty Python came up more than anything else. And I'd say the Marx Brothers were second in line. And uh, they, and they, they have a lot in common. What they both do is that they, they punch upward. They, they make fun of the upper people who are above them, the queen, the, the judges, the police, not people, you know, uh, losers or, or, or misfits. It was more about punching upward. And that's what a lot of people, uh, Judd Apatow said, he really empathized with that. That's that's me. I felt out. I, I was the misfit and I wanted to get back at those people who didn't pick me first in battle ball in, in uh, high school. And so, yeah, there was a lot of consistency 
I don't know. Maybe, maybe we could ask John and see if uh, he's what his. I, you're, you're making my head explode. Was. I can't. You are. You are. Say, like I. 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 I need to move in with you, Roger. You're saying something. <laughs> you indulge me. I apologize. I, I'm sleep deprived, and I'm going from <laughs> hatred for what happened on that Alec Baldwin set. Uh, to I'm I'm a little all over. I apologize, but somebody cornered me. I was w walking at, uh, three days ago about Dave Chappelle and punching down, and it involves Monty Python. And then I'll let you talk, John. Okay? Gee, thanks. I know, <laughs> but I just want to. This is so important to me. Go about punching down, and I said, punching down is way funnier than punching up. Punching down is 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 so much funnier than punching up, but you need to know how to do it. And I and what I said about Monty Python that my seminal moment was sitting with my father watching Monty Python on the bed. John, anybody? I was on the bed with my father watching Monty Python. Anybody want to? Anybody want to touch that? That's no, what I said guys, to my father. Uh, Anybody want to touch that? We were watching Monty yeah, Python. It's touching. <laughs> yeah, it was a very touching moment. I was on the bed with my father watching Monty Python. It was on Channel 13, 1030, Sunday night. Always very bad reception. Yes. And John Cleese was playing a boxer who was punch drunk, shall we say. And he would train for a fight by rubbing gravel in his head. And he was playing. He was an idiot. He was mentally deficient. And his big fight, he's training for. And he gets into a ring with an old woman. And <laughs> do you remember this? Yes. <laughs> and up until that moment, I had my expectations. And John Cleese and Monty Python had their own. And he gets into the ring with the old woman and he kicks her fucking ass. He beats the old woman to a pulp. And my father and I, I mean, that was the funniest thing. And I went, wow, this is this is a whole other level of comedy, not just because it defied expectations, because it would have been funny to see the old woman beat John Cleese up. Right. That's funny to see an old woman beat up John Cleese, but it is so much funnier to see John Cleese beating the shit out of an old woman. An old woman falling down the steps is funny. It's Anybody funny. Falling down is funny. If she's in a wheelchair, even funnier. And if she has a cold, it's funnier. That's well, misery is funny, right? Misery Somebody is funny. Tragedy is your comedy. Yeah, go ahead. You no, know, I was a, a giant um, Monty Python fan, but for some reason, I'm not remembering that particular sketch. Tell me, uh, was one of the other uh, uh, Pythoners playing the old woman? Nope. It was an actual old woman. Well, it was, was an actress person? playing an old woman. An actress playing an old woman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why you, you're thinking? Had it been like Terry Gilliam or something, it would have been okay. Uh, yeah, it, I don't know. I'm just thinking about it. I'm just uh, picturing it. And why is it funny? And is it funny because we're really making fun of the boxer because he's, he's such an idiot that he knows? You know what I mean? Like, what is funny about it? Uh, I'm I'm wondering. It's it's funny remember. that he's such an idiot, but it's also funny. And and anybody who says otherwise is a liar. It's funny. It's like uh, uh, life alert. Oh, uh, uh, you know those commercials. If you're a kid, but, but yeah, I, but you know I, that's funny. You but it, but if I'm watching, if I'm watching a drama, and some old woman interrupts a drug deal, and they turn on the street, and they, you know, slice her face open and push. Am, am I laughing at that? I, do you watch? It, do, do you laugh at what? horror movies? I mean, I certainly will. I, I told you this story once on the show. I was in a theater in New York City and I was watching Cape Fear. And 
uh, Ileana Douglas had gotten the shit kicked out of her um, by, I think it was the Max Niro Katie. character. Max, Max Katie. Katie. And she's lying in bed with her back to the camera. And when she rolls over and reveals her face to the camera, she's been beaten badly and her and she's got a black eye and it's and there were some people in the theater when they saw her, they're like, oh shit, bitch got you. And I was like, that was scary to me. I wasn't like ha ha ha. I was, oh, the, these are mentally ill people. So I don't know. I don't it's not like automatically funny to see a woman being beaten up. I, Iago, I I saw Richard Dreyfuss. Richard Dreyfuss played Iago in Othello, and he played it for laughs. And I remember thinking, yeah, you could play Iago. Iago is the epitome of evil. He arranges for Desdemona to be smothered by Othello. But there's evil can be funny. And a lot of people in the audience were upset that some people were laughing at Iago. But it all depends. Horror films are funny. And Max Can Cape, and, and, and De Niro was funny. If you go back and watch Cape Fear, Max Cady was funny. In moments, it's all about context. I, I maintain that that seeing a woman having been raped and beaten up and, and just that. If you think that's funny, OK, that's that's you. I don't see like just with no context, seeing a beaten up woman as funny, uh, you know, it's but, an expert level approach. Not everyone can pull that off and make it funny the way that the pythons did. And you're, there's an episode of Curb coming up where Larry gets into a thing with his female limo driver. Very difficult to make that funny, but he does. I mean, they get into a physical altercation. So yeah, this is that's not the easy joke to land successfully. By well, that means. but isn't but that can. isn't that Larry David's genius is to take something that is incredibly, incredibly painful, like the Holocaust. There's a Holocaust moment in this season of, of Curb. Yes, he doesn't shy away from anything. Nothing sacred. But Child molestation. Also, Wasn't there deliver. a thing? You know, one of the early episodes is he's in a bathroom with a, a girl and it looks like he molested her, right? Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So. It's, you know, um, I didn't know, I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't know The Sopranos was a comedy. I I used to watch it. it. Both. It's both. Great drama has comedy within it, layered within it. You you idea like Terms of Endearment is one of my favorite movies and it's a gut wrenching drama, but it's hilariously funny as well. When she's screaming, give her the shot, give her the shot. When the, <laughs> when the daughter's dying and she needs the morphine shot. And I, I was laughing hysterically. Give her the shot. I'm kidding. To I'm me, kidding. Squid I'm Game kidding. is funny. I don't know if you've seen it. Everybody's seen it, but it's, it's, it's like people are, it's life and death. But mm-hmm. there's such funny moments because of the way it's presented. Right. Have you seen White Lotus? Yes. Yeah. Very funny, but also <laughs> super dramatic. And, yeah, uh, pathetic and sad, but hilarious. Yeah. That's great writing when you can cross all those areas. I mean, you want people to laugh, cry, and get angry. If you can get all three of those, it's a home run. You want at least one of those in anything you're writing. Yeah. But with The Sopranos, I didn't know it was a comedy until I watched <laughs> it with my mother. She, she used to watch it on A&E. And she's laughing hysterically in the other room. And I'm going, what? And I go, oh, it's a, it's a, com- it's both. The guy's named Big Pussy. <laughs> I know. And, and David, everything isn't like, it's a comedy or it's a this. Like you have this need to like make the world black and white. It's not a comedy. It's there are comedy, there are comedic elements for sure in the Sopranos. But again, when he's, you know, when they shoot Big Pussy, you know, on the boat, that's not supposed to be funny. You know, you, you need to be able to tease that out. But when, when uh, what's his name? Paulie Walnuts goes, hey, look a little down. You want me to go get some Baja Fresh? <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, supposed to be funny. Uh, I talked to Big Pussy. <laughs> well, um, we all worked with... Uh, uh, Steve, remember? Steve uh, Shrippa. And I asked Big Pussy, I mm-hmm. said, 
was it a comedy or a drama? He says, it was a comedy. It was always a comedy. And you go back and watch The Sopranos. Everything in it is funny. Like when he's being shot, not in the face, Skip. When he's about to be shot, not in the face, Skip. Right. But I, I look, I don't want to argue with you. You can argue not, with me. Every, everything isn't funny in The Sopranos. I maintain it is. By okay. the way, Dan Frankenberger, who runs the show, has a quote about Woody Allen. Allen initially filmed a downbeat ending in which he was shot to death, courtesy of special effects from A.D. Flowers. We're talking about Take the Money and Run. Reputedly, the lighter ending is due to the influence of Allen's director, Ralph Rosenblum, in his first collaboration with Allen. So that, that, that the point of Ralph Rosenblum, and I think Woody Allen pretty much says... Ralph Rosenblum wrote, you know, edited and told him what he had in, I think, Bananas and Take the Money and Run. Here's what I would like to do. You come back Thursday, Roger. Okay, thumbs up. I, I, I have to tell you, you said some things that are so fucking brilliant. Like, that are well, I just asked the, the smart people, funny people around me and I absorbed what they told me. Roger's new book is Cut to the Monkey. Did I get it right? That's correct. Yeah, uh, you can pre-order it. It's not out. It'll be November 15th is when it drops. You know, as usual, the David Feldman is way ahead of the curve yes. and getting the scoop. And he talks, he, he did something really smart, which most people don't do. He <laughs> went back. Well, you don't burn bridges, so you're able to go back and talk to all the people you work with. <laughs> So you talk to Sasha Baron Cohen, Larry David, the three Harvard assholes who are brilliant. It, like Ethan Hershenfeld went to Harvard. It breaks my heart. And Julia, Louis, I could talk about Julia Louis Dreyfus for hours. So come back Thursday, Roger. And your okay. latest documentary. The is, Truth About Marriage is a comedy. All my documentaries are comedies, they, they are, but they're serious as well. So they do, as John Ross has pointed out, they step in both worlds. Yes. Thank you, Roger Nygaard. I'll talk okay, to you you're Thursday. Welcome. Looking forward to it. Good to Thank see you. Uh, John Ross joins us. You might have seen his work in the movie Trekkies. He is a, aren't you a Writers Guild Award winning writer? I have uh, a Writer's Guild Award or two. I can't remember. Yes, and, and you're a great comedic mind. And it's good to see you. And we only have, I believe, 10 minutes. Okay. So we'll do this in 10 minutes. I, I had a whole thing that I wanted to talk to you about. Go ahead. About your last week's show. I also uh, have things to say about the, or experiences with the uh, gun situation. Uh, but with a show that you're familiar with. Um, what comics show? only. Comics only? I, I was thinking about comics only last night. Go ahead. Now, you loved comics only. It, it changed my life. Seriously. Changed your life. Go yeah. ahead. Non-union. We were young. We were, everything was guerrilla. Maybe that's part of what made it so great. We never got a permit to do anything. We were running around doing just crazy stuff and it was fun uh and we were like the three stooges with high technology we were the first ones to start doing stuff like we wanted to put a gun to somebody's head and pull the trigger as you know a joke because we were like cartoon characters we would come back in the next scene and so it didn't mean anything and uh, the early days of Comedy time. Central, Paul Provenza, Louis C.K., I believe, wrote on. No, no. Fred uh, Wolf and uh, Mike Armstrong, Betsy Bournes, uh, T. Uh, uh, T. Sean Shannon. And um, it, it uh, I would say, with all due uh, respect to Conan, Reed, ha Reed Harrison, I would say that if you watch what Conan was doing, I yeah. would say. Comics only was there before Conan. Oh, absolutely. We were. Yeah. Oh, we saw. Well, you know, T-Shawn went on to write for The Tonight Show and Fred went on to write for SNL and Mike. Right. Everybody went to these different places to write and they brought 
their sensibility, but also some of the bits, you know, in total. The the whole we used to do a security camera thing where Paul would go, oh, let's see what's going on around the studio. And like we go into different, you know, you'd see the writer's room and you'd see different security things and weird things would be happening. And then those bits got taken whole cloth. Yes. I was watching um, Bob Saget's Dirty yes. Work, Norm MacDonald, and the great... It reminded me of comics only because when you get hit by a car, yeah, you can be hit by a car or you can be hit by a car. Right. And I remember the one scene, you were a little rough last night and Paul, really, let's play a clip. And Paul was interviewing yeah. somebody and he was bored by him and just rips into the person's chest and rips up, rips out their heart and he's feeding their beating heart. Yes. Yeah. Um, a lot of blood, a lot of blood splattering. So go ahead. You're that was, that was, that was, Oh, I think it was Dan Rosen's heart who got uh, pulled out. I, I wrote that, but it was Dan Rosen, I think, whose heart got pulled out and, and eaten. But I did a bit where, well, so anyway, um, so we have guns on the set, you know, blank. But our line producer was Eric Hexum's boyfriend, had been. Eric Hexum had died previously. He's the one who put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger thinking it would that would just be a goof because it's a blank but right. not knowing that there is actual projectiles that come out and he had killed himself and now she and so she read us the riot act and you know yeah. she was this is dead serious and you can't fuck around and but we didn't have an armorer and i got hurt one time we did a bit where um oh we had a guest on the show last night and he, he was a little bit arrogant and i was i said that i believed uh, in the great, I was playing the guest on the show, and I said, I believe in the great quote by uh, the character actor uh, Edmund Gwynn, who said, uh, Dying is easy, comedy is hard. And Paul goes, What? You really believe that? And I go, Oh, I most certainly do. He goes, You arrogant prick. And he pulls out a gun and he shoots me. <laughs> Edmund Gwynn from The Trouble with Harry, the great Alfred Hitchcock movie. So, so um, he pulls out this gun and he shoots me. And my, even though the way they do these blanks and God knows your, your guest previously knows way more about it, they can make it so that there's more flash. They can make it so that there's more bang. They can make, they, you know, they can change the composition of what they put in it for different reasons. Whatever we had, the comp the composition, he shot me from, I don't know, it had to be about, at least five feet away, my shirt went like boo, 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 boo. And I had, you know, uh, cuts and welts on my belly. Right. And I, but, you know, I was a kid and I was like, you know, hey, it's for comedy. It's all good. It's amazing. One of us didn't die. So, yeah. you know, can I mention uh, something? Because you always because you're about to attack me. I'm not, not attack you, but 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 uh, I have a story to very quickly. And it, it's so. I had done the MTV comedy half hour mm. and Paul Provenza was looking to put comics on comics only. This was like the early to mid nineties. And I give you the tape and you said to me, I remember you were in, do you remember this? No, go ahead. You I've said, heard to, you say something, you said You're to me, ready this, yet or something? you said, this was, first of all, believe it or not, there was a time when MTV loved me. I know this is hard to believe. Oh, and, I, and I had a killer set on the MTV comedy half hour or whatever it was. This was the mid 90s. And you said you looked at the set and you go, all right, I'll, as a friend, I'm going to show it to Paul. <laughs> but I don't think it's particularly good. And what did Paul say when he saw the, the tape? Get me Feldman. I don't know. What did he say? He liked it a lot. I'm sure he did. I. He look, said it was the greatest. He said it was the greatest set. I swear to you, Paul Provenza said that set on MTV is one of the greatest television sets he had ever seen in his life. Hey, I, I, I <laughs> I'm saying that because I gave, I, I gave it to him, didn't I? Yes, you did. But you also said hey. to me, I don't know. Nah, Maybe I was fucking with you. I don't no, know. No, no, no. You you gave me a line by line critique of the, all the inconsistencies in the set. Like you first you say this and then you say why, that. Why do you bother having me on the show? I don't because I love you and I know I'm about to get my ass ripped open. No, you're not. I, I look, I, I, I just had this 
epiphany sort of the other night. I mean, I was listening to your uh, Thank opening. You. Thank you for listening. Opening. Yes, I listen and I listen to your opening uh, bloviation about, um, you know, the 20 year Goldilocks war and, you know, inflation. And and I'm not saying that any of it's wrong, um, but I, I, I mean, I'm, what do we do with this information? I just here's the you know, the old joke that there's two kinds of people in the world, people who divide the world into two kinds of people and people who don't. <laughs> right. And and. And, and I believe you're of the former. You like to divide people into uh, two different um, categories. Yes. And one category is people who believe that war is uh, a permanent state of nature and people who don't. And I think you would try to count yourself in, in the category that doesn't think that. It's a Manichaean view of the world where you break things. A Manichaean is somebody right. who sees yes. this or that. <laughs> P do, which side you are you on, war? boy? You're either with labor or management. Do you believe that war is a permanent state of nature? I believe. Well, go ahead. I could. I don't want to take eat into your time. I think war is a permanent state of nature because I think we're at war right now, and I don't think we're grasping that. I, I you know, because you, you know, you have this conversation about war, and then we have this conversation about the horse race and about, you know, this bill and is this going to get passed? And, and our big enemies seem to be Kristen Cinema and, and Mansion. And in the meantime, I feel like we're ignoring that there is a real war going on and we're not acting that way because how can we not be at war? There, there are people, a lot of people who don't believe that you are a vegan because you don't uh, not because because they think you eat baby's blood. OK, me. <laughs> they think you eat. Yeah, they think, I, I drink it. Jew. I don't eat it. It's not right. chunk. Right. You, oh, because I'm Jewish because you're Jewish. People think you drink babies. So these and look, Marjorie Taylor Greene is certifiably insane. Right. 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 How but there just seems to be this um, conventional wisdom that we all accept that the Republicans are going to take the House back in 2022. Like. That means that there are people voting for, for Marjorie Taylor Greene and and Lauren Boebert and uh, and Paul Gosar, who wants to change the, the the orbit of the moon. Like so, like literally insane people. And there are people who believe this stuff and believe even worse and crazier things. And they're electing our officials like what what happens? I, I know we're, we'll go, oh, well. I mean, are people really paying attention to what's in this bill or are we what happens if the, the House um, goes to the Republicans and they make uh, Donald Trump speaker of the House? And the first thing he does is go, let's um, uh, impeach Biden and uh, Kamala Harris. And what, what, what's and then he's president. He's third in line and they can just appoint him. What happened? Are we at, we're at war? I think we're kind of asleep at the switch. So when you're at war, OK, you have to find the choke point where you try to find that, like, where do we attack? Who is our enemy? You know, we can't attack the people who are voting because they're fellow Americans. I, but why do they believe this stuff? Because of Fox News. And because of Facebook, maybe they're our enemy. Who? Where are we going to go? We got to figure out where to direct our anger. And I'm just saying, you know, the 20 year war and figuring out that the military industrial, that's not our enemy right now. We got a more immediate enemy. I mean, are they the, are they the ones controlling Facebook? Who's who is letting it be? OK, to vote for Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is making it that a regular person could go? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, we got to figure that out. It's propaganda that I know you can't compare things to the Nazis, but we have to compare things to the Nazis. It, it's propaganda. Right. Isn't that what's controlling these people's brains? We have to go after that. Yeah. And I've, I've made it. Uh, I've made it clear who the enemy is. Who? Our next guest. <laughs> Well, I oh, it is time. Hey, I, I'm happy to end it right here. Um, uh, listen, the 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 schedule is a little screwy today, and I owe it 
to my guests to, to stay on. Yes. So I did bring you in on time. But you, uh, yeah, and I yeah. the first half was Roger mostly talking about Roger's book and right. stuff. Which so I didn't get to, line. I didn't get. I'm just doing a. Um, I believe that children are our future. Yeah, I, I think the enemy is the richest one percent. The the one percent of the richest one percent. You can never go wrong in America. Finding yes. out what the most comfortable people in our country want and taking their comfort away. Right. But we got to figure out, like, where where's the ball bearing factory that we got to bomb? I, that's the one percent seems kind of vague to me. I want to know where, what's the target? Who we how are we going to train what we our meager tools? Well, if we you listen to my voices, opening you know, I if you listen to the opening of today's show, I isolate who's to blame for the shooting on the set of Rust. Right. So go back and listen. It's very simple. Okay. Go back and, and the war in Afghanistan and the the this country, I truly believe, I'll give you the last word. I truly believe, and I mean this. That as much as I loathe humanity, I believe the American people are basically good. I think Anne Frank pretty much said that people are basically good. And then she got to see just how good they are. <laughs> but, you know, here's what I, pe people are, are clay. You know, I mean, I think maybe uh, there's 20 percent on one side that are good and 20 percent on the other side that are bad. And then in the middle, you know, you got this 60 percent that could go either way. And it depends on what uh, you do to that clay. And I think there's a lot of activity that is pushing a lot of people to be bad who maybe wouldn't be otherwise. But I agree so with you. I, I don't know how we get in and interrupt that process. But the fact the fact that we're sweating it out. And that 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 people could vote for any because, you know, I know it's mansion and cinema and mansion and cinema. But what about all of these Republicans who are just like they won't even talk about, you know, hold what happened on January 6th. And they're and they're saying insane things like that. It was just a bunch of tourists. I mean, that that's madness. Yeah. I don't so, know if the media, I, I don't know if we have to hammer on the media. The media has to come out and just. Stop playing this both sides -ism and The American people want what's in Build Back Better. When you look at the size of California, like the, the, the California, the, the, the population, it's like the fifth largest. It would be it's bigger than it's like the fifth largest country. When you add up all the a-holes who make up America, they're all in New York. They're all in Illinois, they're all in California. When you add up all the people in America, they are left of center. But there are structural checks that prevent the, the, the American people from moving, lurching as far to the left as we want to go. And that's the problem. There are structural They've implemented an electoral college, which I happen to be right. for, but okay. a Senate, let, let me, gerrymandering. Let me, the, let me have the last word and right. you can get Mark in. It seems like all the talk, all the talk is about the Build Back Better and the infrastructure deal. And we've dropped the whole voting rights thing. And that seems to me to be the more important thing. I, I maybe it's not. Maybe if people get the child, they'll get a three hundred dollar check in the mail. And go, oh, I guess I'm voting for the Democrats. But the fact that they're rigging the system is seems like that's the only way that the Republicans can win. But if they can win in 2022, then it's it's over. It's completely over. Isn't it to be continued? It already okay. is over. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> I mean, this segment. No, well, I, I'm kidding. Johnny Ross, follow this man on Twitter at Fun With Friction. You, you are a brilliant man and 
uh, thank uh, you for your I, time. I, I apologize for uh, 1993 or whatever it was that you say that I, I tried to torpedo your career. No, no, you know, okay. you didn't. You handed him the tape, but you, you. I think I might have thought that you had better sets, like you had other better sets on tape than that one. I don't know. You you highlighted my inconsistencies, and I tried to explain to you my character is inconsistent. Anyway, I love you, John Ross. I love you. And I also love I, this next man. He is the founder and president. Do you know Mark Breslin? Um, we, we've met on this show in this fashion, uh, fly by night, hello, goodbye. Yes. So some someday when we're all traveling again, we'll meet in New York and, and have a dinner, and that would be awesome. Yes. And unfortunately, I have to pay for it. So I'm really rooting for oh, COVID. Yeah. Go COVID. <laughs> go, go. <laughs> Joining us is the president wow. and founder of Yuck Yucks, the largest comedy chain in North America, if not the world. So uh, rumor has it you're Jewish. Oh, I have to unmute you, sir. Who told you that? You, you... I've gone with you yes. to get baby blood. We drink baby blood. Why are we, what, what is this? Thing? Why don't we just come first clean? All, first of all, I only like it on ice. <laughs> I don't know, I find it too thick and too uh, heavy uh, uh -huh. without it. So I, like, I like it diluted, frankly. Uh -huh. um, one of the many things in my life I'm deluded about. <laughs> So, um, and by the, the way, thing, you're a world class when it comes to poisoning wells. Yes, you are a world class well poisoner. Well, I poisoned many, many wells um, in my time, not just actual wells, but the wells of people's beliefs. <laughs> really, the wells really want to poison. I've made it so difficult for people to enjoy their lives over the years <laughs> that I feel I should get some kind of Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> But what I wanted to say before we went any further is I'm, I'm feeling very lucky lately in the last couple of days yeah. because I don't think I ever told you the story. Um, a couple of years ago, I had an audition for a movie and there was only one line and I didn't get it. I didn't get the, I didn't get the part and it was only one line. It was a, a, a film with Alec Baldwin and the line was, yeah. put that gun down. <laughs> And I feel very lucky that I didn't get that part. Uh -huh. And interestingly enough, I auditioned for another movie. Really? Which had the same line almost, <laughs> except it was, Dad, put that gun down. It was the Marvin Gaye story. <laughs> um, and they went with a black cop. I'm not ah, sure that's why. Not fair. But, uh, you know, listen. That's not diversity. fair. Yeah. Diversity. Not fair. So I'm feeling very lucky today, and I'm in a good mood. Thank you. Why are you in a good mood? Because I escaped death. Um, escaping death always makes me uh, feel like I'm in a good mood. I, I think I told you before I was watching this series. I've been watching this series called Mayday. It's a Canadian co-production. And it's 19 years. There's 19 years of this show going. I'd never heard of it before. And it's all about plane crashes. And each show is a different plane crash where they analyze a different plane crash. They recreate the plane crash. They recreate the people in the seats screaming their heads off. They recreate the actual crash. And then the second part of the, the show, they have people. Yeah. You, 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 you to told me about a, a play you once saw. That's right. You know, that's right. It was a fabulous play. It's called Charlie Victor, Charlie Victor Romeo, um, which was actually uh, made into a movie, which I have not seen. And it's in 3d which makes absolutely no sense to me why that movie had to be in 3D, but it's in 3D. It's on some obscure channel, so I haven't seen it. But I saw the play, loved the play, flew the next day. Real white-knuckle <laughs> experience for me, I'll tell you. But anyway, getting back to May Day, I love watching that show, and I watch it every night before I go to sleep. because I'm writing this I'm down, May Day, and it, this is not about labor. May no, Day. it's definitely not about the Maypole either. Right. So um, there's 19 seasons of it. Um, 19 seasons are, or 19 uh, episodes? I know. Uh, uh, there's 10, I think, in each. In so it's season. every plane crash being reenacted. Well, yeah. 
and they just recreate the black box. Yeah, they get the black boxes. They show you. They they marry um, fo- actual footage of the crash and the, the aftermath um, with stage scenes. And sometimes I know the actors in it, and I feel really badly for them because I know they're going to die. <laughs> and while you're watching it, yeah. you know the ending. You well, know how it's going to end. Some of, them, some of them you do, and some of them you don't, because in some of them. They interview survivors, and if you know that they're interviewing the survivors, then you know there was at least some survivors, but it's in the ones where they don't interview the survivors through the show, it's an hour show, um, then you know that all the lives were lost. So you can figure that part out. And do they show pilot error, or is it always just... Sometimes it's pilot error. In one case, it was pilot um, craziness. They went back far enough in the guy's history to realize he downed the plane himself deliberately. The, remember the, I remember there was an Egyptian airline. That's right. And that one, for some reason, they haven't made that one yet. Uh, I remember that, too. Yeah, I think that it was, took place outside of Canada. It was like right around, before 9-11, right? Yeah, I don't remember exactly when it was. I just remember I was in Palm Springs when it happened. And I remember it was in the papers and it was a big, big deal. Um, they haven't done that one yet. But... Um, They've done other ones that are similar, where the pilot went crackers. He locks the co-pilot out of the. Uh, <laughs> he laugh. He, locks, he locks the pilot, the co-pilot out of the out of the cockpit, and the co-pilot's trying to get in. Everybody's trying to get in. No one can get in, and he's like like this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can hit my wife's house, my ex-wife's house. <laughs> Do you remember before 9-11, I know you thought this way, like when you were in a jet and you were like making, like landing at JFK and passing over Wall Street, don't you remember thinking, boy, there's a lot of trust. Like we are, like there are two guys in that cockpit who we are placing a lot of trust in, not just the passengers, the people, like when you see planes flying over the city, you, it's a miracle that it doesn't happen I every day. I, I, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll give you a simpler example, maybe. When you take off from, um, from an airport, uh, the first thing you see is you see all these highways, and mm-hmm. you see them from above, and you see all these cars, and they're all in perfect formation, and there are no crashes. It's astounding to me that there are no crashes. Right. It all somehow works. Right. Until that, it doesn't. That I find astounding. So when you take it to the level of an airplane, yeah, it's even more astounding. There are almost no record of any major crashes happening in cities themselves where there are more casualties on the ground than there are in the uh, in the plane, which is kind of amazing. Yeah. Pilots are taught to, if they have to go down, to go down somewhere, um, you know, where there aren't people. But they're, you, as you just pointed out, they're human beings. And yeah. they and they can snap. Well, they don't snap. Um, people don't snap. They they snap. Sl- they they bend slowly until they are bent out of shape. I think so. Um, whatever happened in that cockpit with that guy didn't happen. Just he didn't just make that random choice that day. He was working on it. Right, he but, was working on it. but it's like suicides. People don't just kill themselves. They contemplate. They they think about it, then they withdraw it, then they think, well, maybe I should do it, then they withdraw it, and finally they decide to do it. But airlines, they F with the pilots. They're constantly overworking pilots and screwing them on their union wages. There there are stories of pilots who are living in in trailers at the airport. This is especially true of smaller airlines. It's probably not so true of, you know, the major airlines, but it's, it's very true of smaller airlines. And yes, some of these, these, you know, you watch enough of these Mayday episodes and you start to see patterns. And one of the patterns is overworked pilots in smaller airlines. And smaller can still be 70 seats. Right. We're not talking about all seaters. We're talking about 70 seaters. And, you know, they had to do five, they had to do five legs that day. Right. They wound up sleeping in the, um, uh, you know, in, in there where they change in the change room, they caught a couple of weeks before they went back up in the air. Right. 
There are here's the good news. Here's the good news after you watch all these all these um, meetings. There are fewer and fewer crashes all the time. And the reason is that uh, they take these crashes so seriously that they study them so carefully and then make mandatory changes in uh, the protocols for the airlines to run. So it gets better. It gets Plus, better cause, because it, it's, gets better. it gets better. It, we, we were doing a show about medical error. Now, yeah. McGill University in your hometown of Canada, I call it a town, says this stat is... No, no, it's all, we've only got 30 million people in yeah. the whole country. The third leading cause of death in America is medical error. Now, McGill says that's not true. So it's the fourth, let's say. And I was talking to somebody who wrote a book about this, and I said, why don't they have a black box in every surgical theater to read? Well, what? not going far enough. you got to put the black box implanted in the person. Mm-hmm. All of us should have black boxes in ourselves that we walk around with that records everything. And then when something goes wrong, we have a complete right. dossier of information. Yeah. I oh, have one. Oh. I just put it on my ass. <laughs> and, and I'm going to tell you something. By the way, that, that and that's that's also Ellen. The, the the black the video camera up your ass. You can watch it every day at three o'clock nationwide. Uh, it's called Ellen. Right, um, right. Of course. Um, no, what I found was um, when you put the black box up your ass, it really should be a black oval. Uh, <laughs> and it's know, not black. black. If it's black, you should see your doctor. It should be brownish. Well, that's- it's, and they're actually red. These black <laughs> boxes are actually red. Like, they're red. They're like an orangey red, which scares me when I took it out. And, and look, well, you know. At least body cams on doctors. I'm sorry, you're breaking up. What? There's nothing like rectal bleeding. I, I can't hear you. There's nothing like rectal bleeding. I think that's a song from South Pacific. Yeah, it comes. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. <laughs> oh, shit in your ass, then. The <laughs> Larry Brown. Will you call Larry Brown for me? First of all, I wouldn't know you if it weren't for Larry Brown. Um. Yeah, that's why I'm not talking to him. Oh, but, but I, uh, I would never have played Vancouver had Larry not played there first and told you to book me and so he's obsessed with plane crashes he can tell you let's do an episode where you look at a he has memorized he knows every plane crash and he can not only i'm not making this up he can tell you if you tell him the flight number he will tell you how many people died that day and the day of the week it's unbelievable but he knows i always loved him and now you've given me even more reason to love it. Call him. And he used to read to me the transcripts of plane crashes. And we would, I shouldn't admit this, but we were obsessed about the pilot's last words. And there's one where the pilot says, you got it all. You got it all. Those were his last words. And so when Larry and I, when we went on the road together, we would end each set by saying, because we always bombed, you got it all, folks. You got it all. Well, you know, the other thing that's funny about May Day is that um, <laughs> one of the pilots swear in this. It's supposed to be recreations, right? But yeah. it's a family, it's sort of a family show. On, on It's on Discovery Network in, in Canada. <laughs> it's good family, uh, so good family right. entertainment. Yeah, well, I, I can hardly wait till Jackson's just a little bit older so we can watch this. Um, and none of them swear as they as they hurtle to their doom. They're all PG. Uh, it's all PG stuff. What would you scream? Oh, fiddlesticks. What? Oh, oh, fiddlesticks! We're going down. <laughs> if you and I were pilot and co-pilot, oh, what a great time we'd have! And we would be playing for the ages. If we knew the plane was going down, we we would have we knew that there would be a permanent record. Yes. What would you scream? So. I'd scream, I need a new agent. <laughs> <laughs> Up 
we're you're you're being this is a moment. This is a clip. Somebody's behind you. Yes. Yeah, this is that moment that we we isolate. Oh, he just walked in. You are so lucky. You are so there's just they're they're just a, that beautiful son of yours just to walk in the oxytocin that's coursing through your veins right now, the hormones that are produced having the young. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm permanently on Machaya juice. <laughs> you yeah. know how great you have it, right? I do, I do know. My, listen, I, told, I think I told you my father had a similar situation. My, I was born, my father was already 53. Um, and he had two children before, but they were from 20, 25 years before. And all of a sudden, he got to live that life again. For me, this is the first time. So yeah. It's a bit different. And I was 58. And right. every year is geometrically more uh, when you reach that age to have a child. Right. So it's not really five years more. It might be five times harder. Now, when, because I, tor- now, I, I torture my children. It's all about annoying them. Uh, I, I, I called my son 10 times on Saturday night telling him I don't have time to talk. And uh, I, I yelled at him for picking up the phone. I said, I don't have time for this. Stop picking up the phone. I don't have time to talk. Have you begun to torture the child yet? No, and I'm unlikely to do so. Why? That's the whole point of having a kid. Nope. Nope. I want to give him the best possible start to his life because I know the rest of it is going to be really hard. <laughs> but what about, but, but you're... Oh, no, David, I don't do that. Teasing. No. What about teasing? I don't tease him. He gets enough teasing already. He's a little kid. He's a short kid. He's a delicate kid. He's a sensitive kid. He's already getting enough teasing. He doesn't need anything from me. You know what I do? Um, this is a bit. Uh, I was thinking about this last night. This is, I was just thinking, you call your kids up at my age and you go, guess who died? We have a tragedy. Guess. Somebody's dead. I'll give you three guesses. <laughs> that would be bad to do that. I yes. just not the worst thing <laughs> just to be that because I, I now when I call my uh, kids the worst thing is to call them up and say it's your mother <laughs> just do that and then hang up like it's a bad connection it, it's your mother <laughs> 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 This is this is how I know I'm this has got really depressing. Last month I called my son, he was at work, and he answered and he went, Is everything okay? And I went, Ah, oh, he got old. He asked if everything's like I can't talk, but is everything okay? Like I thought he's old now. He he is everything okay? I'm sorry? Is he old or or are you old? Yeah, but I mean, they're, they're, I used to call them and they never asked, is everything OK? Like we do at our age. So that it, right. that is, oh, yeah. Listen, every time I meet somebody I haven't seen in a while that's my age, the first thing we do is we compare medications. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing we do. What do you want? Lipitor, uh, metformin, uh, Ativan. Mm, not a bad cocktail. <laughs> I'm all. <laughs> what, what is Ativan? Sorry? What is Ativan? Oh, it's um, it's a relaxant. It's sort of like it's it's the new Valium. See, it's my belief that people are either uh, benzo people or um, uh, uh, um, what do you call it? People, uh, 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 heroin people. What a benzo is? A, is that lift you up? Nope, it's a downer. But they're different kinds of downers. Um, one is one puts you right out. Uh, but benzos are good because you can function. Um, you could take an Ativan during the day. You could do your business. You float from things to things, but they're very addictive, and you have to be very careful with them, like Valium was. 
you know, I was never addicted to any drug except possibly Valium. I love when I was teenager, I loved Valium. Love Ooh, look, what kind of a teenager? That's a housewife drug. What kind of a teenager says, "Hey, let's get together. We'll do some Val. I've got some Valiums. I've got some of these, man." <laughs> I loved Ooh. Valium. I, I loved lo- Valium. I loved it. I, you know, I. <clears throat> not much anymore. It's been replaced by Ativan. Yeah, I haven't taken one. So I, I don't sleep. I've had horrible. I'm not. Uh, I, I got like three hours of sleep last night. I just cannot sleep. So uh, my doctor said, well, I can give you something. And I said, I'm going to try. I don't think it would help. I don't think getting knocked out. I think you go without sleep. There's something. <clears throat> if I'm not sleeping, there's a reason I'm not sleeping. You know, doing this show and listening to everybody's tales of woe and doom. That's why I'm not. I don't think that's it. I think I'm punishing oh. myself, actually. For what? Uh, <clears throat> I that's think there's a part. I think there's a part of me that's pretty happy, and so I'm punishing myself by not sleeping. But I'm sabotaging my life subconsciously by not sleeping because i think you know i realize my life isn't so bad so i'm screwing it up i get eight hours every night but it takes me 12 or 13 hours to get them how do you do that well i'm constantly waking up in the middle of the night oh getting up falling asleep so i don't get eight hours in a row but i do get my eight hours but it takes me 12 to get them so you wake up in the middle of the night and what do you do I go downstairs, I make myself something to eat, I watch some TV, um, and then I fall asleep watching TV, then I wake up, then I go back upstairs. It's just, it's just a constant constant motion of, of sleep, non-sleep. But you know, what was, you know, Jer- remember Jersey Kosinski? Yeah. The novel- Bing, Bing he there. Had- he wrote Bing there. Yeah. He had... Um, an, and he an wasn't from Jersey, movie. by the way. He was from Poland. Sorry? He wasn't he was from, from Jersey. He was from Poland. That's right. And he didn't wear a jersey either. <laughs> which is it. But, but because he was from Poland, he thought he was from Jersey, and that's why he called himself Jersey. Right. Did you ever see the painted the movie of the painted bird? Roman what is that the Roman Polanski? No, no. I don't know who made it. It's um, a foreign filmmaker, um, I think Hungarian. It came out about three years ago. It is devastating to watch. It is in black and white, three hours, and um, it is so gruesome and grim. You'll love it. What's the Peter Coyote movie where he's crippled Roman Plant? Bitter Moon. Is it Bitter Moon? That's right, Bitter Moon. And is that based on a Jersey Kaczynski novel? I think so. What um, a great movie. What a great movie. We got I'm greedy, sorry. baby. We got <laughs> we got too greedy. Ba- Go ahead. I'm sorry. The mask is, is, is great. Sorry, um, we were talking about Kaczynski. So Kaczynski had this protocol where he would sleep four hours during the day and four hours at night. Hmm. Because he didn't want to miss anything which he claimed was day culture, and he didn't want to miss anything which he claimed was night culture. Hmm. Um, but he got to do both by teaching himself how to split it, how to split up his eight hours. However, I do have a bit of a Jersey Kaczynski story for you. So Kaczynski goes and does a talk show, a daytime talk show in Toronto. And a friend of mine was the uh, talent coordinator. But she was also a person who loved literature. So this was a big deal for her to meet Jersey Kaczynski. So at the, after the show, she, she says to him, would you like to do something? Uh, and it's in the middle of the day. He says, yes, I would like to go. Uh, do you have a place where you can buy a live chicken? <laughs> He says, well, actually, yes, there's a Jewish market called Kensington Market. We could go down there now and we could get a chicken. I'm not sure why you want it, but can we just go get the chicken? Yeah, okay. So they get in a cab. They go down to Kensington Market, which is in the middle of the city, and he picks out a chicken. They box up the chicken for him, and he takes it back to the hotel. And she said, what are you going to do with the chicken? Are they going to make the chicken for you at the hotel? He goes, no, I'm going to... Fuck the chicken and choke it. 
because when it dies, it ha- you get an amazing, uh, you get an amazing feeling, uh, spasms inside the colon of the chicken. Really? And she said, okay, have a nice time. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> wow. She's the talent coordinator for Tom Waits. Um, she asked the same question. What would you like to do, Tom? He went, I'd like to go meet Spike. I want to meet Spike. And she goes, okay, who's Spike? He goes, not who, what? Spike, you know, Spike. Spike. <laughs> Great job. Yeah, I would have loved to, but he died too soon. Who? Tom Jer- Waits? Uh, no, Jersey Kaczynski. Yeah. He did. Yeah. Well, he himself, right? um, I don't think he killed himself. No. Yeah, I think he killed himself. I don't think so. Okay, we'll find that we'll out. We'll find that out. Uh, put it in chat like in a second, probably. Okay. We have to wrap it up. Mark Breslin, so great to have you back, is the president and founder of Yuck Yucks, the largest comedy chain in North America. Thank you. We'll talk to you next week, I hope. Sounds good. Thank you. You're listening okay. to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Howie Klein is with us. You're there, right? Right. I have to I, I have to play a song because I have to find my jack to plug you in. I apologize. So it's a it's a great opportunity to play some music from Professor Mike Steinel. Always a great opportunity. And then when we come back, we will be joined by the founder and treasurer of the Blue America, the Blue America, the Blue America Pack. And he writes down with tyranny. We'll be back right after this. I'm on my way to be a billionaire now you can make fun of me but i don't really care i have a plan to get there by and by as long as i stay healthy and i never die 15 bucks an hour five days a week 52 weeks a year and 32,000 years I know it's a long time honey to 34,020 but when I get there babe I'm gonna be in the money I'm on my way to be a billionaire now you can make fun of me but I don't really care I have a plan to get there by and by as long as I stay healthy and I never die all I really need is a second job or a third lift myself up my boots and join that elite herd of the 600 billionaires in the USA who make more in a second than I do in a day I'm on my way I'm on my way to be a billionaire. Now you can make fun of me, but I don't really care. I have a plan to get there. Yes, I do, by and by. As long as I stay healthy and I never die. As long as I stay healthy and I never die. As long as I stay healthy and I never die. Thank you so much, Professor Mike Steinel. And I found the Jack. Howie, are you there? Howie Klein, are you there? I'm here, and I think you should have played um, the ACDC song for Jack while you were looking for the Jack. 
That's true. That's true. You have no idea how close. Don't don't ask me who, but a, a, a guy who is already in a high position and is running for the Senate is obsessed with ACDC. And when he found out that I went to one of their first shows in 1977 that they, that they played in America, uh, he keeps asking me about the show. I keep telling him stuff about it that, that I can remember. And he, he all last week, he kept sending me very, very rare tapes from that show that I was in in San Francisco. <laughs> uh, and so, and one of the, the best song by far uh, of that show was The Jack. Now, I have a friend named Alan Chapman who hosts classical music in Los Angeles, and he uh, teaches musical theory. He knows everything you can possibly know about music. And he, uh, I think it's, I can't remember the L.A. station that he's on, and we're close friends. And he says to me, you don't like ACDC? And I said, I'm, just, I, I'm embarrassed to say that I've, it was too loud. I don't listen to it. He said, you don't know anything about music if you don't enjoy ACDC. And you, so you're, you're a fan, and I think I know who you're talking about, who's also a fan. What am I, like, what do I, give me the essentials on ACDC, because... Okay, first of all, we're talking about 1977. So in 1977, um, punk rock and new wave were still being defined, and, and there wasn't a clear, it wasn't clear yet who was in and who was out. And ACDC were uh, basically an unknown, loud rock band from Australia, and... They were on their first tour, which was a club tour. They were then they played punk venues. They were considered a, a, a punk band. It didn't last long and didn't go beyond the first uh, the first tour. But I'll give you an example of why they were considered punk. Aside from the music itself being you know loud and fairly simple. Um, so here we are. We're all backstage. Uh, at the old Waldorf, I think it might have had a different name then. And the backstage area was gigantic. It was just a huge room. This is San Francisco and, where the punchline used to be. Right, that's yeah. right. That's where the punchline was. Yeah. In fact, I think the backstage was the punchline. Right, right. So, uh, so, so you could do various, people could be doing lots of different things in the backstage without interfering with each other or even being noticed by each other. But uh, Bon Scott, who was then in the band, he isn't any longer, obviously, uh, went into, into the men's room or the ladies' room, whatever it was, with, with a young lady, uh, a groupie. And I, I don't know what the deal was, but he wasn't supposed to, uh, you know, exchange bodily fluids with her. And, uh, but he did, and she uh, bit his uh, penis. Mm. And he started screaming, and, and it was a problem for him because in those days he used to ride around on the shoulders of one of the other band members during the show. <laughs> and he couldn't do that because of his sore, uh, his sore genitals. Mm. In any case, people thought that was pretty punk. Wow. So what are the songs, if you had to recommend Jack, what are some songs? Listen to the Jack. I mean, that whole first album is pretty good. It, it, it's it, it's a, a decent album. I And, and you know, People who like ACDC love other other songs on other albums. I kind of, you know, got over them after the first album. In those days, you know, people were thinking, well, maybe Cheap Trick is going to be part of the alternative record uh, music scene. Uh, Tom Petty was also, you know, Tom Petty was was a kid from from uh, Gainesville, Florida, and he came out uh, with his band, and they were, you know, they were just like the punk bands, and they were. They were going around and playing the same clubs. In fact, um, if I remember correctly, either he opened for Blondie or Blondie opened for him, but they were playing the punk clubs. They weren't in big stadiums and they weren't big corporate rock bands at the time. Um, again, it's Tom Petty's first album. Now, Tom Petty has had many pretty awesome songs uh, as time went on, but um, that first album you can definitely pass. For, for for a punk record or 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 not a punk record but a new wave record can alternative it, record. if a song is great can it what song the jack no no just a song 
in general. Yeah. Can a song become a hit by virtue only of its greatness? It can. It doesn't mean it. It it it, it doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen. Can somebody write. In other words, you ran reprise and War, you Warner Brothers, and you worked with all my favorites. Can somebody write? a fantastic song and record it and will and without anybody pushing it can it be discovered not without anybody pushing it and someone has to push it on some level or or you know and, and that and that can be someone well it doesn't happen anymore but in the old days that could be some someone going up to a DJ an influential DJ in, in in an influential station, particularly in New York or Cleveland, where this kind of thing would happen all the time, and and just giving the DJ fifty bucks or, or twenty bucks and saying, "Can you play this?" And then if if the DJ would then get good feedback, the DJ might play it again, or he might say, "Hey, give me some more money, I'll play it more." Now, on the other hand, if the DJ got bad feedback and no one liked it, he he wouldn't play it again, no matter if he got paid off or not. But that, that's in the old days. That doesn't happen anymore. Now it's much more systematic. Now it's People drugs get the money and women. Are, uh, are organ- big organizations. It's not, it doesn't go to DJs anymore. It's, they don't get to pick the music that they play. It's still, it's even more corrupt than it used to be. But it's, it's on a different level of corruption. How it's is it more corrupt? How is it more corrupt? It's institutional corruption. And what is that? Um, you know, I, I don't want to talk too much about this because I don't want to get called into, uh, you know, a, a trial, uh, you know, as someone who has personal uh, experience in this. So, it, so it's a little. But nobody's, for me. you know, nobody I mean, listens to this show. How yeah, nobody you? listens. It was, you know, it's funny because <laughs> the, um, you know, the case of, of Bobby Durst who killed Susan Berman. Yes. Yeah, Your friend. He's, he's in jail. Well, he's, he's on a ventilator now uh, with COVID, but, right. but Susan was a very close friend of mine at, at, at one point in her life. And Lorraine Newman's. Of, and Lorraine Newman's. Well, right. But I, I didn't really know Lorraine. I knew that she was close with, with Susan. Right. But um, Susan and was very close with Bobby Durst. And I met Bobby through Susan, as a matter of fact, and, and didn't like him and didn't, do, didn't hang out with him or anything. But Susan told me the original crime, which was Bobby killing his wife. Everything led, everything um, sprouts from that. And, and, and she, she knew it. Now, Susan was a, a very, very rich woman when I knew her. Her parents had been in the mafia. And when they were killed, they left her a lot of money. And uh, she had a mansion in, in Pacific Heights. And she had a, you know, a, a, an incredible apartment on Sutton Place in New York. And she was very rich and she was very generous. And, and I was very, very poor. I, I, you know, it was literally, and that was a time in my life when I, I couldn't always even eat. I had so no money. Uh, and she was really generous to me. She bought me clothing, uh, et cetera. But she told me the whole story about what happened um, uh, w- between her and Bobby and, and Bobby's uh, wife that he killed. And, and that would never came out. That was, that was never, you know, Bobby killed the wife and, the, and, and he just got charged with it for the first time last week while he's like dying of, 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 of COVID. So anyway, now he was convicted of, of killing Susan, but, but later in life, Susan, um, you know, was, was hoodwinked out of all of her money. She wound up with nothing. So she went from being really, really rich to having nothing. And, you know, sometimes to some of her old friends would give her money or I used to take her grocery shopping. Sometimes she would always say, can you get me some coffee? <laughs> Meaning like a bag of coffee, which was always like a signal that she needed to go to the grocery store. And I would take her to the grocery store or, she, or if she needed some kind of, um, you know, I remember she needed dental care. Uh, there were a few people who would help her out. None of us felt like she was blackmailing us in any way, shape or form. She was just asking for help and we helped her, an old friend. Right. right. Bobby, on the other hand, who, who gave her much more money than, than any of us did, he did feel like he was getting um, uh, blackmailed uh, after a while. He gave her, he would give her $25,000 checks. But, and she, but she, she knew the him. truth about his murder. He was, didn't know, only know the truth, she was part of the truth. 
she she didn't she didn't mur- she didn't she wasn't part of the truth in terms of the murder. She was part of the truth in terms of the cover up. So I wrote about this on my blog, thinking, oh no one's gonna no one's gonna notice this. And then it, and then while I was getting um, uh, cancer treatment, ABC T- ABC News did a, an Alexis Nexus search and they found my blog. And they insisted on that what they insisted on was coming to the hospital while I was getting medicine dripped into me. <laughs> well, wow. I mean, and, and you know, and of course I said no, and my doctor said no, and it was, and I never, I did, never did meet with them. And the reason, well, at least one of the reasons I didn't want to meet with them is I didn't want to go, to, I didn't want to be a witness in a trial where, uh, you know, of a, of a murderer who has a history of getting off from his murders. Right. I mean, he, he, he killed someone else and cut his head off. And, and the jury didn't find him guilty, even though he was clearly guilty. The, 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 uh, the, the, the defense attorney said this guy was a really bad guy. Didn't he deserve uh, what he got? And the, and the Texas jury thought about it and they said, yeah, he did. <laughs> he deserved it. So they, they found uh, Bobby guilty. This, I was mean, not Ga- guilty. this was in Galveston, right? That's right. Yeah. That was in Galveston. Look and at- he killed as well uh you know so i i was not interested in uh in, in in testifying against him and there was there were three people that susan told the whole thing to and one of the other ones did agree to testify so i didn't know anything more than what he was going to give them i had no you know I, I had no knowledge that was different from what he had she she told both of us and 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 someone else right i would say that's why i don't like talking about things where right you know you you could be you get yourself in jeopardy, and certainly anything about the way the uh, the music business. You know, I, I mean, I've seen. I saw a picture that really haunted me of a DJ. I think in Miami, I think uh, who talked about it to the to the media, and wound up with two broken arms and two broken legs. And there was a picture of him in traction in the hospital room, and I've never forgotten that picture. Right, right. So a song doesn't. Yes, you pay. You pay. You pay. For, you pay to get to get it on, but you can't pay for something that no one likes. You, in other words, but every song, whether it's if, whether it's Michael Jackson or Madonna or whoever or Beyonce, they all get paid for. But if, if someone has a stiff. And no one's going to like it. They can get they they pay they try to pay, but and they do pay, but it doesn't it doesn't become a hit. There's there's a uh, a story. I, I'm gonna I want to tie this into Alec Baldwin in in, in a roundabout way. There's, also a friend of mine. You know, we serve on a board together. I shouldn't say a friend, but an acquaintance. Right. The there was a a TV show, and I won't tell you. Let's just say it was either in New York or L.A. And there was a, a production manager. No, it wasn't one of those Chicago shows that all come on, in, on the same right. night. It wasn't Cups. Wasn't uh, remember Cup? He used to be out of uh, Herb Cups in it, uh, oh. or, or play uh, uh, Hef's show out of Chicago. Anyway, there was a production manager, and the sets had to be loaded in, and then taken out, and he had to be given cash to bribe the mafia so that they could load and unload the set every week. And this guy said, just give me some cash and I'll pay off who needs to be paid off. Well, he was insufferable. And after a couple of years, they had to fire him. And the concern was, well, who's going to pay off the mafia? And the executive producer said, well, we'll just see what happens. You know, I'll do it. And (laughs) And you know how this ends, right? No, well, I can imagine, but I don't know. There was no mafia. He was just saying. He was just taking the money. He was taking himself. the money and he was saying, I can make sure that the mafia doesn't uh, get us. So everybody in any business. Well, in the music business, by the way, there is the mafia. So Right. <laughs> uh, which we won't it. talk about. But all of every adult who has to earn a living, no matter what, where you're working. You could be working in a deli, you could be a cab driver, a school teacher. We all 
are insulated and are given plausible deniability. We know that something dirty has to be done to keep this thing afloat. But as you know, don't don't tell me about it. And so this guy knew that everybody wanted insulation and they didn't want to know. So he just took cash. It was kind of brilliant. He just took cash from people who wanted plausible deniability about something that wasn't happening. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's kind of brilliant. But we all do that as adults. We know that there's some we, we know we should speak up. But we don't. What do, do you mean it. we all do that? We 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 don't all do that. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We Any, do? Anybody who has a job and is earning a paycheck, if you're a delivery man or woman, uh, if you're, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, if you're working at McDonald's, all the way up to running McDonald's, where the CEO was carrying on illicit affairs and hiding it and had to step down. You're turning a blind eye to some thing. Oh, illegal. turning a blind eye. I thought you meant so everyone is taking money. No, no, no. But we're, not but, but we're all guilty of the sin of omission by not speaking up. Many people are. I don't know about all. I think all of us are. I think in some to some degree or another, all of us. Not everybody has the opportunity to speak up. I mean, they, they, in other words, they're not they're not necessarily witnessing uh, criminal activities. Well, anybody who listens to this show should, <laughs> is not speaking up. <laughs> and compl- no. uh, and, and that's kind of like ties it into Alec Baldwin. I came down pretty hard on him earlier in the show for, you know, he didn't speak up. He knew that. Iatsi, the, the crew walked off the set. He should have walked off the set. He knew it was an unsafe work condition. He didn't say anything. He knew that it should be an armorer, not an assistant director, handing him a gun. But he, you know, had enough plausible deniability that he, and it, we all do it, you know. I can't cancel my Amazon Prime, that that kind of stuff. Anyway. I don't get that. I can't cancel my Amazon Prime. What's that about? Uh, I don't use Amazon, but I have Amazon Prime, and they keep renewing it. And so I haven't called them up and canceled it. And I go, all right, I, I don't use Amazon, but as long as I have Amazon Prime, I will stream this episode of what you know that kind of stuff you don't uh you don't use amazon anymore because uh they're putting uh, small businesses out of, out of business basically is that is that what it is and their uh, and their official policy uh christian smalls is union, on they're anti-union also right officially anti-union there was a piece in the new york times last week my friend christian smalls is organizing the uh We've had him on the show. He's organizing out by G- JFK, trying to form a union. And their Amazon's official policy is we do not support unions. That's the official policy of the second largest employer in America, Amazon. They are anti-union. Now, how do you support right. a company that it, that is pretty is pretty, you know Hitler in Mein Kampf told you. What he wanted to do. All you had to do was read Mein Kampf. Jeff Bezos. He's anti-union. It's pretty. He's been pretty clear about that. He's not a liar. He's anti-union. Right. Well, well most people in his position are anti-union. And do you boycott all of them? Uh, most people have the decency to lie and pay lip service to unions, like Joe Biden. You know. Yeah, but the, but think of the car companies uh, that are anti-union. Would you would would that prevent you from buying one of their cars? I mean, maybe it would. But uh, I'm asking. Uh, car company, the, the United Auto Workers, is an actual union that 
th- yeah. that, that they negotiate with. Amazon doesn't have. But no, 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 not 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 the uh, the Japanese companies that have come over and set up shop in anti-union states in the South, for example. That's why they. That's why that's they located their factories in states like Tennessee and uh, South Carolina and Alabama. Those are anti-union states, and they set up factories there so they don't have to have a union. Germany set up a Volkswagen in either Kentucky or Tennessee and wanted them to go union, and they voted not to go union. I don't know about Japan, but I know that Germany was surprised that <clears throat> that uh, the Volkswagen workers down south didn't want a union. Uh, Amazon doesn't have, in America at least, there are no unions. And mm-hmm. Starbucks in America, no, no unions. And they're trying to unionize in Buffalo, Starbucks, and Starbucks is shutting down those stores for quote unquote remodeling. And yes, I do drink Starbucks and I shouldn't. So there's your answer. In our limited time, we only have four minutes left. Should we we could keep talking about the record industry, which I can't get enough of, but we should probably talk about Virginia, McAuliffe, Obama, New Jersey, which is, what, two weeks away. We have two big elections in Virginia and New Jersey coming up. And there are other scattered elections of some importance around the country as well. But, uh, you know, the one that everyone's going to be watching, of course, is the lesser of two evils election in Virginia. I mean, the idea of, of supporting uh, McAuliffe is is literally gut wrenching for me. Not that I will support him or would, and I, if I lived there, I wouldn't vote for him. But he is clearly a lesser of two evils, and uh, which ma- makes him evil. And the other guy, Youngkin, is much worse. Right. So, and this is why we have you know everyone is rend- uh, you know rending their clothes and pulling their hair out of their heads now because of Kirsten Cinema. But that's what she was. She was supposed to, supposedly the lesser evil. Well, look what the lesser evil is doing to America now. Look what the lesser evil is doing to climate change now. Look what the lesser evil is. I, I mean, you can call her the lesser evil all you want, but, you know, Joe Biden accidentally called her the devil, and he was right. She is the devil. It takes one to know one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, don't think he meant the devil. You, you were the first he, one. He just, it's just an old phrase he used, like, she's smart as a devil. Did you ever hear that phrase? Uh, not, maybe, maybe. I don't think I did. I never heard anyone use that, but it is an old phrase, smart right. as a devil. I think people usually say smart as a whip. Do, in our limited time, I have a general uh, theory that Unless you're thoroughly compromised as a human being, you can't succeed in America. Like Joe Biden is a thoroughly compromised human being. Top to bottom compromised. Plagiar- like his plagiarism it w- was horrific the, in law school and Neil Kinnock, his voting record and what he's done with the credit company, credit card companies in Delaware, his son. You you cannot succeed unless you're an, a thoroughly compromised person, that there has to be this transactional information that the power elite has on you so they can control you. And if you're if you're pure, they won't play ball with you because they can't control you. You have to be confident. Did you uh, vote for him? Biden? Yeah. Yes, but I'm thoroughly compromised. Yes, I did. Okay. You didn't. You didn't. I know. No, I didn't. Of course not. But isn't that true that anybody who rises into the upper echelons of the corridors of power in any, in politics, in, you know, you have to be a compromise. There has to be compromise on you. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe. There, there are always um, uh, there are always exceptions. I was just sitting and writing about uh, 
Morgan Harper, the, the woman who is the uh, Democratic, the progressive Democrat who's running for Senate in Ohio. And the Democrat that Biden, I'm sorry, that um, the Democratic establishment wants, that Schumer has picked the same way he picked Kirsten Cinema, is a guy named Tim Ryan who doesn't stand for anything at all. He's just a wishy washy nothing. And, uh, and she wants to, she wants to, um, have a debate. He won't do any debates. She challenged him to six forums in every different part of the state. One a month, she refuses. He refuses. She then finds out that the Ohio Democratic Party has started a joint fundraising committee with him, which what that means is that he can now take, I think it's $15,000 from any donor who wants to give him big money. Uh, and where she, she can't, I mean, she, she can only, her maximum is $5,800. And, and they, and this is, you know, he, he's not the candidate. He's one of two candidates, but yet they're doing this for him, but not for her. Is that part of the compromise you're talking about? The answer is yes, it's part right. of the compromise. Right. right. I always think, you know, Biden, uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying Biden, I don't mean it, uh, it Schumer will stick us again or try at least, and probably succeed at sticking us again with another Kirsten Cinema, because people don't want to wake up to it and don't want to do anything about it, and they just let it. They just let it slide. Is it fair to say, if it weren't Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, it would be somebody else in the Democratic Party in the Senate, Tester, yeah, maybe some, somebody? I mean, there were definitely, there are other, you know, very, very conservative Democrats who are very happy that Cinema and Manchin are taking the positions that they are. And whether they would have the guts to do it themselves, you know, would, for example, I mean, the most likely people would be Mark uh, Warner of Virginia mm-hmm. or uh, what's her name? I uh, uh, can't think of her name. Uh, uh, Hassan, uh, Maggie Hassan in uh, New, New Hampshire. Hampshire. Yeah. They, they're the same exact uh, piles of shit, sorry, uh, the same kind of garbage that uh, Cinema and, um, and uh, Manchin are, but they don't have to say it out loud and jeopardize their elections because Cinema and Manchin are saying it. So they can just sit back and be happy that, that those two are blocking everything that, that, that they would probably block themselves if they had the guts to block them. And so... We have to wrap it up. We've covered what's in, or we want to be in, Build Back Better. We're coming to the the, the finish line here. Nancy Pelosi said there'll be a vote in a couple, couple of days. What are well, we, I doubt it. Well, what are we looking at in terms of- a There's bid? not gonna be a vote in a couple of days. They're not gonna be ready yet. Um, you know they're getting they're getting there, but it's no longer build back better. It's now you know build back less than better or build back worse or so <laughs> whatever. But forget about build back better. They, they've taken uh, they've taken so much out of it that it, it doesn't count anymore. They've they've just removed whatever they can remove, and they're still removing good stuff, and they're not leaving much. I mean, remember, this is a bill that started at six billion dollars. Uh, sorry, six trillion dollars. And even when it was at six trillion, a lot of people were saying it's way too little. And and, and now it's going to be. Now what is it? It's less than two trillion. How do you go from six to two, and 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 be able to you know say, hey, we got something really great for you? And finally, I'm getting messages from the Democrats to donate money. They're saying, we're coming up on the most important election of your lifetime, the 2020. Which one is that? Huh? Which one? The, the midterms. Are the oh, most- the midterms. I thought you were going to say the Virginia gubernatorial election. Right. Uh, the Democrats lose the House. They lose the Senate. Uh, I'm being told that's the end of democracy. Your thoughts. Is, that, is it the end? Or have we already gotten there? I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I was thinking about this when I was meditating this morning. What is the hell is democracy if they can wind up electing Republicans to take over? What the hell is democracy if, if people vote for Donald Trump? I mean, 
it, 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 does America deserve democracy if 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 people vote for Donald Trump? And, and I don't want to say if most people vote for Donald Trump because of course most people didn't vote for Trump, Donald right. Trump. Most people didn't vote. Right. So do we deserve a democracy? Can, can we? I mean, one of the founding fathers said, "Here's your democracy if you can keep it." Right. And apparently, uh, we can't. Right. Howie Klein, founder, treasurer, Blue America Pack, read them every day over down with tyranny. Thank you. We'll talk Thanks, to you next please. week. I hope. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you. Great. Bye. Bye. Let us now go to Humboldt County where David Cobb is standing by. He was a candidate for president, ran on the Green Party ticket. He ran Ralph Nader's presidential campaign in Texas in 2000. So did Kirsten Cinema in Arizona. Did you welcome David Cobb? Good David. Welcome. Did you know Kirsten Cinema back then? Let me unmute you. Let me you have to unmute. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, the, to, to be clear, I managed uh, Ralph's entire campaign for the state of Texas. Right. And then I managed uh, Jill Stein and Ajama Baraka's campaign as the campaign manager in 2016. Cinema's Green Party bona fides are weak, like she was a member of the Green Party for a hot second. Uh, you know, so like to be clear, she left the Green Party for a reason. Right. Right. Uh, uh, I also think that uh, I, I had the privilege of uh, hearing the, the tail end of uh, Howie's comments. And so it's so rich. Uh, I, I want to point out that the word democracy comes from the Attic Greek. And so here's a pop quiz for you, uh, David Feldman, uh, and anybody listening to this program. Demos means? I don't, people? The people. Kratia, K-R-A-T-I-A, and added Greek. That word, do you know what that means? Kratia? Kratia. Kratia. Uh, You're going to make a crotch joke. I'm going to stop you before you do it. I saw it in your face. No. You're about to go there. No. No. No? All right. Uh, Kratia. Kr- 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 I don't know. All right. It means power or rule. Right. Mm -hmm. So literally the word democracy means the people have the power or the people rule. So pop quiz to all of you listening, whether you're listening live or uh, after the fact, for a moment, ask yourself, do you really believe that the people are ruling in the United States of America? That what you're hearing is the groans and guffaws from the millions of listeners across this country. We, the people, have never ruled in this country. So how we climb, yes, we, the people, absolutely deserve democracy. We've never had it. And our struggle is to actually make it real. From the founding of this country, you had about 10% of the people actually who had the, the, uh, the ability to even claim constitutional rights or to vote. Only rich, white landowning men were actually considered people under the very definition itself. So the problem is not democracy. The problem is we've never had it. I'm going to go one step further and say the most dangerous threat to democracy in the United States of America is the mistaken belief that we have one now or we've ever had it, right? And you know, David, I, I come on this program every week and I talk about the importance of engaging in electoral politics without becoming an electoral fetishist. The mistake that too many b- make is the belief that the voting a- a- and the opportunity to vote once every two or four years is the sum total of democracy. Like, so I just really want to say we have to be clear that if we want the people to rule, it is literally going to take restructuring the social, political, and economic institutions in which we live because we have a political economy known as, demo- as capitalism that actually only allows the rich, uh, the rich who control the instruments and the mechanisms to make the decisions. And we have a legal system that protects property rights instead of human rights and can't even begin to fathom the idea of the rights of a community or the rights of Mother Earth. I agree with you 100%. 
And once we know that we're dealing with reality, it, it is you're, you're absolutely right. The let's talk about what's behind you, because we touched on it last week. I you, you say there's four pieces to the puzzle and the puzzle is power to the people. The, the four- so the puzzle that is, for those of you who are not watching and listening, so the the uh, David Feldman is reflecting on what is behind me, which is an interlocking jigsaw puzzle that has patriarchy, imperialism, capitalism, and white supremacy. And the reason that that is an interlocking inter interconnected jigsaw puzzle piece is that is my best effort to describe reality a power over competitive dominator mindset that is part of our culture it is part of our political economy it is part of the legal system and so that is what we i am struggling against and i am trying to create a genuine decolonized solidarity economy that understands power with instead of power over that that incorporates and incentivizes collaboration and has ecological sustainability at its core that's why i'm a peaceful revolutionary uh, it's also why i of course i engage in electoral politics but i do not uh i do not uh fetishize electoral politics I know that we have to build uh, the the movement from the bottom up and to meet people's needs and to meet people where they live, work, play, and pray and build a narrative that says it's possible to create this new world. Right. I, I wish you made a refrigerator magnet that I could stare at every morning as I'm making my coffee to start my day and see imperialism, capitalism, white supremacy, and patriarchy, those, well, there you go. What, now, what are you showing me there? Now, what I'm showing you is instead of, here, let me do it right here, instead of just those two, what I would do is make you a magnet. This is on the Cooperation Humboldt website that shows what the existence of what it is, right? And then I would say, but look, David, that's what we're going for. Right. I would. Inspire OK, so let's people. do that. Let's let's treat it like a coin. What is on the flip side of patriarchy? Inclusive gender equity. What does that mean? It means that instead of power and it's it, it, it means that it's not just male and female, that gender is actually a wide spectrum. Right. And it's mm -hmm. not just sexual orientation, but it is actually an understanding of power that heteropatriarchy uh, is the idea, not just of male domination, but of dominator culture itself. And so what we're striving for is to create a process by which we're sharing power with one another. And David, this is the problem. We're not ever taught that in this society. Like we're only taught about power that you either have it and exercise it over others or somebody else has power over you and you have to succumb to it. I'm inviting folks into a genuine thought experiment that says, what would it be like if we shared power together? I'm not scared of power. I want to exercise it properly. And what I'll say is this. That is not just a fantasy to be wished for. I make the argument that this is our birthright, that when human beings were living wherever your ancestors were indigenous, I know mine come from Scotland and Ireland, uh, almost like before the power over worldview became dominant. Uh, there's a great book called The Chalice and the Blade by Rianne Eisler that I, makes the compelling argument that this is how humans have lived and were able to survive as a species for about 90% of our existence as homo sapiens sapiens, right? In a, in a, uh, a process more or less where we, were, where we were collectively collaborating together within our small groups. I think it's not only possible, I think it's necessary that we retrain ourselves into a culture of gender inclusive equity and power with dynamics. All right, so we live 
in a culture that's brainwashed us into believing life is a zero sum game. I, I give up something, that means I lose something. Explain to men who are in power, does this mean giving up power? Because that's how, if you talk to most white men, and by the way, white women, I was reading last night, white men, white women, more white men and white women voted for Hillary, uh, for Trump than Hillary. White men, white women in America voted for Trump, not Biden. So what? what's that about? Well, white people, and this gets down to white supremacy and not the patriarchy, white supremacy, we are brainwashed into believing that if there's affirmative action, a pluralistic society, white people lose something. And, so, and to be fair, it, it sometimes the 1% uses inclusivity as a cudgel to split us apart. The one playbook that the ruling elite, the one, the one constant play that they have is divide and conquer, right? And, and it works. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it, it's not even the one percent. Let's be clear, y'all. It's really the point zero zero one percent. that right. are actually running every damn thing. Right. And they have really done a very effective job. So I'm going to actually take your uh, your challenge head on, David, and say this. There is a great essay by Bell Hooks called Understanding Patriarchy. And it starts by saying patriarchy hurts everyone most definitely including men. And I think that that is a important sentence because what I now know is that as much power as I may be given in this patriarchal society and the unearned privilege because of my male body, it actually requires something of me. It requires me to lose track of my feminine side. It requires me to have been to, to 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 follow a rule and a role that is actually not my best self. I'm going to go further and tell you white supremacy damages people of my pigment. And for those of you who are not looking at me, I am white. Yes, white supremacy absolutely privileges me uh, in a way that people of color do not experience and I can go into a grocery store and I like the, the long list of ways that white skin privilege is real is absolutely true. And it requires of me that I lose track of my basic humanity. I think Frederick Douglass said this about slaveholders. He did indeed. And he was right. And this is the point, David, like, and I'm getting chills even saying this because as like the, the hard challenge is to help people understand that the privileges that are given to us, regardless of what they are, that the, 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 the otherization is actually negating what we really want. And here's the thing, you know, you know, uh, U.S. citizens are the single most tested group of human beings that have ever lived on planet Earth, David. And you know who's testing us, of course? Why, it's Wall Street America, it's the marketers and the advertisers. They know what we want. And you know what, actually, the data shows what we want, or as my niece has taught me, what we really, really want. You know what we really, really want? What we really, really want is- The Spice connection. Girls. It's a song from the Spice Girls, go ahead. Yes, that's exactly right. I'm glad you got the joke. Uh, but what we really, really want, we want connection. We want, uh, we want status, which means we want people to look up for us. Oh, and by the way, you know what else? We want meaningful, productive work for which we will be respected, admired, and applauded, which is another way of saying we want earned status. Dignity. Here's the other thing. Yeah. We actually want to work. But here's the thing, the right wing lies to us and say we're all lazy and we don't wanna work. No, what we don't want is a job. 
where we're pushed about, bossed about, having somebody extract our labor, tell us what to do. What we want is meaningful, productive work. We also seem, according to all the data, want a fair amount of sex, which I would say is back to the connection, right? Mm -hmm. Like, really, if you strip it down to what we really want, like as the hairless apes that we actually are, it's kind of sweet, right? right? And may there is a special place in hell for the advertisers and the alchemists of our generation, right? Who say, okay, this is what people want. So let's make a 30 second or a 60 second advertising campaign to convince them that to, to feel the way they really want to feel, they've got to buy something. Because consumer buying and purchasing is not actually a part of the equation, right? What we want is connection to other people. What we want could absolutely be happening right now if we were not living in a capitalist political economy. Okay, so and, let me, let's let, let, hang on for what you're saying, something that the older one gets, the more one begins to wrestle and realize that this is the truth, that what we want, what I want, is peace and quiet, connection, love, security. I don't need a billion dollars. I'd be happy with half a billion dollars because I'm spiritual. I only need half a billion. <laughs> so, and if you, I was reading over Jacobin about uh, the Canadian Liberal Party in the 30s, they were building uh, low income housing and the idea of how to create a community to, to share. And that's antithetical to capitalism. If you build, you can't have a real estate market where people pay top dollar for peace and quiet and a view if people love their neighbors. New York City is what it is because we hate each other. You pay as much money as you possibly can to get away from your name. The more money you have, the less humanity you have to deal with. And so when they were building these low income housing projects, in America at least, they were they look exactly like right. You can't tell the difference between low income housing in New York and Rikers Island. Same warehousing of people because they don't want people to live comfortably because then they're not going to want to fill that vacuum with products. You, you can only have consumers if they're unhappy. Go ahead. So it's interesting, like there's a lot there, right? And what I, and hello, Dr. Fraud. It's always a pleasure whenever you come on a bit early. Uh, uh, so uh, with your permission, David, I know that you like to introduce her. I would love to- You introduce her. Three-way conversation. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Harriet Fraud into the conversation. Uh, she is a, uh, a brilliant thinker, an incredibly charming uh, uh, person uh, and uh, the, uh, Host, host of, of a podcast, it's all in your head. Right. It's not in your head. And capitalism right. hits home. It's not just in your head and capitalism hits home. Anyway, I want to be part of this conversation. Thank you. All right. So here's what I would say, David. Like It's a, a, a couple of things. Number one, remember that, like, you know that I'm a, a I love words, right? Uh, so do you know what uh, consume means in its uh, original Latin? I, I would say it's probably related to consume and soup. It is to use up to the point of uh, destruction. Yeah, like a consume, not, like a consume. Like a consume, like so, so good job of thinking through it. So this is one, I, one of the things I always tell people is when you talk about consumer power, remember actually that's what you're talking about. So like I'm far more than a consumer, right? Like I actually... Uh, I'm a husband, uh, I'm a neighbor, I'm a brother, I'm an uncle, uh, I'm a builder, I'm a storyteller, I'm any number of things, right? And, but but to, to, to isolate consumer as if that's the sum total of what I am, it, I find it highly insulting, to be blunt. Like, I am way more than that. 
And so are we collectively. And that's what capitalism tries to do is to put us into the mindset that the only value we have is either what goods or services we are producing or what goods or services we are consuming. I'm not saying that economics is not part of it. Absolutely. I'm saying it's only a small part of it. Dr. Fraud, your your thoughts on the consumer culture. I, I also want to talk about the, the strikes that are it's strike tober. It used to be rock tober, yeah. but uh, we've it changed to strike tober. And I think, look, it's the same thing for the last well since the 1980s when Ronald Reagan crushed the um, flight controllers strike. American labor has had been for a long time, quiescent. People exceeded as corporations impinged on their rights. The eight hour day disappeared. People could be called at home and asked to stay late. The sense that labor is important disappeared. Unions dwindled. And now with the pandemic, when we call workers essential, but then we pay them crap, as if they're not important, then people rebel. And those industries which are the lowest paid and the most overworked, like healthcare, has lost 538,000 people have left healthcare because particularly healthcare aides are terribly paid. They're paid minimum wage and you can't live on minimum wage. And one of the John Deere 10,000 workers who have been out on strike, I think since October, when was it? October 1st or whenever, but for a while, he said, uh, we were deemed essential in 2020, prove it in 2021, (laughs) which is, you know, what people are doing by striking. And actually 30,000 people have left their jobs. They're not all jobless, but of the 9 million that are unemployed, at least half of them decided they're not going to go back into a regular job because even without the kind of dominant socialist press and parties that all our other European Western countries have, it's occurring to workers that we were heroes. We were called heroes. Now they're cheating us. Now they want to start new workers at less. Now they want to cut our our health plans so that we have to pay more. Now we lose our pension. We want to be paid like the heroes you said we were when we were in crowded and disease infested conditions. So that I think even without the kind of vocal labor movement, which we certainly don't have, otherwise we would have had a general strike when Sarah Nelson wanted to when they wanted the federal employees at the airports to work for free. But the, uh, you know, the AFL didn't go along with it. But now, all these groups are organizing even outside of unions, or they're more militant, like the IATSE people and the motion picture people who, the 60,000, who are, um, who were threatening a strike, and at the last minute they had a contract, which the union approved of, but a lot of the rank and file don't. They don't think it gives enough and they're urging the vote no. And, uh, you know, the militant unions are really bringing people out. That's the the nursing union has people, you know, several thousand people at Mercy Hospital. It has 38,000 at Kaiser Permanente. And what they're doing, which wasn't done before, not since the CIO is in um, beginnings, is they're organizing it by industry not just the nurses. It's the nurses plus the custodians plus the clerical staff plus the technical staff. The same thing happened in a much smaller way at Bates College, which just authorized um, a union and a strike because everyone, clerical workers, janitors, technical workers, all are in it together, assistant professors and so on, that they're starting to realize if we bargain just alone as our union, we don't have the power as if we shut down the whole industry. And so I think what there is is a realization 
after being if since 1980 to 2021 that it's occurring to people we are essential and we are cheated and we're not going to be cheated anymore so if we're so important now's your chance to prove it and they're not you know it's a strike they're saying that it's that, that they're spoiled because they got some child care or whatever else. So no, it isn't. They're on strike because labor has been so humiliated and the AFL has been completely passive. And so that people are organizing on their own or pushing the established unions. Right. Kaiser Permanente has strikes all over the place. Not For- only the healthcare workers, but the engineers are on strike. I mean, it's whoa, it's amazing. 4.1 million Americans left the job market in August. I remember Professor Marianne Cummings and I were talking at the beginning of the summer and hoping that what, what we consider to be anecdotal, uh, what we thought were, uh, I'm going to. Hi, Catherine. I'm going to turn your video off. Thank you for joining us. You're, you're, you're joining us at 830. So I think you're joining. Yeah. So I'm going to turn your video off. And, and OK, thank you. Uh, we were talking about um, the, we, we sensed, but there were there, there were no statistics to back this up. What you were just talking about, Dr. Fraud, that the American people the workers have had it. They've realized that work is bullshit, as David Graeber calls it, and that that they don't need work for their self-esteem. They need work to pay their bills. These jobs are not paying their bills, so it's actually costing them money. They lose money on daycare. They lose money on transportation. It's just not worth it. I'll stop buying things. I'll move in with my parents. I'll move in with my friends. I'll move to a, a cheaper city. This is all horseshit. The you know living. We're told you have to live a certain way. I think. I thought anecdotally, people were waking up to this. I sense as what you're saying is absolutely correct. It doesn't matter what the Republicans and the Democrats want. When they say, we've seen in the red states, they cut that extra $300 a week in unemployment benefits before Labor Day, before the summer. It didn't make, nobody went back to work. It didn't, it didn't, they, they try to starve us out in the red states and the red states say, you know what? Keep your $300 extra and unemployment benefits. We're not working for these wages. We just won't but buy your crap. I disagree on something, David. I really don't think they think their work is bullshit. The um, nurses who are on strike are on strike in part for better patient care because they care. Same with right. the home health workers. And if you read the interviews with the John Deere workers, they're saying, they said that we were interchangeable, that this was unskilled labor. Okay, now they have their secretaries in there trying to do what they can. Right. They're crashing factors. They're messing up. We do important work, and we have to be recognized for its importance, not just with crap that we're heroes for working when it's convenient and then cheated. No, we're important and we're essential. And I think what there is in some of these strikes is a pride in making a contribution and a fury that it isn't recognized or compensated. Right. And that's a change. That's a labor awareness, even without a militant labor movement or a unified, powerful socialist movement or a socialist alternative or any big city having a socialist newspaper. I mean, you go to France, there's Humanité, which is the communist newspaper, then there's Le Monde, which is socialist, and then there's several other socialist papers. Germany has socialist papers. This is crazy. Greece, all of them. And even without that, the workers themselves are saying, we're essential? Okay, 
show it like that John Deere worker said. Essential in 2020, prove it, 2021. That, and if you can't prove it and you can't pay us like we're essential, we're not doing it. We also have to teach younger people, they, they have to be in on the game. Yes. that you're told you're essential, they prey on your ego, the, 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 the tallest money. nail is the one that gets hammered first. What, what young people have to understand, there is gaslighting going on at every job because the person you answer to is more concerned about his or her job than the success of the company. They want to keep whatever status, money, and title they have, and they look at the people below them as threats. So they hammer down the people who are good at what they do. They give you just enough encouragement to be competent and great at what you do until you realize you're great at what you do. And then you're gaslit for a couple of days, couple of weeks, couple of months. And you're told, hey, you're not so great at what you do. Calm down. And then once you show humility and that you're not going to ask for more money or a vacation, then your ego, we, you're an essential worker. We need you. I saw this personally at warp speed because I'm a comedy writer. So every 13 weeks, you're going to a different job. And after a while, you begin to say to yourself, why is it one day I'm a comedy genius? And the next day, I'm a moron. And you begin to realize, because the person in charge is trying to control the room. They don't want you to be the star. They don't want you to lay claim to too much of the script. Otherwise, you're gonna want more money. You're gonna want more. And what you're doing, because it's television, anybody can basically do it, is I'll just take this person's ideas now. Because yeah. you're basically not doing any, especially writing television, it's not that mm -hmm. special. You, anybody can do it. So they just control you and they convince you you're a genius until you actually believe you're a genius. And then they tell you you're shit and you turn to drugs, your marriage falls apart. And it's at warp speed in Hollywood. It happens at a slower pace in the rest of corporate America. And also, it, well, it happens at the factory floor because, you know, you learn, a, you really learn to be skilled. If you read the comments from the John Deere factory, people know what they're doing. They're, they're very skilled and they're told that their jobs, that anyone could do their job. So there's no reason not to pay them well. Right. And when they walk off, they realize not. No, that's that's not true. And the same thing is true with the home health aides who are paid terribly, or nurses and nurses assistants. One of the exciting things that's happening at Mercy Hospital where there's a, a strike is the strike is a strike of people together. There's I think 5,000, um, forget the number, but it's way up there. Um, what, 2,000, no, that's 2,000 in Buffalo and uh, 5,000 in Mercy in. in um, Are you working off a payday report? No, I'm working off an artic articles that I've been oh, reading. Do, you, do you know about Mike Elk and payday report, don't you? Yes, and I ought to write it down and remind myself. That's where you I get all, about it. Everybody should go to payday report. He'll, he tracks 1,600 strikes this year. He's better wow. than he's better than our labor department. You bet. Well, a lot of things are better than our labor <laughs> department. But one of the things that's exciting is everybody's organizing together. It's the nurses, it's the nurses' aides, it's the custodians. They're all in the same union. They're all saying no, and they're all striking together. And so it's an identification as workers, not as I am a nurse and I don't relate to anyone else in the hospital below my pay grade. And it's, it's very, very important that these massive strikes include everyone, you know? So isn't and, this what um, ageism is really about? Isn't ageism, isn't the reason 
corporate America wants young people is because they're not on to the game yet, that you get to a certain age and you can you know exactly what the game is and you know yeah. you're being gaslit and they can't gaslight you. Isn't that what ageism is? It's part of it. Look, in the drug industry, you're not hired to sell drugs if you're over 25, because at 25 for males, it occurs to you that you could get killed. If you're younger and you're doing something adventurous, you don't really think about it. You're, you're not talking about the Sackler family. You're talking about a different game. No, I'm talking about street drugs, you know, people who sell you heroin or um, other or fentanyl. Or a less whatever. dangerous group of people than the Sackler family. Right. Well, they kiss, kill fewer people. 600,000 right. are on the Sackler's murderers, murder right. list for obviously content. But that, um, you know, that there is a sense that when you have older people, they do understand what's going on a lot better. Also, they want people who won't get a pension, who won't have sick days. And they don't care if they're less skilled. It's right. the idea as a worker is a worker and they're in, they're just interchangeable. Right. So we're, we're also, when we're, younger. when we're younger, we're looking for self-esteem. We're looking for a series of resume builders and experiences that we can call upon, not just to get our next job, but to get internal strength from. Like this job mm. made me stronger. The, and one of the, and and you're scared. You don't have money, and you don't mm -hmm. have self respect because you don't haven't had enough experience to know what you can and can't handle. Uh, but I can assure you that you're being exploited, manipulated, and gaslit. And this artifice called the budget is a man made construct that's designed to separate you from the ruling class's money. When they say to you, it's not in the budget, they have the money. When Bates That's College, Bates they College has do. an endowment that has to be in the billions, but they will literally say to the janitors, it's not in the budget. Well, they organize the budget, I know from living in New Haven all those years, they organize the budget so that they reinvest their money. Yale is a multi, multi-billion dollar, um, I think $30 billion is their endowment. But they tell their grounds workers and technical workers they don't have the money because they plow it right back into their investment. Right. You know, it's part of their portfolio. It's not in cash. But, you know, just like they say they don't have the money for the $3.5 trillion. Oh, for heaven's sakes, they can take back that tax cut they gave to uh, the rich under Trump, and they could start taxing at 96.8% incomes over $500,000 a year. Or they can just collect the taxes that are already owed. Right, exactly. They can collect all the taxes they're owed. They can shut down the tax shelters and tax those incomes. Right. You know, that's obvious. Our military is not going to have a fight with the Canary Islands, you know? Right, right. It's silly. Right. And that would be a good use of our military. But they, they don't have the money then. But what is exciting now is that American workers are on strike. There are 458,000 fewer health care workers than there were in January 2020 because people won't put up with it. And that's everyone both the technical workers at the hospital, you know, the people who test your blood and stuff, and the people who weigh you in, and the skilled nurses, and the nurses' aides, and the custodians. It's right. too much. The All other thing the is, the, at the top, it, you know, you have to be, you cannot worship or respect anybody who is rich and famous that the, the, the time that young people, people my age, everybody has to go on strike. You know, even if you're not going on strike at work, 
you have to shut off your Netflix. Your I can't shut off my Amazon Prime. You got to stop watching commercials and stop buying crap and stop thinking that somebody like Alec Baldwin is on your side because he dresses up like Trump. Alec Baldwin, manslaughter, accidental. He should have walked off that set the minute the police arrived to escort the IATSE workers off that set. You're e- which side are you on, boy? You're either on the side of management or you're either on the side of the union. There are no gray areas. Which side are you on, Alec? And you told us which side you're on. You're on the side of management. That the, 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 the police were called in because IATSE walked off that set. It was unsafe. They had already complained about the COVID protections. Paychecks weren't being ar- delivered. The guns were going off. It was an unsafe set. And IATSE packed up their bags and the producers uh, sent in the police to get them off the set. Alec Baldwin knew that. And he picked a side. He picked management. So he didn't have an armorer hand him a gun. He had an enforcer, an assistant director, who is a notorious enforcer and arrogant and said, cold gun, and Alec killed somebody. He he wouldn't be going through this nightmare right now if he did the right thing and walked off the set along with the rest of the IOTC workers. And everybody yes. I know who I work for say, well, it's complicated. No, no, you're making it complicated. You have to create the nuance and the gray areas because you're not on the side of labor. You're on management side. So you say it's complicated. It's complicated. You make it complicated because you don't want to admit that you're anti-union. Or that you're indifferent to their point of view, that your main feeling is not for them. There are not two sides. I'm sorry for one second. There are not two sides to the labor struggle. You're either on the side of management or you're on the side of the union. Alec Baldwin was on the side of management. He stayed when the IATSE workers walked off. He said, everybody's here, you know, everybody can be replaced. We don't need an armorer. We don't need a prop master. This arrogant assistant director who's been allegedly sexually harassing people on the set, I'll trust him to hand me a cold gun. Well, guess what? You pay a price in life for these little moments. You chose a side. Now the blood is on your hands. And for people to say that's not fair, People, I'm getting notes. That's not fair. Really, that's not fair. How about the, the the kid who doesn't have a mother anymore because they went non they they went with a non union prop master? Is that fair? Well, Alec is really suffering and he's canceled all his jobs so he can get centered. You know, all he had to do was cancel that effing movie and walk off the set with the, his Iotsi brothers, but he chose a side. And there are consequences to the sides you choose in life, Alec Baldwin. You chose management. So you can dress up like Donald Trump all you want and claim you're a Democrat and a liberal. You picked a side. You picked management. And now somebody's dead. Right. Well, I think the most amazing thing about what's happening now is that without strong unions, without a labor presence in this country without labor history being taught, without a socialist or a communist party that makes itself heard, without a third party that is sympathetic to labor, people are striking all over the place. The people of America have caught on. Show me how essential I am. Show it in cash. Put your money where your mouth is. That's really important because it's an awareness down the line. And it's shown in the fact that people are organizing across all of these professional lines. You know, in Buffalo, where 2,500 people have walked out of the Catholic hospital, Mercy Hospital, 
there's nurses, there's all the technical workers, there are the clerical workers and the secretaries, and they're the custodians, all of them. And because that's what labor's might is. And they're and doing it with Starbucks that. in Buffalo. The, yeah. What's happening with uh, India, the, who should be mayor of Buffalo? Walker, well, she it has a big following, even though Jay Jacobs, the head of the New York um, Democratic Party, the state of New York Democratic Party, was asked why he wasn't more eager to embrace India Walton. He said, she's a socialist. Would I uh, embrace David Duke if he got elected? That's the same thing. Yeah, that's the same thing, a fascist. And he got a lot of crap from that. for that, thank goodness. People asked him to resign. Of course, he didn't. He was very much on the side of Cuomo until the very last minute. And I think, so India Walton has her enemies in the Democratic Party. The developers. The, the, the developers. Yeah. Sure. The developers yeah. and a lot of other people who don't want to see average people get a break and the corporations stop getting the kind of outrageous breaks they get. And she stands for ordinary people. And so she has enemies, just like AOC has enemies. The Democratic Party made sure that there was somebody to primary her. Even though that was, they got a ridiculously low you know, number of votes. Most of my most of my listeners uh, don't have money, and they're guns for hire. One of the things I've learned from Zillow porn is how to get inside the head of the ruling class. What I like to do is I like to just you know have horrible insomnia, so I will look at a forty million dollar mansion in in you know, uh, Chappaqua, where the Clintons live. And I and you can do a tour of it, you know, or Hilton Head. You can look at a four. And I think, wow, that must be amazing to wake up every day and see that. And and then I think and not share it with anybody. That's the first thing I think is, wow, all this beauty that you cannot possibly share with anybody because they're going to hate you for hoarding all this wealth. And so you can only invite into this mansion other rich people, other yes. rich people which automatically makes you, at the very least, stupid. And it makes your kids weak and stupid. It's child abuse to own a $40 million estate and raise kids in that. It is child abuse. And I then I, I play this out every time I do Zillow porn. And then I start thinking about my apartment and the scuffs and the leaky faucet and the toilet that you have to jiggle. And I'm thinking, well, I know who I am. I know that if I had a $40 million estate and I'd say, I paid $40 million for this estate. Why am I so miserable? I want things fixed around here. I, this has to be perfect. And then I'm at the mercy of workers. And well, that- anyway, Somebody has to clean it. Somebody has to maintain it. You know, one of the things I love about Skytown, where I live at Stuyvesant Town, is that there's 80 acres of land with a lot of apartments on it, but you go out into your state. There's stately old trees. I used to live in Stuyvesant Town when I was a baby. Everybody. Yeah. And they're flowers, and you don't have to weed them or anything. It's all there in your rent. And I think that when they want these houses as status symbols, like the Clintons who started out with nothing and got it all from graft, but, mm -hmm. you know, then... You don't really realize that even though you don't do the labor, you have to hire people that supervise it and everyone wants to rip you off. And you're always watching and worrying. Exactly. Because everybody wants to rip you off. And that's how you have to view your boss. You look at a $40 million mansion, think of the upkeep and how you can't trust 
anybody to come into your home because they're going to steal from you. They're going to start a project and never finish it. And all you can think about is how do I get these people to to keep my to maintain my $40 million estate and not pay them through the roof? Cheap labor. They are obsessed with cheap labor, not just for economic reasons, they don't want to get ripped off. They hate the idea that they're paying too much for labor. They think you're getting something over them. So they want to know you're, you're charging me. To, these people are obsessed with money. Those mansions are psychic prisons. They, they, they torture the owners. Know. Well, they, you know, it's like Brecht's play, Master Slave. The master is sure that the slave is going to kill him in the night, so he kills the slave. The slave hadn't intended to, but the master can't sleep. Oh, I have to see that. It's very good. It's called The Master and the Slave. It's very right. good how the enslaving the slave enslaves the master. And I think, you know, of course there are variations. We have friends who, this guy didn't go to college and he was poor and he decided he wanted to make money in Houston, Texas. And he did. And he has a big house that he loves and he shows off and he has a vineyard and he pays his workers two or three times more than everybody else. So that would be a loved. livable wage. Then, he pays them. If it's two or three yeah. times what everybody else gets paid, it's a livable wage. He pays. them. Yes, that's right. And so that when the that's workers not saying don't much. work on someone else's land, they'll work on his. Right. Because they good to people, because that's who he is. Or that's what he tells you. I would believe it. I really would believe it of these people. He's an amazing guy, and he's also very generous politically, too. I, I, with all, I, I never met the guy. I don't know who you're talking about. But if he owns a vineyard, he's a bad yeah. guy. He's a, no. Anybody who owned, nothing good ever came from a vineyard. I, I think good wine is good, but I also think that you can look. Engels had a factory. Does that mean that that uh, Marx shouldn't have been his friend and gotten supported to write Capital? Nothing is simple. Everybody is complicated, and people are complicated, and what they do with and how they operate is complicated. He's wildly atypical. He's behind oh, yeah. all sorts of things with his money. Which side are you on, Doctor? Partly, he gets that money because he is a businessman. He's very entrepreneurial about the left right. too, starting things and sustaining things and managing things. Yeah, but I think it's not about individuals. It's about what the system does to people. And the logic of capitalism is more for me, less for you. And what does that make you? Ugly yeah. and grasping. Yep. That's it. And it makes your family ugly and sick and lost right. and medicated. Uh, they rebel against you. If, if you're lucky, they like rebel this. against you. Yes, if they're lucky and you're lucky. Although not, they wouldn't think of themselves right. as lucky, then they rebel against you. How do people get in touch with you, Dr. Harriet Fraud? Well, if they want to write to me, they could write at hfraud at gmail.com they could go through my website harrietfraud.com or go through democracy at work asking for me yeah I, uh, I'm filled with piss and vinegar today because I have no sleep I have not been sleeping so You're watching Zillow porn yeah, I've been watching my Zillow porn so I, if I don't sleep uh, I go from zero to 120, uh, it's like an adrenaline burst to keep me awake, and I yeah, find I get well, angry. You should sleep. I'm you sorry. Should sleep because you should sleep if you possibly can. Yeah, I can't sleep. Yeah. Drink warm milk. And are you a drinker? Do you usually? No, no, no. I've, I can't sleep because I've committed these crimes that are unforgivable. I don't want to get into it, but I've committed crimes that no man with a, a conscience should be able to sleep. The things that I have done in this world, no, I, I know. Well, really, if, if, um, 
at least for me, because I'm not a big drinker, if I have warm milk with ginger liqueur in it, it knocks me right out. I can't. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely I'm genuinely pissed off about the Alec Baldwin story and the way it's being reported in, yeah. in the press, how, how it's well, all it's about sympathy gun, for him. It's yeah. gun and, safety. And you know, they had complained about that prop room before and the care and the carelessness about props, but they didn't listen to the workers. Right. You know, all the lead stories about gun safety, how you can be safe next time you're making a movie with a gun. Anyway, David Cobb, uh, thank you for putting up with me, all of you. Uh, how do people reach you, David Cobb? I'm at David K. Cobb at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook at David K. Cobb. Uh, I also have a Twitter handle. Great. David Cobb. Thank you so much. Let us now go up to Kingston, Ontario, where Professor Adnan Hussein is standing by with a very special guest. Hello there, Professor. I'm turning everybody's video on. Hello, Professor Adnan Hussein. Thank you for doing this. It's great to see you. Great to see you. And it's great to see Dr. Fraud and uh, David Cobb. Great segment, as always. Uh, but um, I'm really thrilled about uh, our uh, guest today, uh, Professor Catherine Liu, who is um, a professor of film and media studies at UC Irvine in um, their uh, School of Humanities and is the author of The American Idol, Academic Anti-Elitism as Cultural Critique. Uh, but more recently, uh, a book that I'm hoping we will uh, learn a lot more about, and I encourage everyone to read, Virtue Hoarders, The Case Against the Professional Managerial Class from earlier this year. Uh, so, Catherine, welcome uh, to The David Feldman Show. Uh, thank you for having me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you sound very clear. Yes, Great. thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thanks. For, I, I love the um, background that you gave on the Alec Baldwin incident, actually. And um, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I was filled with this kind of like inchoate rage. But um, another reason is that I felt like um, it was a way to think about class as an explanatory structure that was very cathartic for me, actually, because the professional managerial class in defining it, in um, designating its contours, is actually like identifying it as a target because the PMC would really like to be invisible. Its ideology is the air we breathe. And um, its, its forms of liberalism have to do with do-goodism and um, hoarding not just power and capital and cultural capital to itself, but um, more recently in its latest permutation, virtue itself. Virtue, which used to be like the honor, which is like a very, you know, Christian uh, concept, but the PMC is secular. It's like secularized um, a kind of morality. And one thing that, you know, I can joke about is that I live in a totally PMC neighborhood and I raised my child and one of those here, and I just saw the ways in which these upper middle class, extremely educated people were able to promote their lifestyle superiority as moral superiority. But more than that, um, I feel like the liberal arts credential from elite universities is now used as a kind of entry calling card to the worlds, not just of um, big business, although some people go into law school, but to the world of NGOs, the, the culture industry, content production. Right now, Hollywood is dominated by this ethos. And what its target is, is really suppressing and destroying the working class and the working class life world. And one of the things I think that um, the Alec Baldwin story might be able to tell, to tell us, one of the lessons in PMC managerialism is that it wants to like um, 
de-skill the worker. So the manager on set doesn't respect his workers, right? He's like, I can do that job. You know, this will save us money. You know, get the hell out of here. I'm going to give you this gun. It's a cold gun. And that kind of um, de-skilling and that kind of um, dismissiveness is what, um, um, on a mass scale, is what's destroying America's working class. The really scary thing is that it's also a great export. PMC virtue hoarding throughout Europe in um, Germany, I like to say, is America's 50 50- for a state, and their um, their leftism is completely defanged. Um, someone called um, the Green Party, which is now you know in an alliance with the socialists, which are also like just centrists. They are like um, vegetarian um, Christian Democrats, and so what we have is like a lifestyle kind of centrism that um, wants to actually have minoritarian rule and destroys and ignores, dismisses. And actually um, um, attacks at every level the lives of working class people. So um, all of these union, the union actions are really great. Um, What I think that we can all learn from them as PMC people is that there are many more workers than there are bosses. But the PMC wants to disguise it, its world is seems like the most important world. Sorry, Adnan, I'm like going on and on, so you got to stop me. This are you? Fantastic. This is I, this is um, better than this, Zillow this, porn. I'm sure this is like this is like <laughs> this is clarifying everything my in my head. Porn, so, like, they fill our world. Like the New York Times, I think, is like the PMC Pravda. You know, it's like truth, according to PMC, the Washington Post. Um, there are internecine PMC fights. But for, in, for instance, I'll tell you what the New York Times has done in terms of virtue hoarding recently that I think is really, really despicable. It keeps reporting on um, Biden's um, you know, budget, the three trillion dollar budget, it's going to be cut, it's going to be cut. Um, oh my, we have to make a compromise. What it doesn't report on, and the Wall Street Journal actually reported on, is that the association, the National Association of Independent Schools, which includes Amherst, Bar, Yeshivas, every private school in the nation is part of this lobbying group, is lobbying actively against free community college. The New York Times won't report this because college universities, they all went to these private universities and they don't want them to look bad. So every single private university and college in America does not want working class people to have free higher free college education. And the New York Times will not talk to you about this. Why? In fact, why, why, a conservative why? paper. Why? Mm-hmm. Why? Why? Because they want the um, private universities and colleges to be um, progressive. The faces of the pro- progressive liberals. They're like so on why, the side why of the don't people. The private they are u- not on the side of the people. But the New York Times wants to pretend that their form of liberalism in the schools that they went to are progressive. They're not. They're not. Le- they're not liberal. They're neoliberal. Why? And why would Harvard be against? Why would Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Yeshiva? Why would they be against free community colleges? Spell okay, it out. they're afraid because once you have this level of free community college and you have free public universities next, they're afraid that people will wake up and stop going to these schools, stop paying $75,000 a year, stop paying $80,000 a year to Vassar, stop paying $77,000 a year to Williams. Like it won't come right away, but it could come because if you funded public education properly, people wouldn't go to these places. So they want to keep higher education a luxury good. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I, they want I, to disguise their do like they want to diversify Harvard. They want to diversify Yale. They disguise their absolute class um, privilege and aggression as do goodism because they'll diversify a tiny student body. They'll diversify a tiny professoriate. It doesn't matter. Not a single working class African American person's life is improved when Yale hires an African American professor or when um, UCI or the UC says, you know, we need to um, hire more 
um, I don't know, Latinos, which we do need to have. But in the in the pipeline, there are simply not enough graduate students. They don't care about the Latino workers who are picking lettuce in the fields, like in 100 degree weather. It's not like they don't care. Caring is like such a PMC word. That is not that level of suffering and exploitation is simply not visible in the PMC world. So that's why I wrote this book, because I'm really, really furious. I came from a family of immigrants. Um, I went to school at Yale. I got in on my own. No one really cared. My parents were both from my father was from a peasant farming family. My mother's family was a little better. My grandfather was a security guard. My both my grandmothers were functionally illiterate. I really aspired to the white collar life. But partially I had a leftist education because we were taken to China every other year when I was a kid. And um, when I got into the white collar world, I was just filled with this rage because I felt like I had been fooled and I had been because they're like, we're reasonable people and we're not, you know, irrational, superstitious, like, you know, your benighted parents or something. And I had a very abusive family. So I thought, oh, I'm going to escape violence and go into this world where people are reasonable and people are honest. No, let's just put this very simply. People in the professional managerial class are neither reasonable nor nor honest. And this is my class that I'm talking about, and they want all the treats. They are an intermediate class between the capitalists, of which there are very, very few, like people who can just live off the interest of their fortunes and people whose capital keeps expanding. They are a salaried elite between the capitalists and the working class. And so they look up and they step on the heads of the working class people. But they're 25 percent of the um, workforce right now. So it's a pretty they've been expanding ever since the 1900s. It's very hard to get a job anywhere without a college degree. Right. So um, most Americans, 67 percent of Americans still don't have a college degree. And I'll tell you, the PMC does not give a shit about them. Okay, that's my that's my very very long answer. <laughs> Sorry, I can go on and on. I don't. I, I I do know exactly what you mean, David, when you say that you know adrenaline may and sleep deprivation makes you really angry. But and I, we saw I saw a lot of people give you advice on the stream and everything else. As a lifelong insomniac, when I tell you I don't have enough sleep, please don't tell me what to do because I've tried every fucking thing. And I'll tell you right now, edibles and trazodone. Only thing that works, don't tell me to do breathing exercises in the middle of the night. There's nothing more stressful than doing a breathing exercise in the middle of the night. So that's just my th- that's just my stick. So I should have gone to stand up, but I didn't. <laughs> I'm a professor, and uh, that wasn't an acceptable profession. For I have to family. I have to be polite Can to Doctor Fraud. Just make a statement. Yes, please, please. I just want to add that Catherine Liu's point is so beautifully made by the fact that Harvard's so interested in diversity that they wouldn't give Cornell West tenure. He was probably the most published of all of the people, and they wouldn't give him tenure because he's a radical, yeah. and he doesn't stand for the professional and managerial class. Yeah. So it's a great... Yeah. You know, it's a great illustration of their values. It's it's pure lip service. And I don't like the term diversity anyway, although I believe that we should have like class antagonism exploding everywhere. Yes, um, diversity is a pacification of um, antagonism. But antagonism is exploding everywhere because more than 100,000 workers yeah. in the United States are on strike. Which yeah, I, I do. I, and I think that's that's incredible. I, I do feel because David comes from the media. I do feel like the culture industry level of scale of reaching people is in the millions and hundreds of millions. I feel like a strike is an alternative media environment because it's so immersive. It's so pedagogical. Like like David said, there are two sides. I fucking hate this thing about nuance. I need some subtlety. No, there's a picket line. 
you cross it or you don't, right? That's just like, there's no nuance there. And a strike really tells you what that means. It also shows you like who you can count on, who you can't. So I feel like when we get to the level of millions, I'll be more optimistic. I am happy now and I'll do everything I can to support the striking workers everywhere. But I do feel like the PMC even there wants to co-op this thing, like the Google walkout, the Netflix walkout. Give me a fucking break, people. Like PMC unions, they don't even want... They don't want more money. Like what be, they want, like representation. They're not happy with something. So they do this walkout. No, you know what? When people at John Deere strike, they need more money. They need more of everything. And that's what we should be um, supporting. Not these symbolic concessions from your boss. It's so easy. Let me give you an example of a symbolic concession and political naivete. So around um, Occupy, time, there's a, you know, I've been a professor a long time, um, but around Occupy, the students at UC Irvine, where I teach, um, were mobilizing. And I went to a lot of these meetings, even though I had a 10 year old and I really didn't have the fucking time to spend four hours with people like arguing about stuff. But, um, I went to the meetings and then, um, they had, they, they, de they developed a list of demands, but because it's so now non hierarchical, sorry, David Graeber and very anarchic, they had like, you know, uh, we want reduced tuition. We want more empowerment, you know, student representation. We want transgender bathrooms. We want, um, you know, more access to healthcare, you know, some con like concrete things and a couple of symbolic things. My husband at the time, I, you know, I'm not revealing anything confidential, was a chair of the faculty senate meeting with the president, Michael Drake at the time, all the time, the chancellor. And the chancellor looked at the list, which is totally un, you know, disorganized. And there wasn't a lot of like groundswell because they, the, the radical students can convince the moderate students to join them and they occupy. And, um, Michael Drake laughed and said, okay, I'll give them the transgender transgender bathrooms, gender neutral bathrooms, no problem. Ha, ha, ha. Right. That was it. So people do not go for like the symbolic concessions because like your bosses will be more than happy yeah. to give you a yeah. symbolic concession that costs them zero dollars. So um, I, I feel like one of the things about the left in, the, in this country as I've known it is that it underestimates how powerful and organized capitalism is. You cannot be disorganized and like funky when you're fighting capital. So anyway, but I'm really, really encouraged by what's happening with the progressive leaders on the slate and the Teamsters. I think that's going to make a huge difference if the Teamsters can get out of uh, from under the thumb of Jimmy Hoffa. So... Anyway, that's my, um, I also noticed that Adnan works on Silk Road and Western China things like Xi'an. And that's actually where my grand, my, my beloved late grandmother is from. Oh, well, that's where my uh, relatives are from on my mother's side, too. No from, way. Uh, well, Western China? Just the other, well, the other, the other side, side of the Silk Road. Part of yeah. the same kind okay. of world, but a little further west on the Silk Road in uh, Fergana Valley. So oh, cool. looks like we've got a uh, Silk spiritual connection here so right, that's right. great that's, that's cool. great but you know um this is so great i mean i loved so many parts of this um book as well and identifying and targeting the pmc uh, for all the reasons you mentioned um but i loved also that you took on this whole lifestyle as virtue. I think that's something that, you know, in consumer capitalism is very comfortable as a political orientation, obviously. And so you had these great sorts of discussions about the PMC has children and what that whole world, uh, you know, uh, means the PMC has sex. And you sort of talked about all of these moral panics, sex panics on college campuses. And I feel like you could have added even a chapter on the PMC eats, you know, oh, like yeah. that would have been yeah. another one with all of the environmental. Uh, oh, the foodie movement the and foodie everything, movement. making food yeah. like really, my, I, I, I know, I, you know, I'm working on um, a book that in my mind is called The PMC Has a Trauma, but it's actually a history of trauma studies. But the, the food thing, I think, is really, really, uh, really right on because the the food the industrialization of food accompanies this like rarefication mm. of taste in foodie culture 
Yes, as I think I think of uh, Berkeley, California, for example, oh as the sort of apogee, uh, you know, of that, like very progressive people, or so they imagine. And um, but what is most important to them is going to the cheese board for whatever the daily pizza of the day, getting a slice of that, or you know, going to you know any of the fine um, restaurants or or you know food shops that special specialize in highly curated, you know, sorts of provisioning, you know, I mean, no, the farm no. to table, but no the questions farm to asked table thing. The, yeah, they, yeah. the farm to table. Tell me about the farm. You want to know about your food? It's locally sourced. Tell me how much you know about this food. The American family farm is one of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century. It's like being literally it was literally destroyed by agribusiness like Monsanto destroyed the American family farm, right? The um, Iowa, one of the reasons why I was red state is because I think the Democrats didn't do anything about um, agricultural consolidation. So you have people just abandoned in the middle of this country to agricultural depredations, but then you have the Democrats coming and telling you how you should live at the same time. Like they've abandoned you to the wolves, but then I'm like, oh wait, maybe you're using too many plastics. It's like your individual use of plastic is not gonna save the planet. It's, n it's not. The absolute like destruction of the environment is petrochemical companies, really. So it's a whole diversionary discourse. But I've done so one of the things that one of every once in a while, like I'll post this and it'll be one of the most, most controversial tweets. And I and I have been Twitter mob for other things. So I'm like more careful now. But I grew to hate farmers markets. <laughs> I just can't stand them because of the way that they become like this, you know, weird, like we're cutting out the middleman. We're directly, you know, buying from farmers. It's so expensive. Mm -hmm. You, you want to buy, you want to spend like a hundred dollars and have like finger foods for like 30 minutes. Go to a farmer's market. If you need to feed your family, do not go to a fucking farmer's market. So, um, the more, um, food agriculture was industrialized. And I feel like, the American like public health system is just destroying American um, bodies with literally with um, fruit, high fructose corn syrup and everything. The more rarefied food has become. Whole Foods the about is anti-union. John um, Mackey. Whole Foods is like one of the most awful places in the world. But I was also going to say, like, with regard to like the restaurant industry, it's one of the most unstable and um, punishing industries. And er but. And yet it offers, and this foodie culture definitely promotes this, like everyone can just have a dream. Like you want my dream is to open a restaurant and to serve people this beautiful food. Well, if you want to go bankrupt, like 99, your chance, if you want 99% of your chance of going bankrupt to be realized, like go open a restaurant. You know, this is, it's all about consolidation right now, but promoting this kind of like um, passion project that's actually crushing middle class people. You know, um, um, Elizabeth Warren and Teresa Sullivan wrote a book. Yeah, I, I wish she was a better per candidate politically, but she wrote. they wrote a great book in the early 2000s about why Americans had really high levels of debt and were going bankrupt. It wasn't because they were like buying treats for themselves. Um, the two major reasons were health care issues and also they're starting small businesses. Like everyone was trying, everyone was like writing that entrepreneurial dream. So um, I think the restaurant stuff and all that stuff is really terrifying. Like my dream is to have socialized canteens in every neighborhood where I don't have to cook, but I can go get really well prepared food by um, like um, good socialist moms who are preparing for the neighborhood and I don't have to cook all the time because there is actually no reason for us all to have a family kitchen at some point. I'm an empty nester now and like, the, the New York Times cooking section is a great PMC example of the foodie culture we've been talking about. Who has time, leisure, and money to spend like five fucking hours on a meal? And when people prepare it for me, I feel horrible because I feel like we eat it in like 20 minutes. And I just think it's a waste of time, but also like a sort of virtue signaling about like hand-picked food and, you know, handmade stuff when... Um, we actually should scale up high quality food for everyone. Mm -hmm. 
And um, this country is really killing itself with, you know, the bad um, industrially produced foods. And um, that's a huge health crisis. That's why, like, I feel like the COVID thing is like masking the obesity crisis, the nutrition crisis. You know, we can't say uh, people are hungry. You know that, right? In America, we say they're food insecure. That's like a fucking bullshit title. Mm-hmm. They're malnourished. They're, they're they're obese and mal- they're obese because they're and, malnourished. And malnourished at the same time. Yeah. So it's kind of dystopic hell. Yes. I, that that would be a whole other book on that. I keep I teach a I teach a course called Food on Screen where we talk a lot about these issues. But um, yeah. I mean, I the follow ups I can rant on all number. Oh, well, I mean, it's camps. obvious that uh, lifestyle that, ideologies. Know. Right, indeed. Well, I mean, I think even when you mentioned um, how you, bad you feel when people go through all of this effort, you know, uh, it made me immediately think, however, that uh, this is sort of what happens with the PMC culture is that even something that would be um, a wonderful value of hospitality, yeah. you know, gets turned into some staging of yeah. one's moral sort of, uh, you know, virtue for the way in which you, you know, and it's for an audience, you know, it's it's for yourself as audience and it's for others as, you know, of the same class. And so that actually, what do you mean by, can you explain what that means? So the, how that's virtue hoarding, Professor? Yeah, that would be helpful uh, to about how that is virtue hoarding. That That's sort of what I wanted to get at. And also, what are the values you mentioned the fed, nar- narcissistic fetishization of intelligence or refinement as one of these kind of key moves of the PMC. Maybe you could elaborate on that and also what you would displace that with in terms of what values like we actually should embrace. Um, anything that's good can be mass produced and democratized for everyone socialized food if you could socialize fine dine it be like okay i'm fine with that it, the the fact that it's only for one percent i'm not fine with that but yes that so the values of high um of mass quality is really important to me um the values of redistribution are really important are the values that i would think are really important honoring workers and our and this is, you know, controversial with, for people who want to be like um, subtle, but I'm not um, honoring the anthropological drive we have to be proud of work, our work. Mm-hmm. And thinking of that as a universal, like everyone wants to have. So that's why I'm not crazy about the gray bird thing, because he wants to like embrace like nobody working. That's the anarchist thing. I feel like people really want to be proud of what they do. People want to have meaningful work and that anything that honors that is for everyone is like uh, not part of the capitalist system. So there's going to be people who in ca- under capitalism with the division of labor, we think there are always going to be masses of people who slave away, who do jobs because of drudgery. And this is because of the PMC's meritocracy now, like they just deserve to have shitty jobs because they're not that smart or they're not that refined. And we deserve to have better jobs, well-paid jobs. And that's why we can spend $500 on a meal at El Bulli because we have refined tastes. And everyone else is just a bunch of shitheads. They're reactionary, they're racist, they're sexist, they're patriarchal. We've given them a moral cast. I mean, the Victorians did this with while they were like sucking the lifeblood out of um, the, Brit- the, in- the English working classes, they're also saying, and the Irish, they're also saying, oh my God, what a bunch of drunken, slovenly, dirty shitheads they are, right? That's what capitalism does all the time. So to reverse that really means like you have to honor like the struggle of ordinary people and their desire for dignity. And that is socialism. And that is why capitalism, you know, wants to hoard virtue and dignity for the few and give like iniquity, misery and sin to the many. And I've said this in other podcasts, too, but I was like, 
one of the reasons why the P- the PMC's triumphalism is ma- is is tempered by the evangelical Christian rejection of like liberal PMC values, right? Well, part of the what I think of this as being a cultural phenomenon is the PMC is actually highly ascetic Protestant and religious without God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the evangelical Christians are like, you guys are so, you know, atheistic and godless, and yet you're so sanctimonious and think you're better than other people. So you have this, like, one Protestant sectarianism and then crypto-Protestant capitalism, on the other hand. So yeah. I, it, were those big enough words for everyone? Like, Well, I, I love that point words. because it seems like there are so many ways in which um, – you know, what has happened is merely the secularization of aspects of Christian culture over time. And so that's a very good example in some ways of, you know, Weber's sort of group that brings out the spirit of capitalism actually, um, you know, managed to continue the form of it without the rationale for it, right? Like what's the reason for any of this? At least there was a theology before. These yeah. people thought that they were saving themselves and certainly in God, you know, like, what's the purpose of it now? It is merely, it should be exposed and possible to really see the genuine ideological basis of establishing, um, you know, their class position, their political and social and economic advantages. But in fact, actually, um, they've managed somehow to occlude this all, yeah. despite the fact that there isn't really a rationale that's based in the kind of traditional theologies of Christianity. Yeah, they're, they're very anti, the anti traditional. This is also why, like in my profession, I feel like um, the humanities are going to die in this generation because they 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 despise the past. And I think I put that mm-hmm. in, uh, this part of the book too. Like they hate history. Like they want to cancel history because they feel like they are like the most advanced. The, we're, we are the most advanced people in the world. We are the most enlightened people. As a class, they feel like they can dispose of history, which I, I like. I thought, like, I was kind of joking, but it, it, I mean, I was making it amusing The PM, in the PMC has sex part mm-hmm. because the counter, and the, a lot of the PMC comes out, their ethos comes out of the counterculture. Like, when white, wealthy Americans discovered, like, sexual pleasure, they thought they had invented it. And they were like this whole explosion of like sex manuals and like, you know, different. Now it's like all these different kinds of sex. Oh, my God. You know, we're so enlightened. Like this kind of the sexual revolution was always like really funny to me because it just ignored the fact that like in order for us to have existed, you know, with writing for 5000 years, maybe as a species for 100,000 years, people had sex before. I mean, but maybe they just had bad sex and the PMC like only had good sex. I highly doubt it. But um, there is a real movement after 1968 to say like everyone traditionalists were just like having really bad sex. And now we're having really good sex. And like it's so mechanistic, too. It's like and now our best and, and most enlightened forms of sex have to do with consent. Like, may I kiss you? May I touch you? May I touch? Is this OK? You know what? That sounds like really horrible sex. But the PMC thinks like that it's a very contractual transactional, once again, disguised like um, exchange. It's like an economic exchange, almost like you do this for me. I do this for you. Like that's the most horrifying rationalized forms of sex that you can imagine. But the PMC really believed that the sex positive um, aspects of like sexual liberation seem like really boring to me. So I well, don't yeah, know with, cool. si- with a like, larger historical um, humil- sense of humility, you wouldn't believe this. But the, but these people have so much money and so little knowledge, and they have no humility at all. We are seeing like the um, the information economy be ruled by people of such a profound ignorance. Like I, I hate to say this, like this does. If I were a conservative, I would say like this does feel like the end of civilization. But because I'm a Marxist, I feel like this could be the beginning of a revolution. I heard a recent word that I liked a lot uh, from this community, smugnerant. You know, that, that seems to be the PMC to a T. You know, so ignorant, but so smug at the same time. So how could they? I'm sorry to interrupt. How could they be smart? Look at they're only 24 hours in the day. 
look how they spend their time. There's no, these, everybody's surprised when they get, they say, when I get close to powerful people, I'm surprised by how stupid they are. And I say, of course they're stupid. They're investing all their time in accruing power. They're not reading. Of course they're mm -hmm. ignorant. Uh, I mean, the other, but the, the thing is that there was like, even under feudalism, when you had the monarch and the tyrant at, at the court, there was a certain respect for like the artist, the musician, the philosopher, or even like the bank keep, the the um the treasurer, like Richelieu under um Louis the Fourteenth, right? There was a kind of um respect for I, I can't do this all. Well, if we think of RPMC like RPMC overlords who became capitalists, who were like smart, they all went to they all got like sixteen hundred on their SATs. So that's why they think they're smart because they can take standardized tests really, really well, and they went to these elite institutions, which is why the PMC and higher education are like this. That they don't feel like they need to know anything; they're just like naturally capable, and they don't even need to um have differentiated like courtiers helping them because like Elon Musk, you know, knows what art is. And Jeff Bezos like knows how to do his accounts. Like they they are this kind of like scary version of the Renaissance man. And all of those like um, Elizabeth Holmes, who you know built people out of a billion dollars for her fake you know blood testing company. She was like everyone thought she was a genius. You know they were like, oh my god, she's a genius. She can do all this. She's created an at home blood test panel. It was pure grift. And but, and um, all the like and grifting. Mattis, they're really good at grifting. Kissinger, really, really good grifting. Mattis, they they all bought into it because they don't they don't understand it, but they 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 think they're smart and they can yeah. identify another. Or intel. even Leah, look at Hillary Clinton. She ran on being really smart. She went to you know Yale Law School and you know. Smith, I think she went to Smith, and um, so Wesleyan. They, they I think she went to smart. Wesleyan. They, they have this pure. The intelligence has become, um, you know, the standardized, measurable thing that is rewarded. I mean, I know in Canada you don't have the same kinds of levels of elite schools it's not ordered like that but this is like something i think you're adopting or something and you know god forbid it should go over there because this this kind of um pure smarts that we fetishize is um you know to me this pure pmc american export because that was part of the Cold War, like Rand, Brookings. We had, like we had these really smart people um, modeling nuclear um, destruction, you know. And that cold, I mean, Dr. Strangelove does this great job of, you know, um, satirizing that. But this fetishization of smarts versus experience versus craft, that's really like um, an intense part of um, PMC man managerialism. Wow. The best and the you are, this is this is so great. This is so great. I'm, go ahead, Professor Hussein. This is just so great. So you know, I was just saying the best and the brightest. I mean, that is, uh, the, you know, the the uh, self-congratulatory ideology of it. Um, it. It used to be the 19th century industrialist used to say, you know, we were the hardest working like Carnegie, you know, comes from nothing. Franklin, like I, uh, Benjamin Franklin, I just abjure all pleasures. I don't drink. I, you know, stitch in time saves nine. I'm the most frugal. Now it's, I am the most smart. Like Elon Musk is about to be a trillionaire. And he's like, oh my God, he's a genius. Everyone just accepts that. You know, I'm like, at this point, I'm like, fuck smarts, you know. What does de-skilling mean? Can you, I was talking to my daughter about, how the professional managerial class de-skills you because they don't want anybody to get ahead of them. Well, so it really begins very, can, can I be more, can I go, do I have a few minutes or do I have to be off? So? You you yeah. have all the time in the world. Okay. We love you. So um, um, the capitalist organization of production means that um, they take like a 
let, let's say you, a dressmaker makes one dress from beginning to end. She's a very, very good dressmaker because she has to make like one of these ball gowns from top to bottom. The capitalist says, that takes too long. I'm going to have someone just do the hems. I'm going to have someone just do the lace. I'm going to have someone just do the bodice. And so that already is a de-skilling because then you have these people who are just doing one part of their dress alienation and no from, one no one knows how to put make, and after a generation no one knows how to see no one knows how to make a complete dress anymore i only know how to do hams i only know how to do the bodice when you get to the factory level they have the assembly line discovers that you know and under tailorism is that if you make if you break these um tasks down and you have some like skilled blacksmith only be able to like do one thing to a nail at one time you can make a lot Lot more nails and you can make a lot more um, profit from it. Um, de-skilling then, you know, just is about extracting more, is creating more um, efficient lines of production that are, end up like making the work of the worker more alienating and giving more power to the foreman, the bosses, those who design the assembly line in order that the capitalists can extract more profit from the labor process. Now, this and you're easily process, replaced. You can be if you're decent. That's right. You can easily retrain someone. They just you just slot them in onto the thing. And so a lot a lot of the workers from the 18th century on as, you know, industrialized production of textiles and uh, manufacturing was going on, they would rebel against this. In fact, the Luddites did this, the weavers in France did this. They, every time this happened, the workers would, you know, um, just try to destroy the machines and rebel against this thing. Now, though, we've had like automation. We've gone to a whole other level of de-skilling. And I feel like we can pay on the assembly line. We will pay the workers as little as we can but in or we will pay the engineers who create the AI in the robots as much as possible so that the black box of managerialism becomes an algorithm, almost like an algorithm. And the worker is just doing one thing at a time, like very, 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 very de-skilled thing or the logistics line at Amazon. You know, um, the if they if Amazon could replace every human worker on its floor, it would, because it's all about getting um unruly, unpredictable human labor to the lowest level possible with the lowest number of well, lowest wages. And the PMC engineer gets like more and more prestige, more and more money. And his um, design, usually her design of the logistics thing gets a lot more um, investment of money and prestige and the workers more and more reduced um, um, to the point where he or she then becomes easily replaceable and easily easy replaceable is really important here because really in the 19th century, the industrial revolution happened in Britain and what they really want, they found that the most effective thing to do is just to work someone to death by the time they were 30, get someone who's nine years old back on the line and um, pay them. From the Staffordshire, you know, ceramics to the textile uh, mills of Liverpool, this was the logic. At some point, people were like, oh, maybe it's not such a good idea to work people to death when they're 30. Um, maybe we can work them to death when they're 35 because we need them to reproduce more workers. The only way that things changed was because workers started striking and because people were really afraid of communist, anarchist, socialist rebellion by the 19th century because you can only work people so much to the point where you have, and you have these factories with like 5, 10,000, 15,000, 50,000 workers. They're like 500 bosses and they figure, uh, managers, and they're like, no, you know what? We've got the numbers. So capitalism has gotten really smart because they realized that the factories actually created an actual space of um, solidarity where you could look at the person next to you and go, wow, I have more in common with you than I have with the boss, right? So you have this incredible thing. Now, we the de-skilling and the automation prevents that from happening. And we've also globalized and taken these low-wage jobs and taken them somewhere else so that American workers are de 
demoralized. They have no more like the gig economy is about never seeing another worker. You're always picking up clients. You're always serving clients. And that's why Uber and Lyft were so um, people were so excited about them because capitalists know like that's a really good model because this worker will never see another worker. Even a medallion taxi cab driver in New York, like they had their old coffee shops, they had their coffee, like taxi was all about like a taxi station where they would go and they'd hang out and they'd talk. Do you think an Uber driver has that? No, they don't have that. They're competing with each other. No, right. And they're competing with it. So de-skilling is a form of class war. And it's happening in all the professions. And you were talking about ageism both earlier, and I feel like um, that is now hap- that is happening within the PMC itself. A lot of my friends who are engineers say the um, big companies and the coders they love like twenty four to thirty five year olds. And the moment you turn 40, 45, like they have to pay you a lot of money, and they don't like you because you know how the system works now. You know you got Google's number, you got Amazon's number, you have Facebook's number, and they like want to push you out the door because you have this like young 24 year old waiting to take your place with $300,000 of student loan debt and he will do anything his boss says and whereas if you're 45 50 55 you're like well maybe not you know maybe I could be the boss like that's bullshit or or I'm sorry year old indebted and newly minted engineer will not say that to you or if you're older you know that this is inefficient we can go home at five. We don't have to do it this way. That's right. This is just, right. you're just keeping us here to keep us here. I'm sorry, Professor us. Hussain. This yeah, is, you're right. That's this, right. This is That's clarity. Right. This explains the misery, the immiseration that everybody feels. Go, ahead. Professor yeah, Hussain. So even engineers, highly paid engineers are, in, are, are suffering from this. Yeah, well, I'm wondering, um, do you think that the... PMC is under threat, breaking up. I mean, for two reasons. One, you point out in the book that they have abandoned uh, the professional protocol standards that they have, you know, that they had developed maybe mid 20th century or, or, or earlier. That's right. um, so that's one one kind of problem that they've sort of declined in some sense or they're a decadent version of the yeah. of the sort of real emergence of the professional and managerial class and two that it's not able to reproduce itself as um easily in terms of younger generations being able to who may have aspirations to the pmc they go through these great schools they get educated but they're finding that you know their pathways into those kinds of positions in the culture industry how many journalists are there now you have to turn to you know trying to make it on the internet um you know in the social media world and so on despite so you don't have the security you know you don't have this kind of sense of security it's the gig economy for the intellectual class as well right. not just cab drivers and, and so on that's so right. that's kind of creating new conditions and fissures within this kind of professional professional and managerial culture anyway because some people can't actually become part of the class even though they're part of that culture of it and so I'm wondering what sorts of opportunities and dangers there are to this particular moment and this kind of alignment. What do you see as a hope, a hopeful sign? And maybe what do you see as some of the real challenges of navigating out of this? Um, those are really, really good questions. And I don't know that I can address them um, directly, but I'd like to take the first part of your question where you talked about the betrayal of professional protocols, right? So once again, I'm going to do a kind of um, cartoonish history, but I think it makes sense. Um, there, So the American Medical Association emerges in the early part of the 20th century because basically like any Buddy could sell snake oil on the street and treat you. Like there was, there was a lot. The medical profession was super highly unregulated. America was like a crazy, um, wild west, right? So the AMA merges and professional protocols are put into place. Here's the training that you need to do, the residencies that you need to do, the education that you need to do, and you know the do no harm code is really enforced, right? So why does it break down? during the opioid crisis, right? Why do doctors in 
Arkansas, in Maine, in West Virginia, in Virginia, the places where the Sacklers dumped 300 million OxyContin pills, why did they do harm to their patients, right? Well, how did that break down? And one of the things you could say is like just this intense salesmanship of the Sackler family, like all they, they released, not just the pills, but all these salespeople to go out into these places where you had working class people with a lot of physical pain. Right. They were like Oxycontin. It's not it's narcotic, but it's not um, it, but it's not addictive. Why wasn't there more resistance in the two that like late 1990s, early 2000s to this kind of logic. And I'll say it's because even middle-class professional people were feeling the squeeze of an economic system that was moving more and more wealth to the top and the middle class was just collapsing. So when the Sacklers and the pharmaceutical companies gave these small town doctors incentives, it just looked so tempting and, you know, in a way that it would not have looked if you had like a really stable workforce, really stable real estate, really stable sort of life worlds where the where you could say, well, no, I don't need that extra $50,000 incentive or, you know, that that may not look so what the hell is non-addictive narcotic? Um, the the resistance was like really already softened by the social and economic precarity that people were feeling since Reagan, since Reagan took office, right? So since, well, you could say like since Volcker, since Jimmy Carter appointed Volcker to um, the Treasury and Volcker said, you know what, people are going to hurt, but capitalism is going to continue to work really well. And um, so there's that. Like, I think this generalized sense of fear among, you know, the profession, the professionals that, um like economic fear, because you can't say like all of these doctors were just fooled or all of these doctors were simply corrupt. There, it's, there were like a number of conditions that made that possible. And, you know, um, Harriet said 600,000 people have died. 600,000 families have had to deal with crippling, um, the crippling effects of um, opioid addiction. And in fact, I know countless graduate students who are now in their 30s who lost their fathers, like when they were teens. And the, that, was the, and, that was the time. And the hedge funds are in on recovery. Yeah. They're on, so, so that's one of the things that I think like... Uh, um, Americans looking, American capitalism looking for profits, extracting the profits, you know, um, creates then a, a, a new kind of like vicious capitalism that like professional protocols are not compatible with. So uh, that where was do the you first go? Part of the question. Yep. And now I forgot. Oh, yeah. You were saying like, is this a moment of um Hope or like um, is because the class itself the, yeah, has been exposed, right? Yes, it, it's right. It, it, we can't um, the the workings of the pharmaceutical industry were completely pried open by the OxyContin um, um, uh, scandal, and I wish I could be that optimistic, but I feel like um, as long as medical school costs as much as it does, and it's costing more and more every year, um, the, and as long as the barrier to entry to higher education remains this high with regard to money, I, I don't see like hope, but around the corner. But then, you know, the spark of social change never comes from like a rational profit, a rational person like me going, you know, I've done all this research and I think this is going to happen. Like things can turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. And and maybe it has to do with a critical mass of misery or something like that. But when the book first came out, you know, I had um, medical residents write to me. I've had countless people from the professions write to me and say, you know, I, I would never go public with this, but this is happening to me in my profession, you know, as a comedy writer, like you, a young comedy writer trying to break through as a, a resident who has to be, uh, you know, up 48 hours for, you know, these um, terms as a, uh, and then I've had like people who were, you know, just, in the army saying, I, I read this and I realized like, this is worse than the army. You know, I used what, to get, the thought a, control that you guys have to go through is worse than 
basic training. You know what I, I mean? I and used I'm to like, get yeah. I used to get bullied by my bosses, and they'd say, "I'm making you tough, but don't get hard." They say, don't, don't, "I'm making you, I'm toughening you up, but." Don't get, and then later they say, what "Don't does that be too." Mean? It means. What does that even mean? It means, I'm toughening you up, and then they then they say, "But don't." Then later they say, uh, "Don't be hard in your in your in your heart. Don't have a hard heart. You can't be funny if you have a hard heart." Then the next day they beat the crap out of your, and and say, I'm toughening you up, and then the next day they say, "Don't have a hard heart." It's that, it sounds like it's just abuse. It, just it's, like, yeah, it's abuse. Oh, abuse. It's abuse. Yeah. It's gaslighting. But, you know, the thing is that you, you have to, we all have to make that paycheck. If we're not living off our, the interest of our growing mountains of capital, like you feel like you have to put your head down. You have to accept that. How do you stop? You know, you, you can save yourself individually and write a self-help book and make a million dollars or not. Or you can say, you know, I have more in common with the Etsy workers, with, you know, the, the industrial workers, the industrial crafts workers who make the film industry function. It's not Alec Baldwin's, you know, talent that makes that movie happen. It's so many different people with different forms of expertise on a film set that make that happen. And the radical disrespect for that expertise is what caused that woman's death. And I'm really glad you, you know, put that out there because the reporting on it is really infuriating. Like some people, the, the New York Times goes, like some people just walked off the set because it wasn't safe. Some people. They called it labor some unrest. Some people. They called it labor unrest. The New York yeah. Times Listen, unrest. Union members walked off that set. Yeah. So. Well, I have to thank uh, Dan Hagerts on Twitter. He's a regular at our reading group, Weekly Marks, and also um, uh, Feldo, uh, um, audience member, uh, for putting us in touch with well, can you. We have six, well, can we get six more um, minutes? Can we spend? Can we have a little more time? Can you spare six oh, more absolutely. minutes? Sure, sure. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is. I mean, this is. It clarifies everything. You you clarify what we're all well, going. That's one of the things I liked so much about um, the book is it didn't pull punches. It was very direct. You were very upfront that this is a polemic, and you were going to, you know, step off the. Um, you know, typical academic nuance, uh, like fetishizing nuance, you know, rather than just coming out plainly and trying to analyze the phenomenon ahead of you. And um, I really, really enjoyed that. I think people will enjoy it um, and really, you know, so I guess maybe one thing I, since I do, we have a little time at the end. I kept thinking also about in your PMC has sex chapter about the campus, um, situation um, about, uh, you know, you had some things to say about the cancel culture and about also this kind of environment of uh, panic. Um, and um, it just made me think a little bit about the chair. And so I wanted to ask you, since I mean, this was a series on Netflix that, of course, everybody in academia had to watch and comment on. And, you know, there was a bit of a frisson of, you know, interest in it because it was about us. Right. And so I allegedly, think people, yeah. allegedly. Yeah. So I think people, you know, while they wanted to criticize it, cr criticize it, there was just so much narcissistic joy in it. Yeah seeing oneself somehow yeah. represented and portrayed that I don't think many of the critiques actually were very uh, serious. And so I was actually kind of thinking, what did you make of that uh, okay. series? And perhaps also the response, since you're also in film and media, I thought this would be a fun 
thing to oh, hear you. Sure. Oh, and full disclosure, my um, very beautiful niece plays the Title IX officer that the older professor goes to, Havana Rose Lou. So big shout out to her. Oh, fantastic. Um, I did not, I thought it was going to be much more hard hitting and satirical. I did not expect it to be a rom-com. I didn't mm. expect it to have like physical comedy where, you know, Sandra Oh is such an appealing actress, you know, is like falling all over um, the guy that she's half in love with. I forget his name. But um, I think the thing that, um, like the narcissistic frisson that people in our profession felt was that you had um, like an administration telling an English department basically like, we don't have any money and you guys can't do anything that you're used to doing and you will be, um, you know, you'll be, your offices are moved to the bottom of the gym. And so all of us were like, oh my God, I suffered so much and now it's finally on TV. Well, can I just say one thing? Like if I had an office that big, like Sandra O, then, you know, I would just quit my job and become an artist or something in my office, like have a studio because my office is not that big. Like most of us, it's like a lower IV. We don't work in those conditions. Number one. Number two, at this point, like with that, like star English professor who does the Nazi salute is then like it, quoting um, Nazism and then is canceled. Nobody I know in their right mind does that kind of thing, even drunk, because we are so highly censored. Like the level of censorship and self-control and internalized self-control, the lack of any kind of spontaneity or freedom within the teaching professions has never been this bad, as far as I can tell. And so that was like a very, you know, delightful, cathartic moment where like, oh, yeah, he can just do whatever he wants. Um, nobody gets up in front of a classroom and just is like, I'm just going to say whatever I want. So that's like a kind of de-skilling thing maybe that David could, it's like a goofy de-skilling thing. Like I, professors just go to their classes and they just say whatever happened, um, whatever's on their minds. And when they hook up their computers, like pictures of their wives come up and because they never check what's actually on their laptops. That's how, and I, I felt like at that level, it was kind of, um, it was it was bo both lovable and um, ridiculous because the real um, um, Paul that has fallen on academia right now has to do with this kind of cancel culture. You know, all the student um, um, re slogans, they, they act, the writers actually took from things that students actually have said in the past year or two. Like, he should not be allowed on campus, this should not happen. And so it makes it seem like someone's just being goofy and then, you know, the students all go crazy. But I feel like the actual level of repression that we all live under is much darker and much worse than that. And I, it was actually a kind of like light diversion. It was like light entertainment. Like it made our uh, like working lives look like a fun operetta. Like, um, you know, it was like making a West Side Story in, you know, a 19th century factory or something like some little sewing girl falls in love with the god, the machinist, and they have this like beautiful thing. And you can ignore the fact that, you know, people are losing their arms and legs in the middle of all this. So I thought that was like really, really um, uh, flawed, like insufficient mm -hmm. as a satire um, of the condition, the academic condition right now. Before you so. go, you teach media studies. Right. Are, right. So are you able to appreciate anything that's on Hulu and Netflix? Oh, I, well, I'm like a really, really big consumer. I, you know what? I don't sit around going, oh, yeah, better culture would make a better society. I'm like, give me the dreck. I just need like diversion at the end of my day. That's the other thing I don't believe. Like, radical culture does not make radical politics. Like, I don't need to see, you know, something super enlightened. I'll just watch. I. But how much of it is... Sure how much I did of not appreciate was sex education, sex second season. I feel like I'm being bashed over the head with, you know, um, PMC sex education. And, how much um, of it is dangerous? How much of it is brainwashing? You know, how much of I, it is brainwashing? I, watch what, I just watched Dune last night. I don't have, like... I'm not, like, sitting here going, I can only watch experimental film or listen to sound art. God forbid. But it doesn't I, have to be experimental. How much of this is conditioning? How much of it is mind control and brainwashing? How much of it is ruining 
our politics by acclimating what, what us exactly? to certain power what, are structures. Are you talking about Facebook? Or are you talking about? I'm, tra- I'm talking um, about movies, the television we watch, mm-hmm. where anything that seems to be hypercritical of capitalism has some kind of moral ambiguity that gets capitalism off the hook. That, like, that, what uh, what is a thing that's critical of capitalism? Like other than inside well, job or like the laundromat that um, Soderbergh made, those are really critical of capitalism. And they got made. You know, those Adam McKay and um, Steven Soderbergh made those films. Those are really important. But people still like the the laundromat. I guess is about money laundering. It was very entertaining. There should be a worldwide revolution based on Pan- the Panama Papers. There isn't. I don't count on culture to bring me that. I really don't. I think it's all about real organizing. It's about people. Like, I want, like, emotional catharsis, more in the Greek sense. Like, and I kind of read, wrote the book for that, too. Like, I, I want a collective experience of catharsis. I, I don't want to be told what to think when, about capitalism, necessarily. And look, if we had like the ideal utopia, everyone would be making their own content. And that's what like YouTube and all of these things um, distributed for us. But I don't have those kinds of expectations. I don't think video games make children more violent. And I don't think enlightened media make people more enlightened. I think podcasts play. I think the news should be really hard hitting. And because it's not, we have podcasts and shows like this to counter that. And um, one of the, the most exploitative, you know, forms of television are really cheap reality TV. And um, those kinds of things have to do with, you know, a, those are ideologically reprodu- reproductive of the capitalist logic. But I'm not going to go and shame you for it if you're watching that stuff. I no, believe in shame. Oh, I believe horrible. in shame. I no, believe in shame. I don't care. I, I'm I don't older care. than you. And I remember the 60s. And people came out of the 60s not trusting advertising. And it was a big thing when Eric Clapton did a commercial for Michelob. He's turned out to be uh, an anti vax It was a big thing, though, when rock stars, when Henry Fonda did a commercial for GAF. It was like, oh, my God, there there was something shameful about siding with corporate America and I was raised not to trust advertising. That's a cultural shift. You know, you could not trust advertising, but your consumption habits of advertising it is not a building block in solidarity. Okay. In fact, distrust of advertising can now lead more towards conspiracy thinking than anything else. Distrust of the media. The media should be distrusted generally. You should distrust the news. Okay. including advertising. Advertising and the new and content have no difference anymore. I have to share you with Professor Marianne. I can't virtue hoard you. <laughs> oh, she's coming on next. Okay. <laughs> I, I Professor Marianne, I I'll be quiet. Anything you'd like to ask or say? Uh, well, no, I've been listening uh, just to the tail end of it, so I don't know what the bulk of the conversation was. In, uh, but I can tell you, even physics was not uh, immune from some cultural nonsense that allowed everybody to not face the real problems we have in our field, particularly women. There's about the same percentage of women in high energy physics, at least in the United States, Europe, different story as there was uh, when I was starting out, as there were like before I was born, practically. And part of the problem has been you're asking people to spend longer and longer amounts of time in graduate school, you know, very cheap labor. I mean, it's the senior graduate students and the postdocs that are running all these experiments to first order. The the professors are too busy begging for money. with some some exceptions, but uh, so you ask people, and then you you ask them to do a, a few more years of relative poverty with low paying postdocs, and then the clock is seriously ticking, because there's a certain point where it's no longer the case where the captains of industry like the Westinghouse and IBM and Boeing, you know, could talk people could talk to your advisor because they all went to graduate school together, you know they're People running those companies are out of marketing. So you, 
So you basically have to land a job before you've been too ripened on the shelf of academia. And by that time, you know, you're in your mid thirties. Most normal people are wanting to start families by then. And in the 1990s, late 90s, the pull of by getting a job in the derivatives department of some bank, I was asked to join the derivatives departments of Sears Roebuck Company. They had a derivatives department. And my friend, uh, acquaintance just said, Marianne, you have no idea how easy this job is compared to anything we do. Now, that might have all collapsed a few years later, but, you know, if you work with that kind of salary for 10 years, you could retire. And then, you know, people are going, my, my student went work for the oil company. And as she said, Marianne, I can't do what you did. I didn't have student debt when I got my PhD. When these guys have paid, they're usually paid through graduate school, but when they graduate, they have to start paying back their undergraduate student loan debt. So, so the whole thing, the whole cultural nonsense, well, are we teaching physics with a masculine perspective? I'm just going, what the hell are you talking about? You would want much, much rather talk about this crap than the economic injustice and exploitation that, you know, somebody's tenured career is basically dozens of underpaid uh, graduate students and postdocs making it happen. And then we, you know, let them loose to fend for themselves in a very hostile environment that doesn't appreci appreciate, you know, academic and, and uh, technical skill. Oh, anyway, that was my, sh I don't know if that uh, dovetails no, with great. what you were talking about or not, but sort of. Why don't we, re go ahead, Professor Catherine. You're you're on. Let me unmute you. you uh, I just want to second everything you said, Marion. And um, I want to add another thing, which is it for working class students. It's even worse. I mean, OK, so you have the student debt, but uh, working class people in their 20s generally have to work to support family structures like entire if not they've already had kids or they're supporting their parents or they've got they've got to contribute to the family in some way and so how can you ask people to go into this long period of apprenticeship where they are making just barely over minimum wage and then they talk about diversity in all these different ways this is not going to work if you have a social system that punishes um, people financially for not being middle class in such a right. way. You know, people will never rise up in the um, professions um, because they can't afford to not make money in their We can't. African-Americans are leaving. Like taking a vow of poverty. We're, so we're losing African-American workers on Capitol Hill. They, can't, they are complaining they can't afford to take these low wage jobs working on Capitol Hill, competing against the the privileged children who are being bankrolled by their parents. The same thing, internships. They can take unpaid internships. You know, um, if you've got, if, if you're a minority person who's the first person to graduate from college and you want to go post graduate, you're going to go to law school or med school, you know, something. You might get a pile of debt, but it's something where you've got close to guaranteed employment if you don't completely screw it up. Well, you, now you yeah. knock on doors and a, yeah. a th there there was a an article. I don't I forgot the gentleman's name. He was complaining that the people who can afford to knock on doors for the Democratic Party are white, educated ch children of the ruling class. And so they're and they're doing the retail politics. Nobody trusts them. Why should they? Ka uh, Catherine, why don't we wrap this up? You were please come back. You this was like you just cleared out my sinuses. I will. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, um, Mary, and everything you're saying. I totally agree with. And um, Adnan. David, thanks we'll, so we'll much. We'll plug your Great book behind me. your oh. back. We'll, we'll plug your book behind your back. To, I hope to be in a session with you. Yes. Okay. Be very yeah. Take Thank care, you. guys. Uh, virtue Hoarders, go buy the book right now. Go buy Virtue Hoarders right now. Uh, thank you, Professor Adnan Hussein, for introducing us to Catherine. Go buy Virtue Hoarders right now. Let's take a quick break. I need to get water, and I know... The professor, Mary Ann, is loaded for, yes, I have to pour some water. Let's listen to some music from 
Professor Mike Steinel, who will be joining us shortly with Ray Hare. And we're going to talk about, you know, music and the unions and more good stuff. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. We'll be right back. I'm on my way to be a billionaire. Now you can make fun of me, but I don't really care. I have a plan to get there by and by. As long as I stay healthy and I never die. Fifteen bucks an hour, five days a week, fifty-two weeks a year, and thirty-two thousand years. I know it's a long time, honey, to thirty-four thousand and twenty. But when I get there, babe, I'm gonna be in the money. I'm on my way to be a billionaire. Now you can make fun of me, but I don't really care. I have a plan to get there by and by. As long as I stay healthy and I never die. All I really need is a second job or a third. Lift myself up my boots and join that elite herd of the 600 billionaires in the USA who make more in a second than I do in a day. I'm on my way. Yes, I am. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Oh, yes, I am. I'm on my way to be a billionaire. Now you can make fun of me, but I don't really care. I have a plan to get there. Yes, I do, by and by. As long as I stay healthy, I never die. As long as I stay healthy and I never die As long as I stay healthy and I never die Welcome back. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. We have uh, a virtual studio audience. If you would like to join our virtual studio audience, go to my website and sign up. Office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. I'm there from 8 till 9.30, taking your questions, your compliments. We have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's, I think we're close to 6,000 subscribers, Professor Marianne. Not bad for uh, a little show. So, and please like yeah, us. It takes a while to build up. Uh, you know, it has to become a habit with people when you start building up subscribers. Is that how you do it? Well, that's how I've noticed other people have done it. I have been subscribers to certain podcasts from way back and... Uh, you know, they slowly built up and then suddenly, I don't know, the right person, kind of, they, they have a certain episode that goes viral and then you've got suddenly a lot of people, you know, kind of flock into it. So. I'm also told you have to be good. <laughs> That's the other problem. <laughs> being good at what you I don't do. Know, being good, it's never been, you know, highly correlated with popularity, but uh, being relevant or, you know, sometimes yeah. you are just relevant. You know, right. your goodness or badness is just resonates for some reason. So, you know, it's a fraction. Professor Mary so. Ann Cummings is a physics professor. She is also a parks commissioner. She's an elected parks commissioner in Aurora, Illinois. And it looks like you're in a hotel. Yes, I am. I am. Uh, I've got I'm off in a meeting. I'm out of town this, this week meeting with some people. 
Is this? Oh hell! So, I'm in Vegas, baby. Are I'm you in Vegas? Yes, I am in Vegas. Well, you buried the lead. You're in Vegas. Yes, and you know I was going to cancel this trip. I mean, I I planned it like months ago. Sometimes you just get this insanely low flight from Southwest, and I get and these room offers for free. And uh, but you know, in the summer it looks like this wasn't going to happen because it was. Kind of, I was stunned that the COVID was raging in Nevada, in particular. But um, it's uh, gone way down. It's. So it's uh, I it's gone down in Nevada. Now, what are, the, are you in? A, I don't want to, You don't have to tell me what casino you're in, yeah. but I would assume you're saying, well, everything's a casino in Vegas. Yes, everything is pretty much a casino, but but I am on the strip, and um, it's very nice in some weird ways. And uh, the problem right now is that what's happened in the last two or three years is that Vegas has two professional teams that have just moved in. So right behind this hotel is where the Golden Knights play. And now the season is on because hockey season is insanely long. And the Raiders, and the, the uh, Oakland Raiders are going to be Raiders. there. And, and there's a football team, and that stadium is just, you know, half a mile down. So it's just a logistic nightmare. I mean, all of the roads, all the traffic flows, many areas are reversed when they play at once. And it, uh, I got a little bit of that at night, uh, last night coming in. I but, opened uh, for Triumph the Insult Comic Dog in Las mm -hmm. Vegas. Robert Smigel and I were staying at Caesars and we, the the room was across the strip. Like you could, the, the, the place where we were playing, I can't remember what it was like. I think it was this, I wanna say the Sahara, there's some club. There's that's... the Flamingo. It wasn't there, the Flamingo, a... but, uh, and it took us 90 minutes by cab to oh, yeah. get from, to get across the strip. It, it was phenomenal. You can't walk. I mean, you have to be careful where you walk because now, even when I first came to Vegas in the early 2000s, you could walk up and down the sidewalk. Right. You can't do that anymore. I mean, it's just a uh, maze of walkways and bridges, and you just have to sort of, sort of know your way around them. It's, right. Uh, that was how yeah, I kept I'm... my sanity in Vegas, by walking the strip. And, and everything looked closer than it what really was. Like, if I'm playing ballets, I would see the sign for the Tropicana, and I'd think, oh, that's, I'll just walk down to the Tropicana. That's like a two hour walk. Now with, yeah. with now it's impossible to, to walk yeah. around. What's the and cigarette? You would have after 911 was my first, like 2002 was the first time I came to Vegas. It was relatively quiet because people were still not traveling as much. And then after, uh, after the financial meltdown, I was actually, as a joke, sent an email to the new city, uh, city center they were building at the time, the world's biggest green project. It's all recycled water and, you know, uh, energy sufficiency and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I was saying, well, you know, yeah, I like that corner condo there. And I told my sister that if I got an email like Monday morning, the next morning, I know that they're in dire straits. Well, I got off the phone with her and there was somebody phoning me. Wow. Now, I didn't have cash lying around. If I had offered them 150000 for that $1.5 million suite, I probably could have bought it. It was wow. that insane. But I didn't have even that kind of money lying around. So right. Right. I didn't want to, like, finance myself. Because now, 12 years later, yes, you would have made a killing until the next big collapse of everything. So, uh, you know. Yeah. But this, because, I mean, are they this smoking? is our religion out here. This is what we show the gods and nature. I think this is the pinnacle of human expression. Like, oh yeah, look at this. <laughs> Waterfall in I, the desert. <laughs> Completely overwhelming anything nature has to offer out here. You know, so it's- uh, It is the yeah. ultimate, it, it is saying that humans are a-holes. Look at what, it, it reminds me of New York, it reminds me of Manhattan. The, there's like this, we will build a subway that is above ground and will go through a building. I, I, I've, I've done this in Queens where I've been on a, I mean, and that's what Las Vegas is where they say, really, you don't think we can do this? We're gonna do this. What's the cigarette smoking like? Are, they, are people smoking? Are they wearing masks? Uh, they, I, you know, 
there are still some areas, like the big main areas in the Bellagio, that you're allowed to smoke. Um, but they've been very good. It, it was just kind of like the roundhouse where I live. They had some really good, like, air ventilation technology. So even though I don't like smokers, but I could sit in the pub area, even with somebody smoking, and it really not bothered me. And now, of course, in the era of COVID, that's it. It's weird to see everybody is down on the floor wearing masks. Oh, really? Yeah, and they've got they've got a lot of the chairs and things kind of you know separated so that people you know six foot the six foot rule. So so the air is support. fresh. They, they do pump oxygen into mm-hmm. a casino to keep you lightheaded. So I guess <laughs> yeah. well they do. Well, they they also, they also um, to keep you moist. You know they they have like moisturizers or the uh, humidifiers in in these places and. Uh, so it's. I didn't notice that the air. The air seemed just fine. Yeah. Um, I've lived a year of my crowds, life. So just, a, a year of my life has been spent inside a Las Vegas casino. Fifty-two. I've played fifty-two weeks. When you add up all the time I've played Las Vegas, I've counted. It's more than a year of my life has been spent inside a casino and. I've never gone there just as a tourist, and I wonder what it would be like just to, to go there to enjoy Two days. It. How many Two days? Two days is basically, I used to, how I started going was, uh, my parents used to go to Vegas for two or three days en route to uh, a meeting that my father always had with a company that he had, had founded out in Arizona, and that was their like early uh, winter meeting. So that was fun, because I realized uh, that this is the first time since, I don't know, they brought that little grub home when I was one and a half that I had the parents to myself. Right. And we're just kind of wandering around Vegas. So it was like our yearly thing to do. So I kind of, they can't do that anymore So uh, with my father. So I, you know, I just, by the way, it's it, Vegas is a magical place because years ago we were going through the Bellagio and my father stopped and he's watching this band. And it's playing in one of the, you know, nightclubs there, but it's very open to the casino. And my father goes, holy smokes. And turns out this band was called the Ink Spots. Hmm. And it was the original, there was only one surviving member of the original Ink Spots. And believe it or not, this guy was my father's army buddy. Really? So my father, he told the story. He said, you know, I, uh, I, we went on furlough because he found out I was a piano player, and my father did play piano in bars uh, for a while. And he, uh, and so the guy invited him to like, hey, my band is playing tonight and or this weekend in uh, in, in Kansas City. And they, we have a furlough, so they went. And my father said it was this amazingly swanky place, and he says, and I was the only white guy, literally in miles. So of course. His friend gets up on the stage and sings with the ink spots. And then he says, I want to welcome my friend Oni Cummings. The wow. Spotlight. Wow. Like, as if I needed a spotlight in the place. And then my father kind of mused and said, I had no idea how badly black people were treated in this country. I said, wait a minute, Dad. You were 20 years old in the 1950s, and you had no idea how badly black people were treated. Out of sight, well, out of mind. Well, he was uh, living in a neighborhood, a very integrated neighborhood in Detroit, and the black people they knew were all professionals, and they had the nicer brick houses down the street. And it was, you know, so my father was, well, of course, you know, people did not wander outside their neighborhoods a whole lot. You know, it was, they had radio, they didn't have TV much. So who knows? But that was just a little magical. That was a little magical story. And that guy knew my father, hadn't seen my father in over 50 years at that point, and he immediately yelled out my father's name. Wow. So The ink that, spots. That was just, so anything can happen in Vegas. I mean, right. some magical moments happen in Vegas. Right. But. Mark Breslin wants to form a band called the Dime Spots, but that's a whole other. You have to be a man <laughs> to, to get the, the Dime Spots. Now, you are, I'm not going to embarrass you, uh, 
I'm just going to say you're instead of calling you one of the most brilliant people I know, we'll just say you're a physics professor and we'll leave it at that. Are you tempted to gamble because you talked about being offered a job to do derivatives for Sears? Yeah. So are you tempted no, to mean, figure this I out? I do. I play the little slot machines, but I just like play the little machines that are fun. The, but, 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 but hang on for one second. Hang on for one yeah. second. Vegas preys on people like you who right. think they can That's outsmart right. the casino. Are, you, don't you no, think? No, I know they can't outsmart the casino. I, I can't outsmart this casino. However, there were a group of graduate students at the University of Michigan who had this counting card game, was very similar to that uh, that was uh, portrayed in was some Kevin Spacey movie about 10 years ago. And they would make money. And I would even say to them, we're talking about the 80s. I'm going, hey, aren't you guys afraid that you're going to get taken out in the alley and just your legs broken or something? You know, because uh, casino guys don't, right. uh, don't think. And that was still when the... Oh, I don't know when the mob left, but that was probably when the transition was happening. I had just, years ago, my mother and I would go for pedicures here when we go, and, and I had just seen the movie Casino, mm -hmm. which was from 10 years earlier. And the gal who was doing my mother's uh, toes, she said, oh, I knew that guy. I worked for that guy for the, uh, the part that Robert De Niro played. I worked for him for like, you know, over 15, almost 20 years. And she says... That was like astounding time. And now, and she said that really did happen. Those events really did happen. Right. The, and, the mob uh, never uh, left. Well, well. The mob never left Las Vegas. They just don't own the casinos anymore. They do the construction there. Yeah, that's probably true. They, the casinos are the finance guys and that's just all the big multinationals. And uh, right. You know. The Justice Department got the mob out of owning the casinos, but every casino is growing and expanding. Construction mm -hmm. will always be the mob's mm -hmm. ballywick. As long as people, as long as you're pouring concrete, there will be a mafia. Yep. That's where the money, you know, gets exchanged. Well, you know, when you actually have to build something and you have to have the equipment and the capital to actually build something, that takes cooperation, a certain amount of power, a certain amount of stability. And it, it can't be just market forces. So it's gotta be that and just lends itself to that kind of, maybe not outward mob activity, but certainly some kind of protection, you know, of some kind, at least some agreements. So dirty money. Anyway, it's all dirty money. The kids, you know, if yeah. you if you watch The Godfather, Michael Corleone's kid goes off to. Well, he became an opera singer, but you know the, these mobsters send their kids off to elite private schools, and mm -hmm. they become Jamie Dimon. They become, you know, Chase Deutsche Bank. They're all running money laundering operations. That's how they. That's how they make their money. You know, these tax havens. Well, they're all dirty money. You know, being invested in. I mean, read the Pandora Papers and the uh, Panama Papers. This is, you know, I'm a broken record, but this entire country is one big money laundering operation. Catherine was talking about how people lose money because they want to open up a restaurant. You can't compete with successful restaurants because the successful restaurants are money laundering operations. <laughs> They are. I used to wonder. I used. I actually used to wonder that when I was in college in Ann Arbor, it's like, how is this place making money? I'm sitting here for a dollar at three o'clock in the morning, getting this amazing burrito meal. You know, how how does this work? I am an so unsuccessful stand-up comic. Mm -hmm. I spent twelve years on the road playing to empty clubs because I couldn't draw. Nobody ever said to me, "You didn't draw enough." We're not paying it. They always paid me, even though wow. I wasn't making money for the club. And somewhere along the line, I realized they're not here for the comedy. This business isn't here for the comedy. This is a money laundering operation. I am I'm a conduit to clean to help people clean dirty money. 
what is on your mind? Well, we we have Ray Hare here and Mary Ellen um, uh, Gorey, I think oh, I'm pronouncing, and Professor Mike Steinel. Oh, yes. We're going to talk well, unions, you know, but I just had a, a couple things to say. Um, please, of course, you know the uh, we're coming up on the most important election of our lifetime. You know, like the 22nd one or something that's yeah. the most important, and we're going to have nothing. I mean, it's uh, it, it's. I think you're right. Insane what's going on with this uh, build back better. And in fact, you know, um, I, I'm not surprised. I, I was hopeful that something would happen, but nothing, it's not happened yet. I'm still holding out that Bernie Sanders is going to do something. But one of the things that haven't been mentioned, so they've gutted all of the, uh, the uh, Medicare improvements. They've gutted a whole pile of things. The thing they're gutting that's just, should, you know, just basically uh, take out the legs from anyone who thinks that somehow we're going to, we, we need to sort of to vote Democrats for survive, is that apparently they're taking out the climate, um, the, the, cli- the the serious climate uh, right. the, uh, programs, the, what was it, the Clean Electricity Performance Program, CEPP. They're just gutting it. They're not going to have it in there. It's uh, mansion is yeah. it against it. Yep. So what is the United States going to go to Glasgow with? I can't remember when this meeting is, but it's the next big uh, U.N. climate meeting. Mm -hmm. And what are we going to present to the world if we can't even do this? And, you know, all of the kids that the squad rounded up and said, hold your nose and vote for have some discipline and vote for Joe Biden because the planet depends on it. When they take polls, and they continually to t- continue to take polls of people between 19 and 30, and the, dealing with the climate and the environment is the number one issue consistently. So uh, what are you going to offer these kids? Are, you, are they going to show up to the 2022 elections like they showed up in 2020? And, uh, and they barely know, showed up in 2020. They did show up. But not in the numbers we thought they would. Well, they showed up. I mean, there there were there were some pretty high turnouts for that group, which is traditionally very low turnout. And I would say that the, the squad probably had and Bernie probably had something to do with that, you know. And and there was the idea that Bernie's making a big bargain with Biden. And even at the time, I said, "Who is he bargaining with?" I mean, like Biden. I don't know if he remember. Maybe he only knows that he likes Bernie. He's Bernie's his friend or something. But I, and I wasn't being facetious. I, I was actually being kind of serious. What level of bargaining is Joe Biden capable of at this point is a very fair question. And uh, and the people around him, you know, the people around them who have anchored their careers to his career, you know, they're like the courtiers of a, you know, I don't know, a child king or something. They, they basically are the ones making the decisions. So, um, and, you know. And they're go, they're I, going I was, down. I, I just want to can you put a pin in it yeah. for one second. Please remember what you yes. were about to say. You know that I voted for Biden. I, I wanted I Bernie. I, I went with the lesser of two evils. But they, if they think that we're not on to them with, with mansion and cinema uh if he doesn't get this they are done and i don't think democracy is done i don't think it's an either no. or i think what's going to happen is if biden pelosi and schumer and clyburn can't deliver on this they are the Democratic Party, as we know it, is over. And even if it means the Republicans get the House and the Senate. They are Biden is going to pay politically and, and the vice. They, they are going down and they are going into the dust heap of political history. And it's an, it's going to be a new game. You know, we keep and they'll keep telling us the clock is ticking. You know, we we you want Trump to be president. They'll scare us. They're going down. And they deserve to go down. 
Well, I was going to say that they were never going to succeed in the first place. I don't think they wanted to succeed with this. Unfortunately, you're always right. a bottleneck for legislation in the it's in the house, and particularly in the house, it's the committees. There is this House Democratic uh, Steering and Policy Committee, which is actually secretive. It is actually exempt from the Open Records Act. And they're the ones that decide who gets on which committee. They're the ones that decided to bump Katie Porter off of her committee. They were the ones to decide that it's Kathleen Rice gets on this energy committee and not uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. And who is running the, you know, and who's the power behind that? This is Nancy Pelosi and Democratic Party leadership. They have picked, handpicked all of these people that are either outright blocking or severely weakening this bill through their committees. Those were handpicked by Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic leadership in the House. We have to, I have to, I have to, Cut it short. No, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm looking forward to this next segment. So Thank you need you. to like, you know, get the hook. Stage yeah, I, I, I'll see you Thursday, Professor Marianne. Yes. If, and, uh, but I don't want to be rude to Ray and Professor Mike Steinel no, no, and Ma- Mary Ellen. And feel free to, to join the conversation. But let me bring them in. Joining us in Denton. Oh, oh I just turned. What did I do here? Oh, 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 oh. Remember the. What am I doing? I'm panicking. Calm down. Okay, let me bring Ray in. As to start video. Let me bring Professor Mike Steinell in. Let me bring, do we have a, vi- I need a violinist. Is there a violin? Okay, we'll bring a violinist in. We have a trumpet player. Do we have a, a drummer? I need a drummer. Hey. That'd be Ray. That would be Ray, okay. It, and uh, and I'm the record producer. Let me exploit you. If there's a <laughs> rock a and roll thought. heaven, I know I'll get if the this pub. This is about uh, getting a hit with a bullet, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, my my song is if there's a rock and roll heaven, you know there'll be a hell of a publishing right that will be going to me. Introduce our guest, Professor Mike Steinel, before I drive them okay. away. Okay. Um, very pleased to have uh, these two people here. Uh, Ray Hare is a fabulous drummer and a musician, but also the president of the American Federation of Musicians. Uh, he's for a long time he was the head of the uh, the local here in Dallas Fort Worth, and uh, he's been doing great work since he was elected to that position and reelected. And uh, in the news is this uh, the strike that's going on with the San Antonio Symphony, and I thought it'd be great to bring in uh, Mary Ellen Gorey, who is uh, principal second violinist, but also she's the players. I think the chair of the players association, which is um, uh, negotiating with the symphony board, or I'm not sure if it's much negotiation. She can fill you in on the status of that. But uh, that association in conjunction with the American Federation of Musicians and the local there are working to try to get something settled. They've been on strike since September 27th, but the situation goes way back. And Mary Ellen, we had a long talk on Saturday and you did a great job explaining all that. And it's, uh, this is, if if you haven't, I've been listening to the whole show today and it's all been about labor and related to the, the shooting. And it's been and, laborious. Uh, a lot of people say it's, it's been, been laborious. laborious. <laughs> uh, no, it's been a great show. And the, the, the uh, guest before Mary, uh, Mary Ann was, uh, Catherine, you say Lou, Lou Lee. She was fantastic. I got to get that book anyway. So anyway, wh- why don't we start with Ray? You want to start with the little overview, and then uh, Mary Ellen can can give us the uh, entire uh, history of the the strike the, and, and what's going on down there in San Antonio. Well, I can give you a little bit. Um, in my years of service to musicians, I mean, going in San Antonio has had trouble. Uh, with it in its labor relations with its management going back to the 90s and even before that, the 80s. But all of that had improved, I think, up until a point. And I think uh, where I want to go with this is I want to try to spotlight what the real problem is in San Antonio. And in my view, and this is strictly my view, uh, because Mary Ellen is going to be the the ultimate uh, arbitrator of views here, I believe. But uh, 
the 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 problem is, you know, you had the community of San Antonio raising two hundred and fifty million dollars to build a hall, and called the Tobin Center. Um, that's a lot of money to take out of a community that doesn't normally contribute those those kinds of sums of money to uh, artistic endeavors. And they did that. And then, you know, after about five years or so of being in business, all of a sudden the resident companies that were, uh, and that, you know, they sold the public on raising that money by saying the resident companies, namely the opera, the symphony, the ballet, and so forth, are going to be so much better. You'll have such a, 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 a better and more enjoyable experience buying a ticket to see those companies in this hall that you should, you know, uh, you know, contribute the money. So here we are, you know, a few years down the road and the hall begins to squeeze the resident companies for more rent, for all kinds of more expenses, for more, for a bigger position on the ticket sales. And then all of a sudden you have um, money being raised in honor of a hall, not in honor of a uh, performing company within the hall and not supporting the artistic and the economic interests of the performers who play there. And that's, you know, my view of that right now. I mean, I've done my research on it. I've, t- I've looked at the uh, tax returns. I've looked at what the managers of the people who run the hall make. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tragic tale. So with that, I think uh, Mary Ellen, it is good to see you here. And I'm looking forward to seeing you at the rally at, uh, at uh, uh, six o'clock uh, on Friday, right in front of the Tobin Center. We have a lot to talk about in front of the Tobin Center, about the Tobin Center, but more especially about the San Antonio Center. Thank you. Um, I don't disagree with anything you've said. That's all basically how it worked. Um, the, the Tobin was built with public money and it is now lining private pockets. And the symphony is not the most lucrative people they put on their stage. So they don't have a financial incentive to make life easier for us. And in fact, they don't. Um, We actually have an NLRB charge uh, from 2017 where uh, we were doing an informational picketing against the ballet because they were using recorded music. And uh, the Tobin people threw us off of the sidewalks around the Tobin, said it was private property. And um, we filed charges and, that the ruling went our way, then Trump appointed a bunch of people to the NLRB and the ruling went the other way. And now it's being reversed and has to be heard again. So, so the Tobin Center is definitely part of our problem. The people in San Antonio, there's a lot of money here and a lot of people do give money to the arts. They give money to the Santa Fe Opera. They give money to the Metropolitan Opera in New York. And they give money to the McNay Art Museum, which is a local art museum. And one of my colleagues once challenged a donor who was very generous to the McNay. And their answer was, well, they preferred to give money to the art museum because the paintings didn't talk back and ask for more money. So so the, the history of labor relations between the musicians and the symphony is a, a long history of the symphony ratifying three-year agreements with us and somewhere in the middle of year two telling us they were very sorry. It hurt their, them so much. They knew we were worth so much more than they could pay us, but they couldn't pay us. And we would have to reopen the contract and renegotiate the third year for less, or they were very, very sorry because they really cared for us so much and they were going to shut us down. And uh, that has happened repeatedly. And in fact, we have taken, uh, we have agreed to many concessionary contracts over the years but uh this latest it was it's so outrageous that it has galvanized my colleagues we rejected their proposal unanimously which never happens but but we rejected it unanimously their proposal that would slice up the orchestra into uh 60 percent staying full-time and the other 40 percent going very very part-time all of us having our salaries slashed but the part-time people having their slashed by two-thirds and losing their health insurance and their other benefits and uh, in a pandemic. And um, we said, hell no, and uh, rejected it unanimously. They declared impasse, imposed the terms anyway, and we called the strike the next morning. 
Where does it stand now? You're still on strike. We are on strike. Uh, Our executive director actually sent me an email about a week and a half ago inquiring if it were the musician's intention to end the strike by last Sunday, which I, I, I was really completely baffled by that because why would he think we would end the strike? We haven't remotely achieved our objectives. They're not talking to us. We're not talking to them. And it seems to me that he doesn't really understand the fundamental purpose of a strike. To our international listeners or our American listeners, San Antonio, that's where the Alamo is? Yes. Remember that. Symbol of Texas Liberty. And it's also (laughs) where Clear Channel is headquartered, I believe. Clear Channel is headquartered here. Right wing company. They help put George W. Bush in office. Is San Antonio... Is it a, where does it fall on the political spectrum? It's blue, but it is, uh, if you look at the neighborhoods on the city, the, the wealthier and the whiter neighborhoods are in the north, and the city gets progressively redder as you go further north. But we do tilt very slightly demogra- democratic. I, I do need to say, however, that this particular battle with the musicians against our management and board is I have to push back on any any attempt to make it partisan because it isn't. My, my colleagues, I mean, most of us do vote Democratic, but not everybody does. And some of my uh, very right wing colleagues, colleagues have been out there on the picket line with us and our supporters run the gamut left to right. And actually, the people who are de- trying to destroy us also span from left to right. When you so say it doesn't dis- really when you fit say, in a partisan box. So when you say destroy us, they want to break the union. Would, is, is their intent to make you go away and then bring in a non-union symphony? No, I don't think so, because you really can't have a non-union symphony. The um, Symphony orchestras are one of the most successfully unionized industries in the United States. But uh, what they do want, I think they want to have the facade of a union contract while doing what they want to do, which is uh, slice the orchestra up and and create these sort of two tiers. I would call it the haves and the have nots, but it's really the have nots and the have even less than the nots. It's it's. Uh, I'm sorry. I wanted to, if you, if you would permit me, I want to uh, highlight something that Mary Ellen said, and I think it deserves a closer a closer look. When she said at the top of her remarks, she said, "This is a case of public money serving private interests." Uh, you know, I think that was I think that was kind of how Mary Ellen characterized that, and I want to amplify that a bit by saying this: um, taking a look at who has profited from all of this? Uh, there's a man who runs the uh, Tobin Center. His name is Michael Fresher. His salary pre-pandemic, uh, the last tax return I could get was 219, which was the year that ended October 31st. By the way, their fiscal year ends on Halloween. Um, that may have that may have that may portend something. I don't mm-hmm. know, <laughs> but his salary uh, a year ago. His annual salary was three hundred and forty-two thousand dollars. Now, he announced right before the pandemic that they were starting Tobin Entertainment, which is a for-profit booking agency, and he is the CEO of that. And so, so he's taking. So, just so I understand this. Book, Excuse me for one second. So he's taking money, his status running a nonprofit. This is a nonprofit, right? Quasi. He's using. Quasi nonprofit. Well, what does that mean? It's a foundation. Uh, The building is a foundation. They raise money, but um, it's, you know, technically it probably is a nonprofit. But the point I need to make here is that they started a a thing called Tobin Entertainment to be able to book other lucrative acts to, for the benefit of the center. And, you know, the less, and then he collects uh, money on the booking. 
Right. They may want Lyle Mays on a Saturday night instead of the symphony. You and, he's, and he and gets so, a 15 you know, percent cut. If you if you took if you take a look at the way this worked, they use the symphony and the ballet and the opera and the other resident companies to convince the public to invest. The public invested. They built the building, and then they looked at it and they said, "You know, we could make more money on a Saturday night with uh, this act." And I, I just use Lyle, you know, who's a fellow Texan, and I don't want to, you know, not not to not to say that Lyle would do this, but you know, just or or any other act that they could book to make more money than they could with the symphony. And then, you know, uh, it's all about the economic interests of the building itself. So, you know, the interests of the people who perform there are, you know, uh, are less valuable or less important than the bricks and mortar themselves. Uh, Let me just get that. This is really important to me. This is really important to me. And there, this is about lives this is about being able to feed and get health. This is really important, really important. So uh, what you're saying is the two, the Tobin Center, is that how it's pronounced? Yes. Are there tax dollars or, or just tax incentives and tax breaks and tax write-offs? It, it was built with tax dollars. Built with tax? There was a bond issue bill with tax dollars and this gentleman what is his name fresh Fresh Mike fresher he feathers his own nest by booking acts into the center that he runs that is a foundation built partly with tax dollars how is that legal how can well, that be legal? It, it's not. It hasn't been scrutinized by the public yet. It will be a, 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 a big topic, you know, after the rally. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, but you, if you take, if you if you look at Michael Fresher's salary on the tax form for the year ended uh, October 31, 2020, he he, he put three hundred forty two thousand dollars into his pocket, you know, from the Tobin Center as the CEO. But now there's another organization called Tobin Entertainment. I wonder how much money he'll get from that to go with his other $342,000. Meanwhile, the musicians who sold the public on building the hall are being put out on the street. You know, and I, and I think that's really a, a big point. Now, take the management of the San Antonio Symphony. I want to bring them into the, uh, to the discussion. One of the things that, you know, I, you know, that I could say or I'm going to say about that is to some extent they are hostages of the center itself, which says you have a contract to perform here and you have to perform here. But we're going to raise your rent because we only have one hundred and eighty two million dollars in the bank and that's not enough for us. We need more money and you have to give it to us. And so where is the symphony management going to get it? They are going to get it from the musicians. That's what they've decided to do. And all of this is a public disgrace. And the public has to make has to bring this disgrace to a stop. They have money. They have money, but they're pleading poverty. I don't know if the Tobin is pleading poverty. The symphony management is pleading poverty. Everything Ray Hare just said is exactly correct. But in addition to that, they claim that there is no more money to be found in San Antonio and that our donors are tired of them coming back to them time and again with emergency fundraising appeals, to which we say, perhaps you should try asking some people in addition to the same small group of people that you've been asking for decades. But they are and amazingly resistant to expanding their donor pool. There, there is money in San Antonio. There is a lot of money in San Antonio. They're talking right now about a $31 million give back to the Spurs and a $62 million investment in a local outdoor concert venue. But somehow, when it comes to raising $8 million or $10 million for the symphony, there's no money in San Antonio. 
Uh, Mary Ellen, uh, one of the things that you mentioned on Saturday is that your Players Association and the people that were negotiating uh, offered a joint uh, venture of fundraising to to do it with the the board, and they turned you down uh, flat. Is that right? That's correct. We made that offer. I've been making a personal offer for at least 10 years to go on donor calls with representatives of our board and management to make the case for what the symphony does for the community, that the symphony is a public good and that people should have the opportunity to be part of our success. And I have never been taken up on that offer, not by many successive managements, not by many successive board chairs. So, you know, I I spent a little bit of time today, um, this evening, looking at the board and I Googled each one of the names. There's about 28, is it 28 people? I think that's or I think three of them are musicians. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and of I the thought symphony. it was insulting that those names on the, on their board that they listed them as musician. You know, as they didn't why didn't they put uh, financial consultant? Why didn't they put you know I think the fact that I think that was telling that they had to say, oh, this person's a musician. There's only three of them that are listed as musicians. So, um, so Mike, I can answer that question. The, the board members who are musicians are musician representatives from the orchestra to the board. And th- they sit there uh, and participate in some of those meetings so that the orchestra and Mary Ellen and her uh, colleagues know what's going on inside a board meeting. I think that's, and that's contractual. Yeah, but, that's under- uh, I understand that. But I just think it was, it was strange <laughs> that they listed them. And then I looked at uh, all the others and high percentage of people in the in finance and real estate and uh, a, f- a few lawyers i think maybe a, a f- some physicians one person that was associated with music education i think and maybe and then another person who ran the san antonio children's choir so it seems like that and i think mary ellen you pr- expressed this to me that um it's the, the problem really goes back to the attitude of the board, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know how it's how, how that will be approached. But you mentioned that you thought the only way to do it was public shaming slash pressure on people to, um, you know, like to 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 make a, a better offer. Can I, well, I think our, go ahead? So no, you go ahead, please. Um, I think our board should be shamed. I think they should be humiliated to be raising so little money from a city the size of San Antonio that hosts so many major corporations and has, I mean, the, the money is in the city and the case needs to be made to the people who control the money, why they benefit from the presence of the symphony. We're part of the economic infrastructure. We're part of the educational infrastructure. We're part of the quality of life. We are a public good for everybody, whether they go to the symphony or not. And and I think our board, the fact that our board finds it impossible to make that case adequately should be a tremendous source of shame to them. It boggles my mind that it isn't. And, and so, yes, I think that the only way I see this moving forward, I see two possible things happen. One is if a white knight steps forward, which is not actually unheard of. That happened in Fort Worth, that happened in St. Louis. I believe it might've happened in San Diego. I'm not sure about that. Um, And the other is for the board members to experience public humiliation to the point where they either actually start doing what they should be doing or they step off the board and make room for somebody who will do it. Right, I I wanna ask you how we show solidarity with you, how my listeners can help. This This is important. Structurally, so I I always want to understand systems and structures because they, it's all a shell game. So it's called the the Tobin Center, right? The Tobin Center is is the it's technically I think it's the Tobin Center for the Performing Arts. Okay, and the and the symphony is separate from the Tobin Center for the Performing Arts. Is that correct? That is correct. It's the Symphony Society of San Antonio, and it had it was incorporated in 1939. And so it's they one of the resident companies of the Tobin Center. I'm sorry. The Tobin yeah. Center has the Tobin Center has seven resident companies that perform there. 
and the symphony is the lead performing uh, company there. Uh, along then you have the opera and the ballet, and you have other other companies that perform there. So there's nothing locking the symphony into the Tobin Center. In other words, you could. Well, there's a contract. Yes, there, oh, but, but theoretically, it's not part of. It's a separate entity. Oh, it is a completely separate entity, and um, we do have a contract. Uh, we had a venue before the Tobin was built called the Majestic, where we had very, very similar issues with the management. Prior to that, we were at Lila Cockrell Hall, which is the uh, auditorium at the con- convention so, so center. So just so I understand what, what's going on, because I was trying to peel back earlier in the show the movie Rust, where Alec Baldwin shot somebody, and the producers of Rust are Rust Movie Productions, LLC, and everything's a shell game and everything's hidden. So the symphony is separate from the Performing Arts Center. Do you have the same people sitting on the symphony board, sitting on the Performing Arts Center? Do do they have, are they negotiating against themselves? Is the symphony, is the management separate from the Performing Arts Center? We have had, uh, I think a previous board chair was also on the Tobin board, which was a real conflict of interest. I don't think we have that right now, but the people who are uh, running the Tobin endowment and, and the Tobin center are very powerful and very influential people. And so if, uh, so they, are, they give to the Performing Arts Center and the symphony. There are people who give to both. And if so, if um, so, there so you can you can't say well we're going to go perform someplace else because there are I would assume there are people who invest who invest or donate to the performing arts center and they stand to somehow either look good or profit in some way by keeping this all under one roof one big happy family I would assume without embarrassing anybody, somebody benefits from the food, the ticket sales, the sheets. There's all these little contracts that go out that make everybody happy. The dry cleaning, let's all keep it under one happy family. And I'm not gonna go any further than that. But that, so they, they, you're kind of stuck in that performing arts center, correct? Uh, well, one of the problems is there's not really, as far as a concert hall goes, there's not really a, an equivalent venue anywhere else. Right. So that that is another problem. It really is a very nice concert hall, and it's difficult to find another appropriate place to play. And so the symphony is part of the Performing Arts Center, and then they receive a fee from the Tobin, from the Performing Arts Center? A Tobin no, receives no. a fee from the symphony. The symphony yeah, pays a pay fee. Them. You pay them based on your ticket sales. Uh, and it's, rent. A fee. it's rent. It's rent. Rent and it costs for security. I'm not the person to talk about the numbers. I have colleagues who pay much closer attention to the spreadsheets. But we do pay rent, and there's other expenses uh, as well. So it's then. So it's the symphony you're negotiating against, not the Tobin Center. Well, if, if the musicians are on strike against the symphony society. Yes. Yeah, so the problem is the symphony center, the symphony and not the performing arts center. Go ahead, Ray. You, you, no, you, yeah, you, OK, so I was trying to get this out to start with. The Tobin Center is creating problems for the symphony management. Symphony management is putting those problems on the musicians. So let me just make this point to to clarify this. The town produced $250 million to build the Tobin Center. The Tobin Center, if you look at their tax returns, they still have $172 million in the bank in cold, hard cash. And they are turning around and telling the symphony management and all of its resident companies that they need more money and the rent has to go up and the ticket sales, they need a bigger cut of that. And by the way, 
you, the symphony, you need to go out and sell more tickets so we can make more money. Where is the justice in any of this? This doesn't sound like the city of, of uh, opportunity and the city of uh, liberty and justice and everything else that San Antonio stands for, innovation. Right. You know, this, that's not what this is about. This is injustice, you know, on the street in San Antonio. Right, right. The only thing I would add to that is that our board and management could raise significantly more money outside of the Tobin than they do. And in, instead, and this has been true for decades, it's the musicians who are donor number one. When they have trouble meeting the budget, do they go out and seek new sources of major funding? No, they go to the musicians and tell, tell us how much they care about us and how underpaid we are, and they're very sorry, but they can't pay us what they said they would. Right. Excuse me, but let me just, I, I probably didn't clarify this right. The fact that all this money was raised and there's so much money left is an indication of what the community can do yes. to raise money for the arts and for the symphony and for the ballet. And that's what they thought they were doing. Right, right. That, and they were that is it in a nutshell. Right. Tell my listeners how we can support you. What can we do? Uh, we have some listeners in San Antonio, but nationwide, what what can we do in solidarity? Uh, well, I would invite everybody to go to our website, which is www.mosas. That stands for Musicians of San Antonio Symphony, mosas.org. We also have a Facebook page. Uh, musicians of the San Antonio Symphony. Um, there's Instagram and Twitter. Um, I'm not as conversant with those. I'm sorry, that's uh, not not my strength. Uh, but uh, people can share our our posts. People can um, write emails to our our board and management. We have posted those emails. Um, they can. Uh, just in general express support for the performing arts, um, su support for the musicians. Um, but the biggest thing really, I think is, to, oh, thank you very much. Somebody just put the uh, face, the, the, our website in the chat. Um, that and the Facebook page are probably the two most um, direct routes. Uh, I also have been putting all of my strike related posts as public on my own Facebook page. And I'm the only person by this name on Facebook. So if you go to my page, you will see uh, all the public posts about the symphony and about the strike. And uh, please feel free to share away. That's why they're public. Musicians of the San Antonio Symphony go to mosas.org. That's M as in Mary. O is in, oh, my God, I can't believe how greedy this country is getting. S as in... Uh, a as in S as in and dot org as in go there and uh, support the musicians of the San Antonio Symphony. Their Twitter handle is S A S Y M underscore musicians. And uh, let's show solidarity. This is uh, not fair. Ray Hare, thank you so much. Always good David, to see. Can I say? Can I say something nice about Mike Steinell before I leave? It's so hard to find something nice to say about Mike Steinell. The man, he has writer's block. He he says to me, I I was supposed to write a song, but I just I I can't. We love Mike Steinell. Go ahead, yeah, please. So I got to say this. He's one of the he's one of one of the best, if not the best, jazz trumpet trumpeter walking and breathing on this planet. Shucks. That's Mike Steinell. You'll, you'll get no argument from the listeners. He, it, it's, like, it's like, what did I do? I don't want to, not in front of him, but like, I don't know how he came into our lives, but he is, and he's an inspiration. Cover your ears, Professor Mike. <laughs> he is fearless. He has a fearless muse. He he has, I don't know who his muse is, maybe his father, but he is fearless. And 
that informs that can inform everybody's life. The man is fearless, and uh, it's not. Uh, anyway, we could all take his fearlessness into any thing we do, including taking on the uh, take management. Take, taking on management. Professor Mike Steinel, you want to respond to these accusations about you? <laughs> oh, David. You just you're just sucking sucking up to me because you know you're not gonna pay me anything. I know how management works in, <laughs> on this show. Are you playing for free? <laughs> yeah. Hey, just one thing. Um oh, hang on for one second. Are hang you getting, on, I have are to you do, getting I, any help. I have to divide oh, go ahead. I have to divide everybody now. Excuse me for one second. Divide and conquer, yeah. I have to divide You've and conquer. You've been talking about this for months. Go ahead. <laughs> Mary Ellen, what about the the ballet and uh other and the you know other like the children's choir are you getting any uh support in terms of people who might attend the rally from those other groups what about the music educators in town or how are they do you feel like you're getting support from different areas uh the music educators in town have been incredibly supportive they've been great great um i haven't heard anything from the ballet i haven't heard anything from the children's choir the the youth orchestras a uh, lo lot of those kids are studying with members of the San Antonio Symphony. So um, we've been getting support from, from our students, from their parents, from the music educators, actually from some of the churches in town that hire symphony musicians for special occasions. Um, we've been getting really just a tremendous level of support. You know, I used to, I used to uh, talk to my students. I would ask them, how many people in this room might like to make a record someday, you know, and how many people might want to write a book about jazz or whatever? And they would all raise their hands. I said, then you need to buy some CDs. You need to buy some LPs because they're all stealing music, you know, right. and and they would kind of think about it. But I think that just think if every um, orchestra director in San Antonio and all those schools said, if you want to play in an orchestra someday, and get paid what you're worth and have a living wage, maybe you ought to go down to, to that rally on, on, on Friday night, you know? I think there's so much untapped. We've been talking, David's been talking about this whole thing. You know, we're in Striketober. There's it more used to be Rocktober right for, you, than have for you musicians. It used to be Rocktober, but they've changed. What's it that? For musicians, Rocktober. it used to be Rocktober <laughs> on the radio, but they've, they've taken that but away anyway, from you. Now they made it just, striketober. Just another, I sent a, an, an email to, I've, I'm a Patreon member of um, Payday Report, and I sent an a email to um, Mike, Elk. Um, Mike Elk with all the links about your Jacobin article and everything. I hope that he can do something. That The, the, the report comes out sort of like the Feldman show. It's like twice a week, you know, because he's, He's a he's a two man shop, but he's good. But anyway, thanks thanks for the compliments, David, and thank you to to these guests who uh, took right. time to come out on a Monday night. What, one last and, question uh, I'd like to ask Ray, if you don't mind. Sure. Understanding unions and labor relations in America is purposely difficult. It's hard to parse who's responsible and where the money is. So what what is the story with our school system? They'll teach you how to set up a lemonade stand if you're in elementary school. But will they teach you how to unionize that lemonade stand? I'm being serious. Do they teach organizing? You know, I think we, we got into this a little bit on one of our previous shows. But there's an inherent conflict in uh, education versus labor. And let me tell you what it is. And Mike Steinell knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say that the schools are uh, relying more and more on converting private money into money for public schools. And, you know, it's like you, you get a gig at a university uh, as a, as a um, applied music teacher, you know, and, and I'll use Mike as an example. You know, M Mike knows that he's got to keep his job and he's got to get tenured. So he's got to be able to go out and play in a lot of places and be play at a level that will attract musicians to study with him. And then one of the benefits he hopes 
of the musicians studying with him is that he can get them jobs in the private sector. And more than that, the uh, faculty, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the administrators have now programmed into the requirements for an applied degree that you do so much work outside the classroom in the public sector. And what that does, it pushes the students out to compete with the alumni, right. you know, for jobs. And there is a big conflict in that. And I run into that all the time. And, you know, it used to the, 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 the your, your teachers at North Texas, where Mike and I went to school, would say, when you walk in this door, you need to go join the union. If you're going to go out and play, it's, it's less and Absolutely. less that way. You know, it's less and less that way. Because, I mean, you have some of the you have some faculty members looking for ways to run their students into jobs and, you know, which may be substandard and make it more difficult to organize. So, yeah, um, yeah that's a that's a little bit of a riff on some of that, David. And I probably didn't get straight to your point, but, you know, there is some conflict in all of that. We're all trying to find our way home. And. That's a good way of putting it. And well, the point I'm going to make is for America, the way home back to the womb is slavery. That that we're heading the race to the bottom. And, you know, life is about finding your way home and discovering that everything you needed was in your backyard. And this country is finding its way back home and it's slavery. It's a race to the bottom. I've got to agree with you, David. Yep. And you are you are brave and courageous for bringing it up. Yep. So thank you. Thank you. I, may, may I say one thing? Can I ask you one thing very quickly? Because I want sure. to address a point that was just made in the chat about the cost of the tickets. Um, the the it is true that going to a classical mm -hmm. concert, symphony concert, is expensive. But we also play educational concerts for up to 50,000 students a year in San Antonio. And these students come from every corner of the city, every demographic, rich schools, poor schools, all kinds of schools. We play for them. We charge them very little. We have very, very low price tickets available for students to come to our classical concerts. I believe people need to feed their souls as much as they need to feed their bodies. And, and I do not believe that the symphony is uh, is a elitist organization. Uh, I think that we have something for everyone, and the if the expensive ticket prices are subsidizing lower prices for students. We've given tickets away to veterans groups. Um, it, we we've actually tried to make ourselves as accessible as possible. So I, I just think that's really important to note. To, and that's that's a form of dividing us. What, what, that, yes. that issue yeah, is, absolutely that's hey i wrote a union song just while we're sitting here you did you want to hear it yes how much a union <laughs> song <laughs> what do we mean you want to hear it, it? Uh, you're going to give us the 25 or the 50 i'm going to give you the 25 okay all right hang on a second i think it's <laughs> what happened my, my, my thing don't work man you got synthesizers you don't have live don't know. do you hear some do you hear some music playing <laughs> oh you hear that right can you hear the piano yeah I'm heading to San Antonio Gonna stand with my brothers and sisters If I walk all that way My feet's gonna have some blisters I got to San Antonio blues I'm gonna pay my union dues. That's it. First thing is uh, now, David, you owe you owe Mike Steinell about two thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I'll quickly change the subject. Who? When I used to I used to do comedy in San Antonio. There on the River Walk, there was a jazz club. There was a trumpet player. Oh yeah. Yeah. What? What? Yeah. what? 
what, what is David Cullum? Jim, Jim McCollum. Jim McCollum. Jim McCollum, yeah. And he had like a radio show. And is that, how's he do? Is that still around or is that? I don't know. I used to be on, uh, on the radio did, every week. Did he pass, Mary Ellen? He, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure he passed away. I know he retired and I think he passed away. And, that and I, I'm, I, I'm giving away my age. Davy Crockett, is he still living there? <laughs> I'm giving away my age. They, I don't know where they buried him, but you know, the last thing that he said when he left Tennessee, when he was defeated, he was a Tennessee congressman. And so on the steps of Congress, he said, I'm going, I, you know, y'all can all go to hell because I'm going to Texas. <laughs> and he, came, he went to Texas and fought and died at the Alamo. I mean, you know, what can you say? He did it for the publicity, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, well, I won't go into that. They, they were fighting because uh, Mexico had outlawed slavery and they wanted to keep that in Texas. Yeah. I, I think that part of the story was never made clear, you know, but uh, if, it, if it's true, it certainly is. Uh, it certainly changes my attitude. Uh, that's what happened. I know that they a lot of them ran away from Tennessee to go to Texas because they were all in debt. And um, they they were under they were risking staying in Tennessee and being a debtor forever. And they knew that if they went to Texas, they could, um, you know, avoid uh, debt collection. I, I, that's the I thing think that now, I according to that's Texas law, here. you can't teach that in this. I'm being serious. You're not allowed to teach that in the schools now in Texas. Correct. You have to teach them as reformists and heroes. Right. I'm, be, I'm being for Mike Steinell, who's the educator. Mike, tell us. Oh, I'm, I'm, I don't have to teach that that stuff and anything anymore. You, you couldn't teach that about the songs. Alamo. Probably that would not. fall it's under probably, critical uh, race theory. If you told the actual story. Now, if you just show the movie, that's a whole different thing. You ever seen the movie? Oh, which John? one? The John Wayne one or the... The John uh, Wayne one, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, no, Mike. No some of our that. colleagues were in the uh, the more recent Disney version of the Al of the uh, Alamo. Who's that? Yeah, Stephen Bruton was. Uh, you know, the the great songwriter from Fort Worth was oh, in that yeah. movie. He died. Uh, he was Sergeant Fernandez, and he was a uh, in the in the movie. He was one of the Canon Masters. You know, and uh, I didn't see that one. I have to check it out. I knew him. Right. Okay. Ray Hair. Thank you so much, Mary thank Ellen. You, thank you, Professor Mike Steinell. Thank you. Thank you, David. Professor Marianne Cummings. Thank you. I could keep going, and I usually do, but I think this, <laughs> this, has, been, this has been great. What a great show. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Please come back. Please. See you Friday, Mary Ellen. Yep. See you soon, Ray. Oh, yeah. Well, give the date of the rally so people in San Antonio can. Let's. It's is this Friday, October 29th. Uh, date and time were chosen because that is when we would have been playing our first classical subscription concert if we had not gone on strike. We will be right across the street from the Tobin. They will hate that. Um, I'm enjoying the thought. Yes. And. Uh, <laughs> I'll be there yeah. in, 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 in spirit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I'll be Good there. Night. Thank you. That's what I, thank you. Thank you. That's what I said to my children when they were growing up at, for their birthday parties. I'll be there in spirit, but I'll, I'm upstairs reading. I'm kidding. <laughs> I just wanted, wanted to make a little, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to switch. Yes. That is our show. We didn't do Community Billboard tonight. Dan Frankenberger uh, will catch up with our community on, uh, what is today, Monday night. This was an amazing show. This was an amazing show. Please share it with uh, people who uh, will appreciate it. We're a little show, and we're... We have amazing guests, and this is uh, pretty amazing. So thank you. I, let me see if I can remember who the guests were. We started with Dutch Merrick, former president of IATSE Local 44, John Ross, 
Roger Nygaard. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Mark Breslin, Howie Klein, David Cobb, Dr. Harriet Fraud, Professor Adnan Hussein, Catherine Loop. Please pick up Virtue Hoarders. Uh, Professor Marianne Cummings, and of course, Ray Hare, and uh, and uh, Professor Mike Steinell, and uh, Miss Gorey. I think the last name is pronounced Gorey. I think I'm getting that right. I think. Uh, okay, that's the show. Office hours this Friday night, starting at 8 p.m. Please subscribe to this show wherever you stream or, or download podcasts. Uh, if you'd like to sit in the virtual studio audience in our Zoom room, please go to my website and sign up. And we have a YouTube channel, so please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Give us a nice review, like us, and share us. And I'm going to try to uh, take care of a mouse that passed away. I have a mouse. I've been informed it passed away. I'm David Feldman. Friend me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. Remember to stay strong and protect the weak. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy, too. Now tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show To get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way The David Feldman Show So get your ears on right And buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say And he's coming your way He's got a lot to say and he's coming-